section nineteen of a compendious history of english literature and of the english language volume one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org a compendious history of english literature and of the english language volume one by george lilly craik chapter three part one second english commonly called semi-saxon the chief remains that we have of english verse for the first two centuries after the conquest have been enumerated by sir frederick madden in a comprehensive paragraph of his valuable introduction to the romance of havelock which we will take leave to transcribe the notices by which we are enabled to trace the rise of our saxon poetry from the saxon period to the end of the twelfth century are few and scanty we may indeed comprise them all in the song of canute recorded by the monk of eli hist elians page five o five apud gale who wrote about eleven sixty six the words put into the mouth of aldred archbishop of york who died in ten sixty nine william of malmesbury digest pontiff line one page two seventy one the verses ascribed to st godric the hermit of finchale who died in eleven seventy ritson bibliogra poet the few lines preserved by lambard and camden attributed to the same period ritson ancient songs dissertation page twenty eight and the prophecy said to have been set up at here in the year eleven eighty nine as recorded by benedict abbas roger hobbiton and the chronicle of lanner cost ritson metrical romances dissertation page seventy three to the same reign of henry the second are to be assigned the metrical compositions of laomon manuscript cotton cal a nine and otho c thirteen and orm manuscript june one and also the legends of st catherine st margaret and st julian manuscript bodley in thirty four with some few others from which we may learn with tolerable accuracy the state of the language at that time and its gradual formation from the saxon to the shape it subsequently assumed from this period to the middle of the next century nothing occurs to which we can affix any certain date but we shall probably not err in ascribing to that interval the poems ascribed to john de guldervord manuscript cotton cow a nine cheeses college oxford twenty nine the biblical history manuscript bennett cant r eleven and poetical paraphrase of the psalms manuscript cotton vesp d seven call ben cant o six bodley and nine twenty one quoted by wharton and the moral ode published by hicks manuscript digby for jesus college oxford twenty nine between the years twelve forty four and twelve fifty eight we know was written the versification of part of a meditation of st augustine as proved by the age of the prior who gave the manuscript to the durham library manuscript ecclesiastic done a three twelve and bodley in forty two soon after this time also were composed the earlier songs in ritson and percy twelve sixty four with a few more pieces which it is unnecessary to particularize this will bring us to the close of henry the third's reign and beginning of his successors the period assigned by our poetical antiquaries to the romances of sir tristram king horn and king alexander the verse that has been preserved of the song composed by canute as he was one day rowing on the nen while the holy music came floating on the air and along the water from the choir of the neighbouring minster of eli a song which we are told by the historian continued to his day after the lapse of a century and a half to be a universal popular favourite is very nearly such english as was written in the fourteenth century this interesting fragment properly falls to be given as the first of our specimens mary sungen the mu neches binnen eli the knut king ru thereby roweth knittus nowhere the lant and here we these mu neches sang that is literally mary sweetly sung the monks within eli that when canute king rode thereby rode knights near the land and here we these monks song being in verse and in rhyme it is probable that the words are reported in their original form they cannot at any rate be much altered the not very clerical address of archbishop aldred to ursus earl of worcester who refused to take down one of his castles the ditch of which encroached upon a monastic churchyard consists as reported by william of malmesbury 
who by the by praises its elegance of only two short lines hatest thou erst have thou god's curse the hymn of st godric has more of an antique character it is thus given by ritson who professes to have collated the royal manuscript five f seven and the harleian manuscript three twenty two and refers also to matthew Parisiensis historia pages one nineteen one twenty edition sixteen forty and two manuscript cotton nero d five saint marie clain virgine mater jesu christus nazarene on for or fong skilled help thin godrige on fang bring hegelich with the in goddess reach santa maria christus burr maidens clen had moderis fleur dilly men sinna or sunnen rix in men mod bring me to win with the self god by the assistance of the latin versions adds ritson one is enabled to give it literally in english as follows st mary chaste virgin mother of jesus christ of nazareth take shield help thy godric take bring him quickly with thee into god's kingdom st mary christ chamber purity of a maiden flower of a mother destroy my sin reign in my mind bring me to dwell with the only god two other short compositions of the same poetical eremite are much in the same style one is a couplet said to have been sung to him by the spirit or ghost of his sister who appeared to him after her death and thus assured him of her happiness christ and Santa maria sway on scamo me illeta that ick on this erda ne silda with mine bara futa itreda which ritson translates christ and mary thus supported have me brought that i on earth should not with my bare foot tread the other is a hymn to st nicholas santa nicolaus goddess druth timber us vera scana hus at thy birth at thy bare st nicolaus bring us well there that is says ritson st nicholas god's lover build us a fair beautiful house at thy birth at thy beer st nicholas bring us safely thither as for the rhymes given by lambard and camden as of the twelfth century they can hardly in the shape in which we have them be of anything like that antiquity they are in fact in the common english of the sixteenth century lambard in his dictionary of england page thirty six tells us that a rabble of flemings and normans brought over in eleven seventy three by robert earl of leicester when they were assembled on a heath near st edmundsbury fell to dance and sing hoppa wallachen hoppa wallachen england is thina and mina etc camden's story is that hugh bigot earl of norfolk in the reign of stephen used to boast of the impregnable strength of his castle of bungay after this fashion were i in my castle of bungay upon the river of waveney i would not care for the king of cockney the here prophecy what sir frederick madden describes as the prophecy said to have been set up at here in the year eleven eighty nine is given by ritson as follows one who sees in here hurt eruret than sullen angles in three b e delet than an into erland all to late we that other into puilla mid pruda belevi the thread into er hayden heard all reckon drench again these lines which he calls a specimen of english poetry apparently of the same age the latter part of the twelfth century ritson says are preserved by benedictus abbas by hovedon and by the chronicle of lanercost and he professes to give them and the account by which they are introduced from the former by which he means the first of the three but in truth the verses do not occur as he has printed them in any of the places to which he refers benedictus abbas page six twenty two has two versions of them the second of which he introduces by the word rictius more correctly there is a third in the printed hovedon what ritson has mistaken for the lanercost chronicle is an imperfect manuscript of hovedon cotton manuscript claude d seven folio one hundred one in which they occur very nearly as printed in his hovedon by saville the only difference of any importance being that the manuscript has in the fourth line by lu whereas saville both in the london edition fifteen ninety six folio three eighty six r and in the 
frank fort edition sixteen o one page six seventy eight has by sue ritson's transcript is evidently taken either from the manuscript or the printed hoveden it is quite unlike either of the versions given by benedictus but it is a very inaccurate transcript to pass over minor variations all the four originals for instance have sow or sail before into erland in the third line and the last line stands nowhere as ritson has given it in the first copy of benedictus it is the third in hera hagen hurt alla e drega in the second it is the thrida in hyr athen hurt alla reka e drega in the manuscript hoveden it is the thrida into er hahen hurt alla rek e drehagen or perhaps drehagia in the printed hoveden it is the thrida into er hahen heard all reka e drekagen the line in any of the four forms in which we have it appears to be entirely unintelligible and indeed the verses are manifestly corrupt throughout although a sort of sense may be made out of the most of the others pula is apulia and the reka in the last line may have something to do with a law about wrecks which both benedict and hoveden immediately go on to state that richard proclaimed at this time a d eleven ninety after his successful military operations against king tancred in sicily and calabria or apulia but what is er hahen or where can any one tell is the town of here of which ritson and others who quote or refer to verses speak so familiarly over this name the second version in benedict has the word host printed with a point of interrogation as if intended for a gloss but the most remarkable circumstance of all is that there is no ground at all for supposing as is done by ritson and sir frederick madden that the verses were ever inscribed or set up upon any house at here or elsewhere what is said both by benedict and hoveden who employ nearly the same words is simply that the figure of a heart was set upon the pinnacle of the house in order as was believed that the prophecy contained in the verses might be accomplished which prophecy we are told immediately before had been found engraven in ancient characters upon stone tables in the neighbourhood of the place it is clearly intended to be stated that the prophecy was much older than the building of the house and the erection of the figure of a stag in the year eleven ninety this is sufficiently conveyed in ritson's own translation what he means therefore by saying as the inscription was set up when the house was built before the death of henry the second in eleven eighty nine is not obvious benedict says that the house was built by ranulphus or ralph not randall as ritson translates it fitzstephen ranulfo filio stephanie hoven and by william which latter ritson we do not know upon what authority intimates is the correct name both chroniclers state that the place which was a royal town willem regis anglii had been given to fitzstephen by king henry that is probably henry the second as ritson assumes but this we repeat determines nothing as to the age of the verses which were or were supposed to be of much earlier date than either the erection of the house or the grant of the property End of section nineteen section twenty of a compendious history of english literature and of the english language volume one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org a compendious history of english literature and of the english language volume one by george lilly craig chapter three part two the brute of Leomon leomon or as he is also called lawmond for the old character represented in this instance by our modern y is really only a guttural and by no means either a j or a z by which it is sometimes rendered tells us himself that he was a priest and that he resided at ernley near radstone a redstone which appears to have been what is now called arley regis or lower arley on the western bank of the severn in worcestershire he seems to say that he was employed in the services of the church at that place there he bach rada there he book read and the only additional information that he gives us respecting himself is that his father's name was leovenath or luca as it is given in the later of the two texts his brute or chronicle of britain from the arrival of brutus to the death of king cadwallader in a d six eighty nine is in the main though with many additions a translation of the french brute d'angleterre 
of ways which is itself as has been stated above a translation also with considerable additions from other sources of geoffrey of monmouth's latin historia Britonum, which again professes and probably with truth to be translated from a welsh or breton original so that the genealogy of the four versions or forms of the narrative is first a celtic original believed to be now lost secondly the latin of geoffrey of monmouth thirdly the french of wace fourthly the english of laomon the celtic or british version is of unknown date the latin is of the earlier the french of the latter half of the twelfth century and that of laomon would appear to have been completed in the first years of the thirteenth we shall encounter a second english translation from wace's french before the middle of the fourteenth the existence of laomon's chronicle had long been known but it had attracted very little attention till comparatively recent times it is merely mentioned even by wharton and terwitt the latter only remarking in his essay on the language and versification of chaucer that though the greatest part of this work of laomon resembles the old saxon poetry without rhyme or metre yet he often intermixes a number of short verses of unequal lengths but rhyming together pretty exactly and in some places he has imitated not unsuccessfully the regular octosyllabic measure of his french original george ellis in his specimens of the early english poets originally published in seventeen ninety was we believe the first to introduce laomon to the general reader by giving an extract of considerable length with explanatory annotations from what he described as his very curious work which he added never had been and probably never would be printed subsequently another considerable specimen in every way much more carefully and learnedly edited and accompanied with a literal translation throughout into the modern idiom was presented by mr guest in his history of english rhythms eighteen thirty eight to one thirteen to one twenty three but now the whole work has been edited by sir frederick madden for the society of antiquaries of london in three volumes octavo eighteen forty seven this splendid publication besides a literal translation notes and a grammatical glossary contains the brute in two texts separated from each other by an interval apparently of about half a century and whether regarded in reference to the philological to say nothing of the historical value and importance of laomon's work or to the admirable and altogether satisfactory manner in which the old chronicle is exhibited and illustrated may fairly be characterized as by far the most acceptable present that has been made to the students of early english literature in our day his editor conceives that we may safely assume laomon's english to be that of north worcestershire the district in which he lived and wrote but this western dialect he contends was also that of the southern part of the island having in fact originated to the south of the thames whence he says it gradually extended itself as far as the courses of the severn the wye the tame and the avon and more or less pervaded the counties of gloucestershire worcestershire herefordshire warwickshire and oxfordshire besides prevailing throughout the channel counties from east to west notwithstanding that several of the counties that have been named and that of worcester especially had belonged especially to the non-saxon kingdom of mercia the language of laomon he further holds belongs to that transition period in which the groundwork of anglo-saxon phraseology and grammar still existed although gradually yielding to the influence of the popular forms of speech we find in it as in the later portion of the saxon chronicle marked indications of a tendency to adopt those terminations and sounds which characterize a language in a state of change and which are apparent also in some other branches of the teutonic tongue as showing the progress made in the course of two centuries in departing from the ancient and pure grammatical forms as found in anglo-saxon manuscripts he mentions the use of a as an article the change of the anglo-saxon terminations a and an into e and n as well as the disregard of inflections and genders the masculine forms given to neuter nouns in the plural the neglect of the feminine terminations of adjectives and pronouns and confusion between the definite and indefinite declensions the introduction of the preposition to before infinitives 
an occasional use of weak preterites of verbs and participles instead of strong the constant occurrence of n for on in the plurals of verbs and frequent elision of the final e together with the uncertainty in the rule for the government of prepositions in the earlier text one of the most striking peculiarities is what has been termed the nonation defined by sir frederick as consisting of the addition of a final n to certain cases of nouns and adjectives to some tenses of verbs and to several other parts of speech the western dialect of which both texts and especially the earlier exhibit strong marks is further described as perceptible in the termination of the present tense plural in th and infinitives in i i e or y the forms of the plural personal pronouns eo hiore hiam the frequent occurrence of the prefix i before past participles the use of v for f and prevalence of the vowel u for i or y in such words as duda hudra hulla pada hura etc but it is added on comparing the two texts carefully together some remarkable variations are apparent in the later which seem to arise not from its having been composed at a more recent period but from the infusion of an anglian or northern element into the dialect from these indications the learned editor is disposed to think that the later text may have been composed or transcribed in one of the counties conterminous to the anglian border and he suggests that perhaps we might fix on the eastern side of leicestershire as the locality one thing in the english of Leoman that is eminently deserving of notice with reference to the history of the language is the very small amount of the french or latin element that is found in it the fact itself sir f madden observes of a translation of wace's poem by a priest of one of the midland counties is sufficient evidence how widely the knowledge of the writings of the Trouver was dispersed and it would appear a natural consequence that not only the outward form of the anglo-norman versification but also that many of the terms used in the original would be borrowed this however is but true in a very trifling degree compared with the extent of the work for if we number the words derived from the french even including some that may have come directly from the latin we do not find in the earlier text of leoman's poem so many as fifty several of which were in usage as appears by the saxon chronicle previous to the middle of the twelfth century of this number the later text retains about thirty and adds to them rather more than forty which are not found in the earlier version so that if we reckon ninety words of french origin in both texts containing together more than fifty six thousand eight hundred lines we shall be able to form a tolerably correct estimate how little the english language was really affected by foreign converse even as late as the middle of the thirteenth century Leoman's poem extends to nearly thirty two thousand two hundred and fifty lines or more than double the length of wace's brute this may indicate the amount of the additions which the english chronicler has made to his french original that however is only one though the chief of several preceding works to which he professes himself to have been indebted his own account is he nom the ingliskabach the macada saint beta another he nom on latin the macada santa alban and the fair austin the fullut brute hider in bach he nom the thrida leda there amidden the macada a french's clerk was was he houghton the well conth written and he ho yeth dar ethelin eleanor the west henry's quena these harris kingus leaman leda theos bach and the leof wenda he heom leo flicka be he old litha him beo drictin featherin he nom mid fingrin and fieta on bach fella and the sotha word seta to gatherer and the three bach from the to anna that is literally he took the english book that saint bede made another he took in latin that saint alban made and the fair austin that baptism brought hither in the third 
book he took and laid there in midst that made a french clerk waste was he called that well could write and he it gave to the noble eleanor that was henry's queen the high kings laomon laid before him these books and the leaves turn he them lovingly beheld merciful to him be the lord feather pen he took with fingers and wrote on book skin and the true words set together and the three books compressed into one his english book was no doubt the translation into the vernacular tongue commonly attributed to king alfred of bede's ecclesiastical history which laomon does not seem to have known to have been originally written in latin what he says about his latin book is unintelligible st austin died in a d six o four and the only alban of whom anything is known was alban abbot of st austin's at canterbury who is mentioned by bede as one of the persons to whom he was indebted for assistance in the compilation of his history but he lived more than a century after st austin or augustine some latin chronicle however laomon evidently had and his scholarship therefore extended to an acquaintance with two other tongues in addition to the now obsolete classic form of his own the principal and indeed almost the only passage in laomon's poem from which any inference can be drawn as to the precise time when it was written is one near the end page thirty one nine seventy nine to eighty in which speaking of the tax called rome fioc rome scott or peter pence he seems to express a doubt whether it will much longer continue to be paid dritta wat who longa theo logan scullen iliasta the lord knows how long the law shall last this his learned editor conceives to allude to a resistance which it appears was made to the collection of the tax by king john and the nobility in the year twelve o five and that supposition he further suggests may be held to be fortified by the manner in which queen eleanor who had retired to aquitaine on the accession of john and died abroad at an advanced age in twelve o four is spoken of in the passage quoted above from what we may call the preface written no doubt after the work was finished eleanor the west henry's queen the structure of laomon's poem sir frederick observes consists partly of lines in which the alliterative system of the anglo-saxons is preserved and partly of couplets of unequal length rhyming together many couplets indeed occur which have both of these forms whilst others are often met with which possess neither the latter therefore must have depended wholly on accentuation or have been corrupted in transcription the relative proportion of each of these forms is not to be ascertained without extreme difficulty since the author uses them everywhere intermixed and slides from alliteration to rhyme or from rhyme to alliteration in a manner perfectly arbitrary the alliterative portion however predominates on the whole greatly over the lines rhyming together even including the imperfect or assonant terminations which are very frequent mr guest sir frederick notes has shown by the specimen which he has given with the accents marked in his english rhythms to one fourteen to twenty four that the rhyming couplets of laomon are founded on the models of accentuated anglo-saxon rhythms of four five six or seven accents laomon's poetical merit and also his value as an original authority are rated rather high by his editor his additions to and amplifications of waste we are told consist in the earlier part of the work principally of the speeches placed in the mouths of different personages which are often given with quite a dramatic effect the text of waste it is added is enlarged throughout and in many passages to such an extent particularly after the birth of arthur that one line is dilated into twenty names of persons and localities are constantly supplied and not unfrequently interpolations occur of entirely new matter to the extent of more than an hundred lines laomon often embellishes and improves on his copy and the meagre narrative of the french poet is heightened by graphic touches and details which give him a just claim to be considered not as a mere translator but as an original writer it is a remarkable circumstance sir frederick afterwards remarks that we find preserved in many passages of laomon's poem the spirit and style of the earlier anglo-saxon writers no one can read his descriptions of battles and scenes of strife without being reminded of the ode 
on ethelstan's victory at brunenburgh the ancient mythological genders of the sun and moon are still unchanged the memory of the witena gemmet has not yet become extinct and the neigh of the hengis still seems to resound in our ears very many phrases are purely anglo-saxon and with slight change might have been used in cadman or elfric a foreign scholar and poet first both in anglo-saxon and scandinavian literature has declared that tolerably well read as he is in the rhyming chronicles of his own country and of others he has found leomans beyond comparison the most lofty and animated in its style at every moment reminding the reader of the splendid phraseology of anglo-saxon verse this is the rev n f s grunt de vig of copenhagen in a prospectus which he put forth in eighteen thirty containing proposals for publishing leomon and other ancient english works we cannot do better than give as our specimen of leomon's poetry king arthur's account of his dream to which both sir frederick madden and sharon turner have called attention the dream of arthur as related by himself to his companions in arms sir frederick observes is the creation of a mind of a higher order than is apparent in the creeping rhymes of more recent chroniclers it runs thus to-night a mine slapa to-night in my sleep there ick lay on pure where i lay in bower chamber may emmaet a swayen i dreamt a dream there you are ick full sorry em therefore i full sorry em me emet that mon me ha i dreamt that men raised me up in our halla upon a hall the halla ick gone bestridden the hall i gan bestride swalk ick walden ridden so as i could ride alla tha lawn the ick ah all the land that i owned alla ick there our saw all i there over saw and wa wane sat beorin me and wa wane sat before me me sword he bar an hond my sword he bare in hand the com modred far and there then came modred to fair go there mid una meta uoka with unmeasured unnumbered folk he bar an his honda he bear in his hand an weak stronger an axe strong he begone to hewena he began to hew hard licker switha hardly exceedingly and the post is for hiao allah and the post thoroughly hewed all the hyolden up the halla that held up the hall there ik isi wen hower eaka there i saw wen hever guinevere the queen eek wimonen le ophuist may of women loveliest to me all there much a halla roth all the great mickle hall roof mid hire honden heo to draw with her hands she drew down the halla gone to helden the hall gan to tumble and ick hill to grunden and i tumbled to ground that me writ arm to brock that my right arm broke the sida modred hawa that then said modren have that aden eel tha halla adown fell the hall and wa wain gone to uala and wa wain gan to fall on feel ah there a orth and fell on the earth his a arms breaking bina his arms break both on ick e grop me sword leofa and i grasp my dear sword mid mara leoft honda with my left hand on smot of modred is hoft and smote off modred his head that hit wand athena ueld that it rolled wended on the field and the quena ik al and the queen 
by all cut to pieces snedded mid de or mena sue orda with my dear sword and say often ik heo aden sette and then i her a down set in ana swarta pata in a black pit and all me uok richa and all my rich great people sette to flema set to flight that nasta ik under christa that i wist not under christ war heo becomen wearen where they were become gone butem me se off ik gond astanden but myself i gan stand up in anna walden upon a wold or wield and ik there wandrian agon and i there gan to wander wida ye on van moren wide over the moors there ik i saw grippus there i saw gripes griffins on grislicka fugelis and grisly fowls birds the come on guldena leo then came a golden lion lithen our duna to glide over the down deorin switha henda a beast dear very handsome the ura drichtin maka that our lord made the leo may orn foreign to the lion ran forward to me and young may by van middle and took me by the middle on forth hira gun yangan and forth herself gan mu on to thara sa wenda and to the sea wind and ik i say they then and i saw the waves i thara sa driuen in the sea drive on the leo e than ulada and the lion in the flood he wenda with me si olu went with myself the wit e sa comen when we in sea came the then me hira benomen the waves from me her took come there on thick litha came there a fish to glide on faridin me to landa and brought me to land the west ik all wet then was i all wet and weary of sorian and sayak and weary from sorrow and sick the gone ik iwakian when i gan to awake switha ik gan to quakian greatly i gan to quake the gone ik to binian then gan i to tremble swalla ik al fur burna as if i all with fire burned an swa ik haba al nit and so i have all night of minna sway and a switha e thought of my dream much thought for ik wot to e wissa for i wot to certainty agone is all me blissa agone is all my bliss for a to mina liu for i to throughout my life sorian ik mat dria sorrow i must endure walla dat ik naba hera well away alas that i have not here win hower mina quena win haver my queen twenty eight thousand fourteen to twenty eight thousand ninety three here is evidently a considerable amount of true poetic life in the conception and also as far as the apparent rudeness of the language will admit if we ought not perhaps rather to say as far as the imperfect knowledge of its laws now attainable enables us to form a judgment considerable care and aptness of expression the conclusion of the address in particular is worked up to no contemptible height of artistic elegance as well as pathos let the strange antiquated spelling only be regulated according to the system with which we are all at present familiar and if we will accept such rhymes as night and thought here in queen and also sometimes perhaps consent to be satisfied without rhyme at all in consideration of certain alliterative artifices the beauty of which it must be confessed has now become of somewhat difficult appreciation we shall not find it deficient in harmony any more than in a graceful and expressive simplicity of diction ans why i hab all nicht 
of mina sweven switha he thought for i wot to e wis a gone is all my bliss for i to mina liva sorian i mata dria wela that i nob hira wan havera mina queen this will represent pretty nearly the manner in which the lines would probably be read by laomon and his contemporaries the philological interest and importance of this work of laomon's are greatly enhanced by the fortunate circumstances of its having come down to us in two texts the one evidently somewhat more recent than the other both have been most judiciously given by sir frederick madden to whom indeed we may be said to be chiefly indebted for the preservation of the latter one the manuscript containing which was so greatly injured by the deplorable fire that was allowed to seize upon the cottonian collection in the early part of the last century as to be regarded as having been rendered almost entirely illegible and useless till he took the reparation of its fragments in hand and had them bound and inlaid after they had been collected and partially restored about the year eighteen twenty seven under the superintendence of the rev j forshaw his predecessor as keeper of the manuscripts in the british museum of about twenty seven thousand lines of which the second edition as it may be called is calculated to have consisted for it is slightly condensed from the first not quite two thousand four hundred are supposed to be wholly lost and only about one thousand more are in a partially injured state so that of the thirty two thousand two hundred and fifty lines of which the poem in its more extended form consists we have still between twenty three thousand and twenty four thousand perfect in both editions an amount of material for comparison which leaves us hardly anything to regret in the loss of the three thousand or four thousand that have perished fortunately the earlier edition appears to be complete it is contained in the cottonian manuscript caligula a nine the handwriting of which is of the early part of the thirteenth century the other in the manuscript otho c thirteen the handwriting of which is supposed to be of the latter part of the same century the first text may be regarded as giving us probably the west country english of about the year twelve hundred the second that of twelve fifty the later text for the most part follows the earlier line for line though with occasional omissions the differences which it exhibits are confined to the substitution of more modern forms for such vocables constructions and modes of expression as had gone out of use or of fashion since the poem first appeared unfortunately the manuscript has suffered considerably in the part containing arthur's dream but many lines are still entire the first six for instance stand thus to-night in mina betta thar ik lay in bora me imeta a swayen thar fora ik sorry hum me meta that men me seta up in one hollow and here are the concluding six lines for ik wat al mid iwissa agon his all min blissa for ara to mine lifu sorewe ik mat Driha wella dat ik nada her mina iwayana go winifer it ought to be observed that although we have given throughout the u and v exactly as they stand in the printed edition these are really only two ways of writing what was regarded as the same letter and that in both texts sometimes the u is to be sounded like our modern v sometimes the v like our modern u thus swayven was pronounced swayven you are vore upen upen you are a very etc end of section twenty section twenty one of a compendious history of english literature and of the english language volume one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org a compendious history of english literature and of the english language volume one by george lillycrake chapter three part three the ormulum another metrical work of considerable extent that known as the ormulum from orm or ormon which appears to have been the name of the writer 
has been usually assigned to the same or nearly the same age with the brood of laomon it exists only in a single manuscript which there is some reason for believing to be the author's autograph now preserved in the bodleian library among the books bequeathed by the great scholar francis junius who appears to have purchased it at the hague in sixteen fifty nine at the sale of the books of his deceased friend janus eulitius or velitius van verliet also an eminent philologist and book collector it is a folio volume consisting of ninety parchment leaves besides twenty-nine others inserted upon which the poetry is written in double columns in a stiff but distinct hand and without division into verses so that the work had always been assumed to be in prose till its metrical character was pointed out by terwitt in his edition of chaucer's canterbury tales seventeen seventy five accordingly no mention is made of it by wharton the first volume of whose history was published in seventeen seventy four but it had previously been referred to by hicks and others and it has attracted a large share of the attention of all recent investigators of the history of the language it has now been printed in full under the title of the ormulum now first edited from the original manuscript in the bodleian with notes and a glossary by robert meadows white doctor of divinity late fellow of st mary magdalen maudlin college and formerly professor of anglo-saxon in the university of oxford two volumes octavo oxford at the university press eighteen fifty two the ormulum is described by dr white as being a series of homilies in an imperfect state composed in metre without alliteration and except in very few cases also without rhyme the subject of the homilies being supplied by those portions of the new testament which were read in the daily service of the church the plan of the writer is we are further told first to give a paraphrastic version of the gospel of the day adapting the matter to the rules of his verse with such verbal additions as were required for that purpose he then adds an exposition of the subject in its doctrinal and practical bearings in the treatment of which he borrows copiously from the writings of st augustine and eofric and occasionally from those of beta some idea it is added may be formed of the extent of ormond's labours when we consider that out of the entire series of homilies provided for nearly the whole of the yearly service nothing is left beyond the text of the thirty-second we have still nearly ten thousand long lines of the work or nearly twenty thousand as dr white prints them with the fifteen syllables divided into two sections the one of eight the other of seven syllables the latter which terminates in an unaccented syllable being prosodically equivalent to one of six so that the whole is simply our still common alternation of the eight syllabled and the six syllabled line only without either rhyme or even alliteration which makes it as pure a species of blank verse though a different species as that which is now in use the list of the texts or subjects of the homilies as preserved in the manuscript extends to two hundred and forty two and it appears to be imperfect ormond plainly claims to have completed his long self-imposed task here is the beginning of the dedication to his brother walter which stands at the head of the work new brother walter brother men now brother walter brother mine after the flesh is kinda after the flesh is kind or nature and brother men e christendom and brother mine in christendom or christ's kingdom ther fullet and ther trotha through baptism and through truth and brother men e goddess hoose and brother mine in god's house yet o 
the thrida wiza yet on in the third wise thir thot wit hothen taken ba though that we too have taken both an regel bach to folgen one rule book to follow under kaunkes had and lif under canonics canons rank and life swa sum sant austin sette so as st austin set or ruled ik hapa dan swa sum thu bad i have done so as thou bade on forthed te thin willa and performed thee thine will wish ik hapa wend in till english i have wended turned into english god spellus halga lara gospels holy lore after that little wit tot may after that little wit that me min dritten hafeth lened my lord hath lent thu thoughtest tot it mita well thou thoughtest that it might well till mickle fama turnen to mickle much profit turn if english folk for lutha of christ if english folk for love of christ it walde yerna learnen it would earnestly learn and folgen it and fillen it and follow it and fulfil it with thought with word with deeda with thought with word with deed and forty gerndest to thought it and because thou desirest that i this work the shoulder worken this work thee should work and ik it hafa for fed te and i it hath performed thee ach all thir christus helpa but all through christ's help and una birth batha fanken christ and us too it becomes both to thank christ that it is brought till enda that it is brought to end ik hafa somnad o this bach i have collected on or in this book the god spellus nay allah the gospels nigh all that sinden o the messabach that are on or in the mass book in all the year at messa in all the year at mass and i after the god spell stomp and i after the gospel stands that tot the gospel meneth that that the gospel meaneth that man birth spellen to the folk that one ought to declare to the folk of their sola neda of or for their soul or soul's need and yet ter tekken mara ino and yet there in addition more enough thou shalt teran finden thou shalt thereon or therein find of that tot christus halga fed of that that christ's holy people birth troen well and folgen behove to believe well and follow ik hafa set her o this bach i have said here on or in this book among god's spellus wordus among the gospel's words all through me self in monig word all through myself many a word the rima swa to fillin the rhyme so to fill ach thou shalt find in that min word but thou shalt find that my word i war thar it is eked everywhere there or where it is eked or added may helpen the that redden it may help them that read it to sen and thunderstanden to see and to understand all thus 
te fetra who claim birth all this the better how then it behoveth the gospel understanden the gospel to understand one remarkable feature in this english is evidently something very peculiar in the spelling and the same system is observed throughout the work it is found on a slight examination to consist in the duplication of the consonant whenever it follows a vowel having any other than the sound which is now for the most part indicated by the annexation of a silent e to the single consonant or what may be called the name sound being that by which the vowel is commonly named or spoken of in our modern english thus pain would by ormond be written pan but pan pan mean men but men men pine pin but pin pin own on but on on tune ton but ton ton this as mr guest has pointed out is after all only a rigorous carrying out of a principle which has always been applied to a certain extent in english orthography as in tally or tall berry witty folly dull as compared with tail beer white lone mule the effect however in ormond's work is on a hasty inspection to make his english seem much more rude and antique than it really is the entry of the manuscript in the catalogue of vliet's library as quoted by dr white describes it as an old swedish or gothic book other early notices speak of it as semi-saxon or half danish or possibly old scottish even hicks appears to have regarded it as belonging to the first age after the conquest ormond attaches the highest importance to his peculiar system of orthography nevertheless in quoting what he says upon the subject in the subsequent passage of his dedication we will take the liberty for the sake of giving a clear and just idea of his language to a reader of the present day to strip it of a disguise which so greatly exaggerates its apparent antiquity and waste willen shall this book and whoso shall wish this book eft other sitha written afterwards and other time to write him bidda ik that heat right right him bid i that he it right right swa soon this book him teacheth so as this book him teacheth all thwart out after that it is all athwart or throughout after that or what it is apo this first uh, bizna upon this first example with all sulk rhyme all's here is set with all such rhyme as here is set with all say fella wordus with all so many words and tot he look a well that he and that he look well that he and book stuff write a twius a letter write twice i wear there it apo this book wherever there or where it upon this book is written o that wiza is written on or in that wise look a he well that heat right a uh, sway look he well that he it right so for he nay may not ellis for he may not else on english written right te word or on or in english right right the word that white he well to soothe that what or no he well to or for sooth or truth thus presented ormond's english certainly seems to differ much less from that of the present day than layamon's his vocabulary may have as little in it of any foreign admixture but it appears to contain many fewer words than have now become obsolete and both his grammar and his construction have much more of a modern character and air dr white has not thought it necessary to subjoin any such translation to his author as sir frederick madden rightly judged was indispensable in the case of layamon he confesses also that while the handwriting 
the ink and the material of the manuscript would seem to assign it to the earlier part of the thirteenth century the grammatical forms and structure of the language rather indicate a later period we meet he says with neglect of gender and number a frequent use of prepositions substituted for the casal endings of nouns and the rejection of the prefix g e in all those parts of speech which receive it in pure anglo-saxon there is also for the most part a simplicity in grammatical forms and in the construction of sentences of the amount of any french or latin element that there may be in the vocabulary we do not find that he says anything but it is evidently very small probably not greater than we have found it to be in layamon's work the brood of layamon was undoubtedly written in the southwest of england the dialect of the ormulum is thought to betray a scandinavian character and to point to a northeastern or at least an eastern county as the part of the kingdom in which and for which it was written dr latham assigns it to northumbria mr guest is inclined to fix on some county north of thames and south of lincoln and the late mr garnett dr white tells us express his opinion in a letter to him that the ormulum was written a hundred miles or upwards to the south of durham and considered peterborough not an unlikely locality on the whole it may be assumed that while we have a dialect founded on that of the saxons specially so called in layamon we have a specially anglian form of the national language in the ormulum and perhaps that distinction will be enough without supposing any considerable difference of date to explain the linguistic differences between the two there is good reason for believing that the anglian part of the country shook off the shackles of the old inflectional system sooner than the saxon and that our modern comparatively uninflected and analytic english was at least in its earlier stage more the product of anglian than of purely saxon influences and is to be held as having grown up rather in the northern and northeastern parts of the country than in the southern or southwestern the ancren reel there is also to be mentioned along with the brood of layamon and the ormulum a work of considerable extent in prose which has been assigned to the same interesting period in the history of the language the ancren reel that is the anchorites or rather anchoresses rule being a treatise on the duties of the monastic life written evidently by an ecclesiastic and probably one in a position of eminence and authority for the direction of three ladies to whom it is addressed and who with their domestic servants or lay sisters appear to have formed the entire community of a religious house situated at tarent otherwise called tarant canes caneston or kingston in dorsetshire this work too has now been printed having been edited for the camden society in eighteen fifty three by the rev james morton bachelor of divinity it is preserved in four manuscripts three of them in the cotonian collection the other belonging to corpus christi college cambridge and there is also in the library of magdalen college oxford a latin text of the greater part of it the entire work extends to eight parts or books which in the printed edition cover two hundred and fifteen quarto pages mr morton who has appended to an apparently careful representation of the ancient text both a glossary and a version in the language of the present day has clearly shown in opposition to the commonly received opinion that the work was originally written in the english and that the latin in so far as it goes is only a translation this indeed might have been inferred as most probable in such a case on the mere ground that we have here a clergyman however learned drawing up a manual of practical religious instruction for readers of the other sex even without the special proofs which mr morton has brought forward the conclusion to which he states himself to have come after carefully examining and comparing the text which he prints with the oxford manuscript is that the latin is a translation in many parts abridged and in some enlarged made it a comparatively recent period when the language in which the whole had been originally written was becoming obsolete in many instances in fact the latin translator has misunderstood his original mr morton has also thrown great doubts upon the common belief that the authorship of the work is to be ascribed to a certain simon de gandavo or simon de gant who died bishop of salisbury in thirteen fifteen this belief rests solely on the authority of an anonymous note prefixed to the latin version of the work preserved in magdalen college oxford and mr morton conceives that simon is of much too late a date 
it might have been thought that the fact of the work having been written in english would of itself be conclusive against his claim but the bishop of salisbury it seems was born in london or westminster it was only his father who was a native of flanders on the whole mr morton is inclined to substitute in place of bishop simon a richard poor who was successively bishop of chichester of salisbury and of durham and who was a native of tarent where also it seems he died in twelve thirty seven of this prelate matthew paris speaks in very high terms of commendation two other mistakes in the old accounts are also disposed of that the three recluses to whom the work is addressed belong to the monastic order of st james and that they were the sisters of the writer he merely directs them if any ignorant person should ask them of what order they were to say that they were of the order of st james who in his canonical epistle has declared that pure religion consists in visiting and relieving the widow and the orphan and in keeping ourselves unspotted from the world and in addressing them as his dear sisters he only as mr morton explains uses the form of speech commonly adopted in convents where nuns are usually spoken of as sisters or mothers and monks as brothers or fathers upon what is the most important question relating to the work regarded as a documentary monument belonging to the history of the language the learned editor has scarcely succeeded in throwing so much light of the age of the manuscripts or the character of the handwriting not a word is said it does not even appear whether any one of the copies can be supposed to be of the antiquity assumed for the work upon either the new or the old theory of its authorship the question is left to rest entirely upon the language which it is remarked is evidently that of the first quarter of the thirteenth century not greatly differing from that of layamon which has been clearly shown by sir f madden to have been written not later than twelve o five the english of the ancren rule is indeed rude enough for the highest antiquity that can be demanded for it the spelling mr morton observes whether from carelessness or want of system is of an uncommon and unsubtle character and may be pronounced barbarous and uncouth the language he considers to be what is commonly called semi-saxon or anglo-saxon somewhat changed and in the first of the various stages through which it had to pass before it arrived at the copiousness and elegance of the present english this statement is perhaps not quite consistent with the doctrine which afterwards seems to be laid down that no particular effect was produced upon the language of england by the norman conquest that it only after that revolution continued to go on in the same course of gradual disintegration or simplification which it had been running for some centuries suffering nothing more of change than it would have done if the normans had never invaded the country if that were so how can the stage in which it is supposed to have been found some short time after the conquest be with propriety spoken of as the first of a series but is it possible to believe that so complete a social revolution as the conquest affecting everything else in the country should have left the language which is always to so great an extent the expression or reflection of everything else untouched the gradual change that may have been proceeding for some time before is not inconsistent with or any disproof of the more sudden and violent change which may have taken place at this crisis precipitating the ruin of the already decaying original system of the language just as the shaking of a tree by a blast of wind or in any other way would bring down at once a shower of leaves or blossoms which although beginning to wither or lose their hold might still have hung on for a considerable time longer if the tree had not been thus rudely assailed in this work according to mr morton the inflections which originally marked the oblique cases of substantive nouns and also the distinctions of gender are for the most part discarded yet he adds as these changes are partial and incomplete enough of the more ancient characteristics of the language is left to justify the inference that the innovations are recent not only is es of the genitive case retained but we very often meet with the dative and the accusative in e and the accusative in en as then the we also meet occasionally with the genitive plural in re from the saxon ra and ne and in e from e n a the cases and genders of adjectives are generally disused but not always the moods and tenses of verbs are little altered from the older forms and in many words they are not changed at all the infinitive which in pure saxon ends invariably in a n is changed into e n in only three infinitives warny to warn ewertha to be and windwe to winnow 
has the final n dropped off nor does the language exhibit any of the other scandinavian peculiarities which mark what hicks calls the dano-saxon or what is known to modern philology as the anglian dialect from this and from its general resemblance to the older text of layamon which appears to have been produced on the banks of the severn mr morton thinks it most probable that the english we have in the rule is that of the west of england in the thirteenth century in one particular however it differs remarkably from layamon's english in that as we have seen sir f madden found in above thirty two thousand verses of the older text only about fifty words of french derivation and only about ninety in all in the fifty seven thousand of both texts whereas in the present work the infusion of norman words is described as large but this as mr morton suggests is owing probably to the peculiar subjects treated of in it which are theological and moral in speaking of which terms derived from the latin would readily occur to the mind of a learned ecclesiastic much conversant with that language and with the works on similar subjects written in it a few sentences from the eighth or last part which treats of domestic matters will afford a sufficient specimen of this curious work ye nay schoolen etten leshes nay san buten in a macho sucknes uh, other whoso is uer fevel heated potage blithleke and wonius who to lotto grunch nevertheless liu sustren our meta and our grunch howard ithunt me lesser than ichwalder ne usta ye nena dei to bread and to water but ye haben liwa sum ankra mocketh her board mid her gis withouten that is to much fury on the shipper you are of all orders the on is hit on kindalukis and mestian ankra order that is all dead to the world me how with he heard off the sick and that the other men specken mid quick men how that he o etten mid quick men ne uant ik newer yet ne machia ye nana gisningus ne ne tilla ye to the yet non uncutha harlows thou there ne'er non other vool of hit uta hora methlisa moth hit walda other wola latin eon bleca fautus that is literally ye not shall eat flesh nor lard but in much sickness or whoso is ever feeble may eat pottage blithely and accustom yourselves to little drink nevertheless dear sisters your meat and your drink have seemed to me less than i would have it fast ye not no day to bread and to water but ye have leave some anchoresses make their board or meals with their friends without that is too much friendship for of all orders then is it most unnatural and most against anchoress order that is all dead to the world one has heard off say that dead men speak with quick living men but that they eat with quick men not found i never yet make not ye no banquetings nor allure ye not to the gate no strange vagabonds though there were not none other evil of it but their measureless mouth or talk it would or might other while sometimes hinder heavenly thought and again ye mine lua sustren ni schoolen haben no best boot cot one ancra that howeth ita funcheth that whoswith asa martha was then ancra nay none wise my hail beyond marie mid griff fulnessa of heart vor theon matio fenchen of the cus fadra and of hord mon hure olenen then a highward warian juan me pontire and yeldon thee the hermes what christ this is lodlick thing 
Kwan me maketh in tune of Ankra Ita. Thou yif in a mat nida haben tu loka vet yo non man ne ali ne ne hermi ne vet hir thought ne bio now thereon e questioned ankra ne out now to haben no thing vet draw outward hir heart none shefer ne dry ye ankra that is cheapled he who cheapeth higher soul the chapman of hell nay wider ye now in our house of other man's things nay out nay close nay now nay underu ye the churcha estimens nay then a collar's brute ye strengthen hit maki other macho eye for of swetcha witung is ekumen macho bull off sithen within an hour wonus nay let a year nena mons lapen if much on the odd mid allah maketh brecken our house the hollow that if thur is ye broken lok that ye haben therein mid our one woman of clean lu deus and and nitis who art there that no man nay sith who nay ye sith nena man well my do of our clothes beyond how white beyond how black but that he how bon yorn and warm and well he wrought who else well he taught and habeth a's money as a who to neodeth to bed and eat to rug next flesh ne shall mon wherein no linen cloth but ye hid bio of herd and of grape jardin stamen hav house wool and hose well beyond beyond button ye school and ligand in on heater and de gird ne bear ye non iron ne hear nor espel fells no ne beat on their midda nor mid scourge live lethard ne eleded ne mid holy and ne mid brerus but be lodge her sylph without shrift's league ne nema and ends to veal disciplines our scone beyond great and warm in a summer ye habeth le otter gone and sit and barret and hosen with it aramps and liga in a hum as woe licketh ring ne broach naba he no goodle imen brit ne glowen me no such thing that on we day for to haben ye ne schoolen send in letters ne underin letters ne writen booten lee ye schoolen be an udaden for sith in the year unto lighten o'er heard and also halfen letten blood and offer ye need is and hazer my beyond there withouten it hid by well etholian literally ye my dear sister shall not have no beast but a cat only an anchoress that hath cattle seems a better housewife as martha was than anchoress nor nowise may she be merry with peacefulness of heart for then must she think of the cow's fodder and of the herdsman's hire flatter the hayward cattle-keeper defend herself when they pound her put her cattle in the pound and pay moreover the harms damages know with christ this is an ugly thing when they make moan complaint in town of anchoress's cattle though if any must needs have a cow look that she no man not annoy nor not harm no that her thought not be not thereon fastened an anchoress not ought not to have nothing that draweth outward her heart no chaffering not drive ye no buying and selling carry ye on an anchoress that is a chaffer she chaffereth her soul with the chapman of hell nor take ye not charge in your house of other men's things nor cattle nor clothes nor not receive ye not under your care the church vestments nor the chalice but if unless strength it make force compel it or much fear for of such charge taking has come much evil oftentimes within your walls let ye not no man sleep if much need strong necessity withal however it may cause to use your house the while that so long as it ever is used look that ye have therein with you a woman of clean life days and nights because that no man neither seeth you nor ye see no man well may ye do of with your clothes be they white be they black but see that they be plain and warm and well made skins well tawed 
and have as many as it needeth you to bed and eke to back next the flesh shall not one wear no linen cloth but if it be of hard and of great coarse canvas a stamen shirt of woolen and linen may have whoso will and whoso will may be without ye shall lie in a garment and girt nor bear carry ye not iron nor hair hair cloth nor hedgehog skins nor beat not yourselves therewith nor with scourge leather nor leaded nor with holly nor with briars not blood not herself yourselves without shrifts shrivers leave nor take not at once too many disciplines flagellations let your shoes be large and warm in summer ye have leave for to go and sit barefoot and to wear hose without vamps whoso liketh may lie in them ring nor brooch do not ye have nor girdle ornamented nor gloves nor no such thing that is it not behoveth you for to have ye shall not send letters nor receive letters nor write without leave ye shall be cropped four times in the year for to lighten your head and as often let blood and oftener if need is and whoso may be there without may dispense with this i it may well endure end of section twenty one section twenty two of a compendious history of english literature and of the english language volume one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org a compendious history of english literature and of the english language volume one by george lilly craik chapter three part four metrical legends land of cocaine gildevord willa greece early english songs with regard to the metrical legends of saints and other pieces which have been assigned by hicks and wharton to the twelfth century it is in the highest degree probable has already remarked that none of them belong to an earlier period than the latter part of the thirteenth and that some are not even of that antiquity it is impossible for instance to believe that the celebrated satirical poem on the land of cocaine which wharton holds to have been evidently written soon after the conquest at least before the reign of henry the second can in the form in which we have it be older than the year thirteen hundred if it be even quite so old price has noted that a french fabliau bearing a near resemblance to this poem and possibly the production upon which the english minstrel founded his song has been published in the new edition of barbazan's fabliau et contes paris eighteen o eight volume four page one seventy five and sir frederick madden has no doubt that the french composition is the original it is undoubtedly of the thirteenth century the english poem which he also assumes to be a translation is given in full by ellis specimens of early english poets fourth edition one eighty three to ninety five and abundant samples of the other fugitive and anonymous poetry which has been attributed to the same age but the alleged antiquity of which is in many cases equally disputable may be found in hicks and in warden as we have had occasion to show that there is no authority in the Lana cost chronicle for one specimen of early verse cited thence by ritson we may here insert a couplet therein given under the year twelve forty four which has generally escaped attention a norfolk peasant boy named william had left his father's house and set out to seek his fortune with no companion or other possession but a little pig poor callus whence the people used to call him willie grease that having in his wanderings in france met with a rich widow whom he wooed and wed he became in the end a great man in that country still he piously remembered his early life of poverty and vagrancy and among the other ornaments of one of the apartments of his fine house to which he used to retire every day for an hour's meditation and self-communion he had himself pictured leading the pig as he used to do with a string with this superscription in his native tongue willie grease willie grease Fitcha twat thou was and quat thou is some of our earliest songs that have been preserved undoubtedly belong to about the middle of the thirteenth century the well-known lines beginning summer is a cumin inn first printed by wharton in the additions to his history from the 
harley and manuscript nine seventy eight being the oldest english song that has been found with the musical notes annexed appear to be of this antiquity and so likewise may be some of the other pieces which wharton has quoted from another of the harleian manuscripts twenty two fifty three but the compositions of this kind of most certain date are some referring to the public events of the day and evidently written at the time such as the ballad about the battle of lewes fought in twelve sixty four and others in percy's relics in ritson's ancient songs and in mr wright's collection printed for the camden society and entitled the political songs of england from the reign of john to that of edward the second quarto london eighteen thirty nine early english metrical romances from the thirteenth century also we are probably to date the origin or earliest composition of english metrical romances at least none have descended to the present day which seem to have a claim to any higher antiquity there is no absolutely conclusive evidence that all our old metrical romances are translations from the french the french original cannot in every case be produced but it is at least extremely doubtful if any such work was ever composed in english except upon the foundation of a similar french work it is no objection that the subjects of most of these poems are not french or continental but british that the stories of some of them are purely english or saxon this as has been shown was the case with the early northern french poetry generally from whatever cause whether simply in consequence of the connection of normandy with this country from the time of the conquest or partly from the earlier intercourse of the normans with their neighbours the people of amorica or britannia whose legends and traditions which were common to them with their kindred the welsh have unquestionably served as the fountain-head to the most copious of all the streams of romantic fiction french seems to have been the only language of popular literature apart from mere songs and ballads in england for some ages after the conquest if even a native legend therefore was to be turned into a romance it was in french that the poem would at that period be written it is possible indeed that some legends might have escaped the french trouveur to be discovered and taken up at a later date by the english minstrels but this is not likely to have happened with any that were at all popular or generally known and of this description it is believed are all those without any exception upon which our existing early english metrical romances are founded the subjects of these compositions tristram king horn havelock etc could hardly have been missed by the french poets in the long period during which they had the whole field to themselves we have the most conclusive evidence with regard to some of the legends in question that they were well known at an early date to the writers in that language the story of havelock for instance is in Gaimar's chronicle upon this general consideration alone therefore which is at least not contradicted by either the internal or historical evidence in any particular case it seems reasonable to infer that where we have both an english and a french metrical romance upon the same subject the french is the earlier of the two and the original of the other from this it is in the circumstances scarcely a step to the conclusion come to by Turwitt, who has intimated his belief that we have no english romance prior to the age of chaucer which is not a translation or imitation of some earlier french romance certainly if this judgment has not been absolutely demonstrated it has not been refuted by the more extended investigation the question has since received publications of percy wharton to wit pinkerton herbert ritson ellis scott weber Hooterson, lang hartshorn the roxburgh club the bannatyne the maitland the abbotsford the camden society the first account in any detail of our early english metrical romances was given by percy in the third volume of his relics of ancient english poetry first published in seventeen sixty five in this essay of twenty-four pages extended to thirty-eight in the fourth edition of the work seventeen ninety four he gave a list of thirty of these poems to which in subsequent editions he added nine more then came the first volume of wharton's history of english poetry in seventeen seventy four with a much more discursive examination at least of parts of the subject and ample specimens of several romances Turwitt's edition of the canterbury tales of chaucer followed the next year with many valuable notices on this as well as other matters belonging to our early literature in the interesting preliminary essay on the language and versification of his author which is in fact a history of the language down to the end of the fourteenth century in seventeen ninety two pinkerton inserted the scotch metrical romance of gowan and gallagras from an edinburgh edition of fifteen o eight in his collection of scottish poems reprinted from scarce editions three hundred and fifty 
three volumes octavo london and he also gave in his last volume as one of three pieces before unpublished that of sir gawain and sir garleron of galloway which was copied into sibald's chronicle of scottish poetry one pages fifteen etc four volumes octavo edinburgh eighteen o two in seventeen ninety eight appeared robert the duel a metrical romance from an ancient illuminated manuscript octavo london printed for i herbert whose name is also at the end of a short prefatory advertisement in which it is stated that the manuscript agreed word for word with a remaining fragment of an edition of the poem which appears to have been printed early in the sixteenth century by winken the word or pinson the volume has a number of engravings which are very curious and seem to be facsimiles of the illuminations in the manuscript in eighteen o two ritson published at london his three volumes octobo of ancient english metrical romances containing besides his dissertation on romance and minstrelsy which fills two hundred and twenty pages of the first volume the romances and their entire length of ewain and gawain four thousand thirty two lines of lawnful or lawnful miles a translation from the french of marie by thomas chester in the reign of henry the sixth one thousand forty four lines of libius discanus that is lebo descanu or the fair unknown sometimes called libius disconius two thousand one hundred and thirty lines of the jest of king horn one thousand five hundred and forty six lines of the king of tars and the sudan of damas one thousand one hundred and forty eight lines of imar one thousand thirty five lines of sir orfeo five hundred and ten lines of the chronicle of england one thousand thirty six lines of la bonne florence of rome two thousand one hundred and eighty nine lines of the earl of Toulouse, one thousand two hundred and eighteen lines of the squire of low degree one thousand one hundred and thirty two lines and of the knight of courtesy and the fair lady of bagnell five hundred lines together with one hundred and thirty three pages of notes including the imperfect romance of hornchild and maiden rim nil about one thousand one hundred and fifty lines from the auchinleck manuscript in the advocates library of edinburgh the whole being followed by a glossary filling about eighty pages in commendation of which however very little can be said with the exception of the square of low degree and the knight of courtesy which are from rare black-letter copies of the sixteenth century all the pieces in this collection of ritson's are transcribed from manuscripts most of them unique a more successful attempt to diffuse a knowledge of this portion of our ancient poetical literature was made by mr george ellison his specimens of early english metrical romances three volumes octavo first published in eighteen o five besides an historical introduction on the rise and progress of romantic composition in france and england followed by an analysis by mr deuce of the manuscript work of petrus alphonsus entitled de clericale dixcipline and an account amounting almost to a complete translation of the twelve lays of marie of france this work of which a second edition appeared in eighteen eleven contained extended analytical reviews of the romances of merlin mort d'arthur guy of warwick sir bevis of hampton richard coeur de leon roland and farragus sir utuel sir ferrambras the history of the seven wise masters florence and blanche fleur robert of sicile sir assembra sir priamour the life of Impalmidon, sir egler moore of artois lay la frame sir egger sir graham and sir gracefield sir de gore roswall and lillian and amos and amelian most of these romances may be considered of later date than those published by ritson mr ellis indeed on his title page describes them as chiefly written during the early part of the fourteenth century meanwhile in eighteen o four walter scott had published at edinburgh in royal octavo the romance of tristan from the like manuscript describing it on his title page as a work of the thirteenth century written in scotland by thomas of ercole doon popularly called the rhymer and maintaining that theory in an elaborate and ingenious introduction and a large body of curious illustrative annotation one of the appendices to this volume which has been several times reprinted contained an account of the contents of the like manuscript consisting of forty-four pieces in all of ancient poetry complete or imperfect scott it may be remarked here acknowledges that there can be little doubt of the volume which consists of three hundred and thirty-four leaves of parchment the writing being in double columns in a nearly uniform hand of the earlier part 
of the fourteenth century having been compiled in england in many circumstances he said led him to conclude that the manuscript has been written in an anglo-norman convent in eighteen ten scott's firm mr henry weber brought out at edinburgh in three volumes octavo his collection entitled metrical romances of the thirteenth fourteenth and fifteenth centuries published from ancient manuscripts with an introduction notes and a glossary this work contains the romances of king alessander eight thousand thirty four lines sir Clegus, five hundred and forty lines lay lefrain four hundred and two lines richard coeur de leon seven thousand one hundred and thirty six lines the life of in two thousand three hundred and forty six lines amos and amelion two thousand four hundred and ninety five lines the process of the same sages four thousand two lines octuian imperator one thousand nine hundred and sixty two lines sir amadus seven hundred and seventy eight lines and the hunting of the hare two hundred and seventy lines the next collection that appeared was that of mr edward vernon ooderson entitled select pieces of early popular poetry republished principally from early printed copies in the black letter two volumes octavo london eighteen seventeen it contained the metrical romances or tales of sir treyamore one thousand five hundred and ninety three lines sir isen bross eight hundred and fifty five lines sir de gore nine hundred and ninety three lines sir gauter six hundred and eighty five lines besides a number of other pieces occupying the second volume which cannot be included under that denomination next followed mr david lang's three collections the first entitled select remains of the ancient popular poetry of scotland quarto edinburgh eighteen twenty two containing twenty five pieces in all among which are the aventures of arthur at the turn walthrolin being another copy from a manuscript of the fifteenth century in the library of lincoln cathedral of pinkertons sir gawain and sir galleron of galloway and the tale of orpheo and herodotus that is orpheus and eurydice from the ocean like manuscript being another and very different version of ritson sir orpheo the second entitled early metrical tales octavo edinburgh eighteen twenty six containing the history of sir eager sir graham and sir graysteel two thousand eight hundred and sixty lines the history of roswall and lillian which mr lang had already printed separately in eighteen twenty two eight hundred and seventy six lines together with other poems and shorter pieces all from earlier printed copies the third entitled the knightly tale of gologrus and gawain and other ancient poems black letter quarter eighteen thirty seven being a reprint of a unique volume in the advocates library printed by w chapman in a myler in fifteen o eight and containing eleven pieces in all among which besides gologrus and gawain are the tale of orpheus and eurydice another version attributed to robert henryson and sir eglamour of artois which is analyzed in ellis this last mentioned volume is extremely scarce only seventy-four copies most of them more or less damaged having been saved from a fire at the printers the unique volume of which it is a reprint and which is in a very decayed state was presented to the advocates library by a medical gentleman of edinburgh about seventeen eighty eight and is understood to have been picked up somewhere in ayrshire one of the pieces the porteous of nobleness the last in the collection is in prose then came the rev charles henry hartshorn's ancient metrical tales printed chiefly from original sources octavo london eighteen twenty nine containing besides several pieces and other kinds of poetry the romance of king ethelstone floris and blanche flor apparently from the auchinleck manuscript and a portion of the alliterative romance of william and the werewolf there have also been printed by the roxborough club le mort arthur adventures of sir lancelot du lot quarto london eighteen nineteen from the harleian manuscript two thousand two hundred and fifty two being one of those analyzed by ellis chevalier Asinia, that is the chevalier o Sinia, or knight of the swan from the cotton manuscript cal a two being a translation of a portion of a french romance which is also preserved with a short introduction and glossary by mr Uderson quarto london eighteen twenty the ancient english romance of havelock the dane accompanied by the french text with an introduction notes and a glossary by frederick madden esq now sir f madden quarto london eighteen twenty eight and the ancient english romance of william and the werewolf edited with an introduction and glossary by sir frederick madden quarto london eighteen thirty two by the bannatyne club the book of alexander the great reprinted from the metrical romance printed at edinburgh by r Boothnock about the year fifteen eighty quarto edinburgh eighteen thirty four the seven sages in scotch metre by john rowland of dalkeith 
reprinted from the edition of fifteen seventy eight porto edinburgh eighteen thirty seven the scottish metrical romance of lancelot du lac from a manuscript of the fifteenth century edited by joseph stevenson esq quarto edinburgh eighteen thirty nine and sir gowan a collection of ancient romance poems by scottish and english authors relating to that celebrated knight of the round table with an introduction notes and a glossary by sir frederick madden including sir gowan and the green knight the Onters of arthur at the turn rothland the knightly tale of gala gross and gowan and an appendix of shorter pieces quarto london eighteen thirty nine by the maitland club sir bevis of hampton a metrical romance now first edited from the auchinleck manuscript by w b doctor of divinity turnbull esq quarto edinburgh eighteen thirty eight by the bannatyne and maitland clubs in conjunction clarodus a metrical romance from a manuscript of the sixteenth century edited by edward piper esq quarto edinburgh eighteen thirty by the abbotsford club the romances of roland and bernagu and otuel from the auchinleck manuscript edited by a nicholson esq quarto eighteen thirty six and arthur and merlin a metrical romance from the auchinleck manuscript edited by mr turnbull quarto eighteen thirty eight and by the camden society three early english metrical romances with an introduction and glossary edited by john robson esq quarto london eighteen forty two the three romances which are edited from a manuscript of the fifteenth century called the ireland manuscript from its former possessor of that name being the entours of arthur at the tarna Walthelen, other versions of which as already noticed have been printed by pinkerton lang and madden sir amadeus a different version of which is in weber's collection and the avowing of king arthur sir gawain sir kay and sir bodwin of breton which is here printed for the first time End of section twenty two section twenty three of a compendious history of english literature and of the english language volume one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org a compendious history of english literature and of the english language volume one by george lilly craik chapter three part five history of the english metrical romance although however it thus appears that a very considerable body of our early romantic poetry has now been made generally accessible it is to be observed that only a small proportion of what has been printed is derived from manuscripts of even so early a date as the fourteenth century and that many of the volumes which have just been enumerated are merely re-impressions of compositions which cannot be traced at least in the form in which we have them beyond the sixteenth of the undoubted produce of the thirteenth century in this kind of writing we have very little if we except the romances of king horn sir tristram havelock and sir gawain with perhaps two or three others in ritson and weber it is probable indeed that many of the manuscripts of later date are substantially transcripts from earlier ones but in such cases even when we have the general form of the poems as first written tolerably well preserved the language is almost always more or less modernized the history of the english metrical romance appears shortly to be that at least the first examples of it were translations from the french that there is no evidence of any such having been produced before the close of the twelfth century that in the thirteenth century were composed the earliest of those we now possess in their original form that in the fourteenth the english took the place of the french metrical romance with all classes and that this was the era alike of its highest ascendancy and of its most abundant and felicitous production that in the fifteenth it was supplanted by another species of poetry among the more educated classes and had also to contend with another rival in the prose romance but that nevertheless it still continued to be produced although in less quantity and of an inferior fabric mostly indeed if not exclusively by the mere modernization of older compositions for the use of the common people and that it did not altogether cease to be read and written till after the commencement of the sixteenth from that time the taste for this earliest form of our poetical literature at least counting from the norman conquest lay asleep in the national heart till it was reawakened in our own day by scott after the lapse of three hundred years 
but the metrical romance was then become quite another sort of thing than it had been in its proper era throughout the whole extent of which while the story was generally laid in a past age the manners and state of society described were notwithstanding in most respects those of the poets and of his readers or hearers own time this was strictly the case with the poems of this description which were produced in the thirteenth fourteenth and fifteenth centuries and even in those which were accommodated to the popular taste of a later day much more than the language had to be partially modernized to preserve them in favor when this could no longer be done without too much violence to the composition or an entire destruction of its original character the metrical romance lost its hold of the public mind and was allowed to drop into oblivion there had been very little of mere antiquarianism in the interest it had inspired for three centuries it had pleased principally as a picture or reflection of manners usages and the general spirit of society still existing or supposed to exist and this is perhaps the condition upon which any poetry must ever expect to be extensively and permanently popular we need not say that the temporary success of the metrical romance as revived by scott was in great part owing to his appeal to quite a different almost an opposite state of feeling we give no specimens of our early english metrical romances because no extracts such as we could afford room for from one or two of them could do much or almost anything to convey a notion of the general character of these compositions although written in verse they are essentially not so much poems as histories or narrative works at least what poetry is in them lies almost always in the story rather than in anything else the form of verse is manifestly adopted chiefly as an aid to the memory in their recitation even the musical character which the romance poetry is supposed originally to have had if it ever was attempted to be maintained in long compositions of this description which it is difficult to believe appears very early to have been abandoned hence when reading became a more common accomplishment and recitation fell into comparative disuse the verse came to be regarded as merely an impediment to the free and easy flow of the story and was by general consent laid aside such being the case it is easy to understand that an old metrical romance is hardly to be better represented by extracts than an architectural structure would be by a bit of one of the walls even the more ornamented or animated passages derive most of their effect from the place they occupy or the connection in which they stand with the rest the only way therefore of exhibiting any of these compositions intelligibly or fairly is to print the whole or at the least if only portions of the story are produced in the words of the original to give the rest of it somewhat abridged it may be in modern language this latter method has been very successfully followed by ellis and his specimens which work will be found to take a general survey of nearly the whole field of fiction with which our early english metrical romances are conversant another thing to be observed of these compositions is that they are in very few cases ascribed to any particular writer nor have they in general any such peculiarity of style as might mark and distinguish their authorship a few only may be accounted exceptions among them the romance of tristram and if so we may understand what robert de brun means when he appears to speak of its english as strange and quaint but usually their style is merely that of the age in which they were written they differ from one another in short rather in the merit of the story itself than by anything in the manner of telling it the expression and the rhyme are both for the most part whatever comes first to hand the verse irregular and rugged enough withal is kept in such shape and order as it has by a crowd of tautologies expletives and other blank phrases serviceable only for filling up a gap and is altogether such verse as might apparently be almost improvised or chanted extempore these productions therefore are scarcely to be considered as forming any part of our literature properly so called interesting as they are on many accounts for the warm and vigorous imagination that often revels in them for their vivid expression of the feelings and modes of thought of a remote age for the light they throw upon the history of the national manners and mind and even of the language in its first rude but bold essays to mimic the solemnities of literary composition metrical chronicle of robert of gloucester nearly what biography is to history are the metrical romances to the versified chronicle of robert of gloucester a narrative of british and english affairs from the time of brutus to the end of the reign of henry the third which from events to which it alludes must have been written after twelve ninety seven all that is known of the author is that he was a monk of the abbey of gloucester his chronicle was printed faithfully i dare say says turwit but from incorrect manuscripts by herne in two volumes octavo at oxford in seventeen twenty four 
and a reimpression of this edition was produced at london in eighteen ten the work in the earlier part of it may be considered a free translation of geoffrey of monmouth's latin history but it is altogether a very rude and lifeless composition this rhyming chronicle says wharton is totally destitute of art or imagination the author has clothed the fables of geoffrey of monmouth in rhyme which have often a more poetical air in geoffrey's prose tyrwhitt refers to robert of gloucester in proof of the fact that the english language had already acquired a strong tincture of french wharton observes that the language of this writer is full of saxonisms and not more easy or intelligible than that of what he calls the norman saxon poems of king horn and others which he believes to belong to the preceding century robert of gloucester's chronicle as printed is in long lines of fourteen syllables which however are generally divisible into two of eight and six and were perhaps intended to be so written and read the language appears to be marked by the peculiarities of west country english ample specimens are given by wharton and ellis we shall not encumber our limited space with extracts which are recommended by no attraction either in the matter or manner we will only transcribe as a sample of the language at the commencement of the reign of edward i and for the sake of the curious evidence it supplies in confirmation of a fact to which we have more than once had occasion to draw attention the short passage about the prevalence of the french tongue in england down even to this date more than two centuries after the conquest thus come lo angolanda into normanna's honda on the normans ne cutha speca though bota her oa specha and speca french as do da autum and here children do da also techa so that haman of this land that of her blood come holdeth alla falca specca that he of hem nama vorbata aman quoth the french me tolf of him well luta ac lo men holdeth to inglis and to her conda specca uta ic wena there be na man in world contraeus nana that he holdeth to her conda specca but angeland ona ac well me wat vor to cana botha well it is vor the mora vata man come the mora worth he is that is literally thus lo england came into the hand of the normans and the normans could not speak then but their own speech and spoke french as they did at home and their children did also teach so that high men of this land that of their blood come retain all the same speech that they of them took for unless a man know french one talketh of him little but lo men hold to english and to their natural speech yet i imagine there be no people in any country of the world that do not hold to their natural speech but in england alone but well i wot it is well to know both for the more that a man knows the more worth he is a short composition of robert of gloucester's on the martyrdom of thomas a becker was printed by the percy society in eighteen forty five robert manning or de Brune. along with this chronicle may be mentioned the similar performance of robert manning otherwise called robert de Brune, from his birthplace brune or bourne near depping or market deeping in lincolnshire belonging as it does to a date not quite half a century later the work of robert de brun is in two parts both translated from the french the first coming down to the death of cadwallader from wace's brut the second extending to the death of edward i from the french or romance chronicle written by piers or peter de langtoff a canon regular of st austin at bridlington in yorkshire who has been mentioned in a former page and who appears to have lived at the same time with de brun langtoft whose chronicle though it has not been printed is preserved in more than one manuscript begins with brutus but de brun for sufficient reasons it is probable preferred wace for the earlier portion of the story and only took to his own countrymen and contemporary when deserted by his older norman guide it is the latter part of his work however which owing to the subject has been thought most valuable or interesting in modern times it has been printed by herne under the title of peter langtoft's chronicle as illustrated and improved by robert of brun from the death of cadwallader to the end of king edward the first's reign transcribed and now first published from a manuscript in the inner temple library two volumes octavo oxford seventeen twenty five reprinted london eighteen ten this part like 
the original french of langtoft is in alexandrine verse of twelve syllables the earlier part which remains in manuscript is in the same octosyllabic verse in which its original wasis chronicle is written the work is stated in a latin note at the end of the manuscript to have been finished in thirteen thirty eight written bibliographia poetica page thirty three is very wroth with wharton for describing de brune as having scarcely more poetry than robert of gloucester which only proves ritson says his want of taste or judgment it may be admitted that de brune's chronicle exhibits the language in a considerably more advanced state than that of gloucester and also that he appears to have more natural fluency than his predecessor his work also possesses greater interest from his occasionally speaking in his own person and from his more frequent expansion and improvement of his french original by new matter before poetry it would probably require a taste or judgment equal to ritson's own to detect much of it it is in the prologue prefixed to the first part of his chronicle that the famous passage occurs about the romance of sir tristram its strange or quaint english and its authors thomas and ursuldoon assumed to be the same person in kendale which has given rise to so much speculation and controversy de brune is also the author of two other rhyming translations one of the latin prose treatise of his contemporary the cardinal bonaventura de senna at passione domini at poenus s mariae virginis which title he converts into meditations of the supper of our lord de jesu and also of his passion and acre of the painus of his suite modern maiden maria the other a very free paraphrase of what has commonly been described as the manual du peche or manual of sin of bishop grosstet but is in fact the work with the same title written by william de waddington copious extracts from these and also from other translations of which it is thought that de brune may possibly be the author are given by wharton who if he has not sufficiently appreciated the poetical merits of this writer has at any rate awarded him a space which ought to satisfy his most ardent admirers roll or hampole davy other obscure writers in verse of the earlier part of the fourteenth century were richard roll often called richard hampole or of hampole a hermit of the order of st augustine who lived in or near the nunnery of hampole four miles from doncaster and after his death in eighteen forty nine was honoured as a saint and who is the author or reputed author of various metrical paraphrases of parts of scripture and other prolix theological effusions all of which that are preserved ritson has enumerated seventeen of them slumber in manuscript and are not likely to be disturbed and adam davy who rather preceded roll being reckoned the only poet belonging to the reign of edward the second and to whom are also attributed a number of religious pieces preserved only in one manuscript much damaged in the bodleian besides the metrical romance of the life of alexander of which two copies exist one in the bodleian the other in the library of lincoln's inn but there is every reason for believing that this last mentioned work which is printed in weber's collection under the title of king alessander and is one of the most spirited of our early romances is by another author there is no ground for assigning it to davy except the circumstance of the bodleian copy being bound up with his visions legends scripture histories and other much more pious than poetical lucubrations and its style is as little in his way as its subject lawrence Mino, putting aside the authors of some of the best of the early metrical romances whose names are generally or universally unknown perhaps the earliest writer of english verse who deserves the name of a poet is lawrence minot who lived and wrote about the middle of the fourteenth century and of the reign of edward the third his ten poems in celebration of the battles and victories of that king preserved in the cotton manuscript galba e nine which the old catalogue had described as a manuscript of chaucer the compiler having been misled by the name of some former proprietor richard chauffer inscribed in the volume were discovered by tyrwhitt while collecting materials for his edition of the canterbury tales in a note to the essay on the language and versification of chaucer prefixed to which work their existence was first mentioned this was in seventeen seventy five in seventeen eighty one some specimens of them were given out of their chronological place by wharton in the third volume of his history of poetry finally in seventeen ninety six the whole were published by ritson under the title of poems written anno thirteen hundred and fifty two by lawrence minot with introductory dissertations on the scottish wars of edward the third on his claim to the throne of france and notes in glossary octavo london and a reprint of this volume appeared in eighteen twenty five of the two hundred and fifty pages or thereby of which it consists only about fifty are occupied by the poems which are ten in number 
their subjects being the battle of halidon hill fought thirteen thirty three the battle of bannockburn thirteen fourteen or rather the manner in which that defeat sustained by his father had been avenged by edward the third edward's first invasion of france thirteen thirty nine the sea fight in the swine or zwin thirteen forty the siege of tournay the same year the landing of the english king at la hogue on his expedition in thirteen forty six the siege of calais the same year the battle of neville's cross the same year the sea fight with the spaniards off winchelsea thirteen fifty and the taking of the gisness thirteen fifty two it is from this last date that ritson somewhat unwarrantably assumes that all the poems were written in that year as they are very various in their form and manner it is more probable that they were produced as the occasions of them arose and therefore that they ought rather to be assigned to the interval between thirteen thirty three and thirteen fifty two they are remarkable if not for any poetical qualities of a high order yet for a precision and selectness as well as a force of expression previously so far as is known unexampled in english verse there is a true martial tone and spirit too in them which reminds us of the best of our old heroic ballads while it is better sustained and accompanied with more refinement of style than it usually is in these popular and anonymous compositions as a sample we will transcribe the one on edward's first expedition to france omitting a prologue which is in a different measure and modernizing the spelling where it does not affect the rhyme or rhythm edward our comely king in bra band has his warning with many comely knight and in that land truly to tell ordains he still for to dwell to time he think to fight now god that is of mighties mast grant him grace of the holy ghast his heritage to win and merry mutter of mercy free save our king and his many for our sorrow shame and sin thus in brabant has he been where he before was seldom seen for to prove their japes now no longer will he spare but unto france fast will he fare to comfort him with grapes forth he fared into france god save him from mischance and all his company the noble duke of brabant with him went into that land ready to live or die then the rich flower de lice won there for little price fast he fled for beard the right heir of that country is coming with all his knights free to shake him by the beard sir philip the valets with his men in those days to battle had he thought he bade his men them purvey without languor delay but he ne held it naught he brought folk full great one i seven against one that full well weaponed were but soon when he heard his cry that king edward was near thereby then durst he not come near in that morning fell a mist and when our englishmen it wist to change all their cheer our king unto god made his boon and god sent him good comfort soon the weeder wex full clear our king and his men held the field stalworthy with spear and shield and thought to win his right with lords and with knightes keen and other doughty men by deem that war full freck to fight when sir philip of france heard tell that king edward in field walled dwell then gained him no glee he traced it of no better boot both, both on horse and on foot he hastened him to flee it seemed he was feared for strokes when he did fell his great oaks about his pavilion abated was then all his pride for languor there durst he not bide his boast was brought all down the king of beam had cares cold that was full hardy and bold a steed to um stride he and the king alls of navern war fair feared in the fern their heavids for to hide and leave us well it is no lie and field hat la flee man gry that king edward was in with princes that were stiff and bold and dukes that were doughty told in battle to begin the princes that were rich on raw girt nakers strike and trumpets blaw and made mirth at their might both a blast and many a bow war ready railed upon a row and full freck for to fight gladly they gave meat and drink so that they sold the better swink the white men that there were sir philip of france fled for doubt and hide him home with all his rout coward god give him care for there then had the lily flower lorn all haley his an hour that so gat fled for feared 
bote our king edward come full still when that he trowed no harm him till and keeped him in the beard end of section twenty three section twenty four of a compendious history of english literature and of the english language volume one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org a compendious history of english literature and of the english language volume one by george lilly craik chapter three part six a literative verse piers plowman it may be observed that my nose verses are thickly sprinkled with what is called alliteration or the repetition of words having the same commencing letter either immediately after one another or with the intervention only of one or two other words generally unemphatic or of subordinate importance alliteration which we find here combined with rhyme was in an earlier stage of our poetry employed more systematically as the substitute for that decoration the recurrence at certain regular intervals of like beginnings serving the same purpose which is now accomplished by what milton has contemptuously called the jingling sound of like endings to the english of the period before the conquest until its very latest stage rhyme was unknown and down to the tenth century our verse appears to have been constructed wholly upon the principle of alliteration hence naturally even after we had borrowed the practice of rhyme from the french or romance writers our poetry retained for a time more or less of its original habit in Leomon, as we have seen alliterative and rhyming couplets are intermixed in other cases as in my know we have the rhyme only pretty liberally bespangled with alliteration at this date in fact the difficulty probably would have been to avoid alliteration in writing verse all the old customary phraseologies of poetry had been moulded upon that principle and indeed alliterative expression has in every age and in many other languages as well as our own had a charm for the popular ear so that it has always largely prevailed in proverbs and other such traditional forms of words nor is it yet by any means altogether discarded as an occasional embellishment of composition whether in verse or in prose but there is one poetical work of the fourteenth century of considerable extent and in some respects of remarkable merit in which the verse is without rhyme and the system of alliteration is almost as regular as what we have in the poetry of the times before the conquest this is the famous vision of piers plowman or as the subject is expressed at full length in the latin title visio viliel mi de petro plowman that is the vision of william concerning piers or peter plowman the manuscripts of this poem which long continued to enjoy a high popularity are very numerous and it has also been repeatedly printed first in fifteen fifty at london by robert crowley dwelling in eli rents in holborn who appears to have produced three successive impressions of it in the same year again in fifteen sixty one by owen rogers dwelling nearer unto great st bartholomew's gate at the singna of the spread eagle next in eighteen thirteen under the superintendence of the late thomas dunham whitaker doctor of literature lastly in eighteen forty two under the care of thomas wright esq m a f r s etc the early editions and also dr whitaker's are in quarto and in black letter mr wright's is in the common type and in the much more commodious form of two volumes duodecimo and furnished as it is with an introduction notes and a glossary all very carefully and learnedly compiled is as superior in all other respects as it is in cheapness and convenience for perusal 
to dr whitaker's costly and cumbrous publication whitaker moreover whose acquirements in this department of study were very slender has selected a text widely differing from the common one and which has evidently no claim to the preference with which he has honoured it that given by mr wright who has added in the notes the most important of the variations exhibited by dr whitaker's edition differs very little except in greater accuracy from that first printed by crowley while it is derived from what appears to be the best and oldest manuscript now in existence dr whitaker's notes and glossary are contemptible and his running paraphrase which accompanies the text will be found much more frequently to slur over when it does not mistake the obscure passages of the original than to explain or attempt to explain them of the author of piers plowman scarcely anything is known he has commonly been called robert langland but there are grounds for believing that his christian name was william and it is probable that it is himself of whom he speaks under that name throughout his work he is supposed to have been a monk and he seems to have resided in the west of england near the malvern hills where he introduces himself at the commencement of his poem as following asleep on a may morweninga and entering upon his dreams or visions the date may be pretty nearly fixed in one place there is an allusion to the treaty of bretigny made with france in thirteen sixty and to the military disasters of the previous year which led to it in another passage mention is made of a remarkable tempest which occurred on the fifteenth of january thirteen sixty two as of a recent event it is probable to quote mr wright that the poem of piers plowman was composed in the latter part of this year when the effects of the great wind were fresh in people's memory and when the treaty of bretigny had become a subject of popular discontent we may assume at least that it was in hand at this time we cannot attempt an analysis of the work it consists in mr wright's edition where the long line of the other editions is divided into two of fourteen thousand six hundred and ninety six verses distributed into twenty sections or passes as they are called each passes forms or professes to form a separate vision and so in artificial or confused is the connection of the several parts of the composition notwithstanding dr whitaker's notion that it had in his edition for the first time been shown that it was written after a regular and consistent plan that it may be regarded as being in reality not so much one poem as a succession of poems the general subject may be said to be the same with that of bunyan's pilgrim's progress the exposition of the impediments and temptations which beset the crusade of this our mortal life and the method too like bunyan's is the allegorical but the spirit of the poetry is not so much picturesque or even descriptive as satirical vices and abuses of all sorts come in for their share of the exposure and invective but the main attack throughout is directed against the corruptions of the church and the hypocrisy and worldliness the ignorance indolence and sensuality of the ecclesiastical order to this favourite theme the author constantly returns with new affection and sharper zest from any less high matter which he may occasionally take up hence it has been commonly assumed that he must have himself belonged to the ecclesiastical profession that he was probably a priest or monk and his vision has been regarded not only as mainly a religious poem but as almost a puritanical and protestant work although produced nearly two centuries before either protestantism or puritanism was ever heard of in this notion as we have seen it was brought into such repute at the time of the reformation that three editions of it were printed in one year there is nothing however of anti-romanism properly so called in langland either doctrinal or constitutional and even the anti-clerical spirit of his poetry is not more decided than what is found in the writings of chaucer and the other popular literature of the time in all ages indeed it is the tendency of popular literature to erect itself into a power adverse to that of the priesthood as has been evinced more especially by the poetical literature of modern europe from the days of the provencal troubadours 
in the canterbury tales however and in most other works where this spirit appears the puritanism if so it is to be called is merely one of the forms of the poetry in piers plowman the poetry is principally a form or expression of the puritanism the rhythm or measure of the verse in this poem must be considered as accentual rather than syllabical that is to say it depends rather upon the number of the accents than of the syllables this is perhaps the original principle of all verse and it still remains the leading principle in various kinds of verse both in our own and in other languages at first probably only the accented syllables were counted or reckoned of any rhythmical value other syllables upon which there was no emphasis went for nothing and might be introduced in any part of the verse one two or three at a time as the poet chose of course it would at all times be felt that there were limits beyond which this license could not be carried without destroying or injuring the metrical character of the composition but these limits would not at first be fixed as they now for the most part are the elementary form of the verse in piers plowman demands a succession of four accented syllables two in the first hemistich or short line and two in the second but while each of those in the first line is usually preceded by either one or two unaccented syllables commonly only one of those in the second line is so preceded the second line therefore is for the most part shorter than the first and they also differ in regard to the alliteration it being required that in the first both the accented or emphatic syllables which are generally initial syllables should begin with the same letter but that in the second only the first accented syllable should begin with that letter this is the general rule but either from the text being corrupt or from the irregularity of the composition the exceptions are very numerous we may merely add that although in our extracts we shall for the convenience of printing and for the greater intelligibility follow mr wright's edition as in other respects so in the bisection of the long line of the manuscripts and the other editions into two short ones only marking the structural distinction between the first and second which he does not we suspect that the true prosody requires these short lines to be regarded rather as hemistiches than as entire verses and sometimes only as false hemistiches that is to say that the correct prosodical division would be not in all cases where he has placed it but occasionally in the middle of the word with which he closes his first line but this is a matter of little moment we shall adopt the plan of modernizing the spelling in all cases in which there can be no doubt that the pronunciation is not thereby affected the poem begins as follows in a summer season when soft was the sun i shoot me into shrouds as i a sheep were in habit as an hermit unholy of workus went wide in this world wonders to hear ach on a may morwening on malvern hills me befell of fairly of fairy me thought i was weary for wandered and went me to rest under a brood bank by a burn's side and as i lay and leaned and looked on the waters i slumbered into a sleeping it swayed so murray then gan i metten a marvellous swebbin that i was in a wilderness wist i never where and as i beheld into the east on high to the sun i sake a tower on a top free licka he mocked a deep dale beneath a dungeon therein with deep ditches and dark and dreadful of sight a fair field full of folk found i there between of all manner of men the mean and the rich working and wandering as the world asketh some puttin them to the plough played in full cell in setting and sowing swanken full hard and wanen that wasters with gluttony destroyeth and some puttin hem to pride apparelled hem thereafter in countenance of clothing come and disguised in prayers and penances puttin hem many all for the love of our lord lived in full straight in hope to have after heaven rich bliss as anchors em hermits that hold in hem in her cells and covetin naught in country to carry in about for no liquorous lift flood her lickem to please and some chosen chaffer they shevetin the better as it seemeth to our sight that switch me thriveth and some mirths to make as minstrels con and gettin gold with her glee guiltless i leave ach joppers and jogglers judas children 
fain and hem fantasies and fools hem market and han her wit at will to work and if they wool that paul preacheth of hem i wall not cleave it here but qui loquitur tu per loquium is jupiter's hind bidders and beggars fast about ye with her bellies and her bags of bread full ye crammed fate and then for her food foughten at the ale and gluttony god wot go they to bed and risen with ribaudry though robert's knaves sleep and sorry sleweth sueth hem ever pilgrims and palmers plighten hem to get her for to seek him st james and saints at rome they went and forth in her way with many wise tales and hadn't leave to lean all her life after i sake some that sidon they had ye sought saints to each a tale that they told her tongue was tempered to lie more than to say sooth it seemed by her speech hermits on an heap with hooked staves went in to walsingham and her wenches after great lubies and long that loath were to swing clothed him in copes to be known from other and shoppen him hermits her ease to have i found their frères all the four orders preaching the people for profit of himself glosed the gospel as him good liked for covetous of copes construed it as they would many of these master frères now clothen him as liking for her money and her merchandise marching togetters for sith charity hath been chapman and chief to shrive lords many furleys han fallen in a few years but holy church and high hold better togetters the most mischief on mould is mounting well fast there preached a partner as he a priest were brought forth a bull with many bishops seals and said that himself might assoil in him all of false shed of fasting of a vows he broken lewd men leaved it well and liked his words coming up kneeling to kiss in his bowls he bouched hem with his brevet and bleared her iron and wrought with his ragman rings and brooches here it will be admitted we have both a well-filled canvas and a picture with a good deal of life and stir in it the satiric touches are also natural and effective and the expression clear easy and not deficient in vigour we will now present a portion of the fifth passus which commences thus the king and his knights to the kirk went to hear matins of the day and the mass after then waked i of my winking and woe was withal that i ne had slept sadder and e satan more ach here i had fairn a furlong fantise me hent that i ne might further afoot for a default of sleeping and sat softly adown and said my belief and so i babbled on my beads they brought me asleep and then saw i much more than i before of told for i saw the field full of folk that i before of said and our reason gan array in him all but ream to preach and with a cross before the king comes thus to teach him he prayed that these pestilences were for pure sin and the southwestern wind on saturday at even was pertlick for pure pride and for no point else peeries and plum trees were puffed to the earth and in sample that the segs shoulden do the better beeches and broad oaks were blown to the ground turned upward the her tails in tokening of dread that deadly sin ere doomsday shall fordone hem all the account of reason's sermon is continued at great length after which the repentance of his auditors is narrated as follows purnell proud heart plowed her to the earth and lay long ere she looked and lord mercy cried and by height to him that us all made she should and so in her sir and set there and hair to her phaeton her flesh that fierce was to sin envy with heavy heart asked after shrift and carefully may a culpa he comes to, to show he was as pale as a pellet in the palsy he seemed and clothed in a cowry mari a couth it naught describe in kirtle and court to pee and a knife by his side of a frere's frock were the four sleeves and as a leek that had e lay long in the sun so looked he with lean cheeks lowering foul his body was too bowlen for wrath that he boot his lips and ringing he yeed with the fust to reeken himself he thought with works or with words when he sick his time each a word that he warp was of a netter's tongue of chiding and of challenging was his chief lift load with backbiting and besmear and bearing a false witness i would been e shrive quo this shrew 
and i for shame durst i will be gladder by god that gib had mischanced than though i had this work e one away of essex cheese i have a neighbour by me i have annoyed him off and lowen on him to lords to doon him lease his silver and made his friends be his fame thorough my false tongue his grace and his good haps grieven me full sore between many and many i make debate off that both life and limb is lost through rue my speech and when i meet him in market that i most hate i hauls him handly as i his friend were for he is doughtier than i i dare do none other ah had i mastery and might god wot my will and when i come to the kirk and should kneel to the rood and pray for the people as the priest teacheth for pilgrims and for palmers for all the people after then i cry on my knees that christ give him sorrow that barren away my bowl and my broke sheep away for the otter then turn i mine eyen and behold ellen hath a new coat i wish then it were mine and all the web after and of men's leasing i laugh that liketh mine heart and for her winning i weep and wail the time and deem that they doom ill there i do well worse whoso under nimeth me hereof i hate him deadly after i would that each a white were my knave for whoso hath more than i that angereth me sore and thus i live loveless like a luther dog that all my body boldeneth for bitter of my gall i might not eat many years as a man ought for envy and evil will is evil to defy may no sugar nor sweet thing assuage my swelling nay nor dia penitium drive it fro mine heart ne neither shrift me shame but whoso shrape my maw yes readily quod repentance and rad him to the best sorrow of sins is salvation of souls i am sorry quod that sega i am but selled other and that maketh me thus meagre for i nay may me venge among burgesses have i be dwelling in london and gart backbiting be a broker to blame men's ware when he sold and i naught then was i ready to lie and to lower on my neighbour and to lack his chaffer i will amend this if i may through her might of god almighty the cases of wrath covetousness gluttony and sloth follow at equal or greater length and then comes the passage in which piers plowman is first mentioned the people having been persuaded by the exhortations of repentance and hope to set out in quest of truth a thousand of men though thrungen together cried upward to christ and to his clean mutter to have grace to go with them truth to seek ach there was white none so wise the way fitter coot but blustredin forth as beasts over banks and hills till late was and long that they a uh, lead met apparelled as a paynim in pilgrim's wise he bar a burden he bound with a broad list in a with wind wise he wound it about a bowl and a bag he bar by his side and hundred of amples on his hat set in signs of sinai and shells of galleys and many a crouch on his cloak and keys of rome and the vernacle before for men should know and see by his signs whom he sought had the folk framed him first fro whence he come from sinai he said and from our lord's sepulchre in bethlehem and in babylon i have been in both on armony and alessandra in many other places ye may see by my signs that smitten on mine hat that i have walked full wide in wheat and in dry and sought good saints for my soul's help no stow aught a core saint that men call true good stow aught wisen us the way where that why dwelleth nay so me god help said the gome then i sake never palmer with pike knee with scrip asked him after him ere till now in this place then the narrative goes on as printed and pointed by mr wright who has no note upon the passage peter quote a ploughman and put forth his head i know him as kindly as clerk doth his books conscience and kind wit kenned me to his place and didn't me shurn him sickerly to serve in him for ever both to sow and to set the while i swink might i have been his follower all this fifty winter both e sow and his sea and sued his beasts within and withouten waited his profit i dig and i delve i do that truth hotteth sometime i sow and sometime i thresh in tailor's craft and tinker's craft what truth can devise i weave and i wind and do what truth hotteth etc it is difficult to understand what meaning we are to give to the word peter understood as part of the ploughman's speech whitaker's interpretation is one peter a ploughman now put forth his head and in a note upon the passage which in his edition occurs in the eighth passes 
and stands peter quoth a ploughman he says as piers ploughman who now first appears is evidently the speaker we must notwithstanding the arrangement of the words understand them to mean quoth peter a ploughman but it is evident that this sense cannot be got out of the words as they stand the line is possibly corrupt and indeed the whole passage the one on which so much of the structure of the poem hinges exhibits other traces of having suffered from the carelessness or ignorance of the transcribers it differs widely throughout in the two editions but everything relating to the personage from whom the work takes its name would almost seem to be designedly involved in confusion and obscurity the ploughman ends his speech of which we have quoted the commencement by telling his auditors that if they wish to know where truth dwells he is ready to show them the way to his residence upon which proceeds the story ye leave peers quod these pilgrims and proffered him hire for to wend with him to truth's dwelling-place nay by my soul's help quod peers and gan for to swear i knowed fang a furthing for saint thomas shrine truth would love me the lass a long time thereafter ach if you will neff to wend well this is the way thither ye moten go thorough meekness both men and wives till ye come into conscience etc the personage who thus speaks as afterwards constantly designated peers or sometimes perkin the ploughman and he makes a considerable figure throughout the sixth and seventh passes after which we hear little more of him till we come to the sixteenth in the eighteenth passes the character of peers the ploughman according to mr wright's view introduction page twenty four is identified with that of the saviour whitaker who generally calls him the mysterious personage conceives introductory discourse page twenty eight that peers in the latter part of the poem is intended to be the representative of the church taking the church as meaning not the clergy or the ecclesiastical system but the body of the faithful it would not perhaps be impossible to understand peers as sustaining that character throughout the work piers ploughman's creed the popularity of langland's poem appears to have brought alliterative verse into fashion again even for poems of considerable length several romances were written in it such as that of william and the werewolf that of alexander that of jerusalem and others and the use of it was continued throughout the greater part of the fifteenth century but the most remarkable imitation of the vision is the poem entitled piers the ploughman's creed which appears to have been written about the end of the fourteenth century it was first printed separately at london in quarto by reynold wolf in fifteen fifty three then by rogers along with the vision in fifteen sixty one in modern times it has also been printed separately in eighteen fourteen as a companion to whitaker's edition of the vision and along with the vision in mr wright's edition of eighteen forty two the creed is the composition of a follower of wycliffe and an avowed opponent of romanism here mr wright observes piers ploughman is no longer an allegorical personage he is the simple representative of the peasant rising up to judge and act for himself the english sans culotte of the fourteenth century if we may be allowed the comparison the satire or invective in this effusion which consists only of one thousand six hundred and ninety seven short lines is directed altogether against the clergy and especially the monks or friars and peers or peter is represented as a poor ploughman from whom the writer receives that instruction in christian truth which he had sought for in vain from every order of these licensed teachers the language is quite as antique as that of the vision as may appear from the following passage in which piers is introduced then turned i me forth and talked to myself of the falsehood of this folk how faithless they were and, and as i went by the way weeping for sorrow i see a seely man me by upon the plough hongen his coat was of a clout that carry was he called his hood was full of holes and his hair out with his knops shoon clouded full thick his ton totened and out as he the lond treaded his hosen overhung and his hock shines on everich aside all beslammered in fen as he the plough followed tway mittens as meter made all of clouts the fingers wern for weird and full of fen hanged this wit wussled in the fiend almost to the ankle for wathering him beforn that feeble were worthy men might reckon each a rib so rentful they were in his wife walked with him with a long goat in a cutted coat cutted full high wrapped in a winnow sheet to wear in her fro weeders barefoot on the bare ice that the blood followed and at the lawn's end laughed a little crom bowl and thereon lay a little child lapped in clouts and twain of twey years old up in another side and all they song in a song that sorrow was to hearin they cried in all a cry a careful note 
the sealy man sighed sore and said children beth still this man looked upon me and leaped the plough stander and said sealy man why sighest thou so hard gift thee lack life load lean thee ick will switch good as god hath sent go we leave brother a literative verse the most ancient form of our poetry would seem to have been revived and brought into fashion or favour again for a time after having been long disused by its successful employment in the visions of piers plowman and the popularity of that work both wharton in his history and percy in an essay published in the second volume of his reliques have noticed several other alliterative poems in addition to the creed which although not all strictly speaking to be regarded as imitations of langland's performance probably owed their existence mainly to the example he had set in some of them the alliteration is carried much further than in the visions the jingle or joggle or of like beginnings as milton might have called it being introduced not according to a rule only in certain places of the verse but apparently to the utmost extent that the writer found possible by availing himself of all the resources of his vocabulary here for instance is the commencing stanza of a hymn to the virgin given by wharton hail be o yow marie mooder and may milda amica amerciable hail bullock fruit of soft fast fay again ook strife stood fast and stable hail soft fast soul in ucha say undur the sun is none so able hail laga that er lord in lay the foremast that never was found in fable hail trua truthful and treacherable hail chief i chosen of chastity hail homely henda and amiable to pray for us to thy son so free end of section twenty four section twenty five of a compendious history of english literature and of the english language volume one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org a compendious history of english literature and of the english language volume one by george lilly craik chapter four part one third english mixed or compound english geoffrey chaucer part one the vision of piers plowman is our earliest poetical work of any considerable extent that may still be read with pleasure but not much of its attraction lies in its poetry it interests us chiefly as rather a lively picture which however would have been nearly as effective in prose of much in the manners and general social condition of the time and of the new spirit of opposition to old things which was then astir partly too by the language and style and as a monument of a peculiar species of versification langland or whoever was the author probably contributed by this great work to the advancement of his native tongue to a larger extent than he has had credit for the grammatical forms of his english will be found to be very nearly if not exactly the same with those of chaucer's his vocabulary if more sparingly admitting the non teutonic element still does not abjure the principle of the same composite constitution nor is his style much inferior in mere regularity and clearness so long a work it was not likely to have been undertaken except by one who felt himself to be in full possession of the language as it existed the writer was no doubt prompted to engage in such a task in great part by his gift of ready expression and he could not fail to gain additional fluency and skill in the course of the composition especially with a construction of verse demanding so incessant an attention to words and syllables the popularity of the poem too would diffuse and establish whatever improvements in the language it may have introduced or exemplified in addition to the ability displayed in it and the popular spirit of the day with which it was animated its position in the national literature naturally and deservedly gave to the vision of piers plowman an extraordinary influence for it has the distinction 
so far as is either known or probable of being the earliest original work of any magnitude in the present form of the language robert of gloucester and robert de brun langland's predecessors were both it may be remembered only translators or paraphrasts if langland however is our earliest original writer chaucer is still our first great poet and the true father of our literature properly so called compared with his productions all that precedes is barbarism but what is much more remarkable is that very little of what has followed in the space of nearly five centuries that has elapsed since he lived and wrote is worthy of being compared with what he has left us he is in our english poetry almost what homer is in that of greece and dante in that of italy at least in his own sphere still the greatest light although therefore according to the scheme of the history of the language which has been propounded the third form of it or that which still subsists may be regarded as having taken its commencement perhaps a full century before the date at which we are now arrived and so is taking in the works not only of langland but of his predecessors from robert of gloucester inclusive our living english literature may be most fitly held to begin with the poetry of chaucer it will thus count an existence already of above five centuries chaucer is supposed to have been born about the beginning of the reign of edward the third in the year thirteen twenty eight if we may trust what is said to have been the ancient inscription on his tombstone so that he had no doubt begun to write and was probably well known as a poet at least as early as langland they may indeed have been contemporaries in the strictest sense of the word for anything that is ascertained if langland wrote the creed of piers ploughman as well as the vision which although it has not we believe been suggested is neither impossible nor very unlikely he must have lived to as late or very nearly as late a date as chaucer who is held to have died in fourteen hundred at the same time as langland's greatest if not only work appears to have been produced not long after the middle of the reign of edward the third and the composition of chaucer's canterbury tales not to have been begun till about the middle of that of richard the second the probability certainly is regard being had to the species and character of these poems each seemingly impressed with a long experience of life that langland if not the earlier writer was the elder man the writings of chaucer are very voluminous comprising in so far as they have come down to us in verse the canterbury tales the roman of the rose in seven thousand seven hundred and one lines a translation from the french roman de la rose of guillaume de lory and jean de Mans, troilus and Criseida in five books on the same subject as the philostrato of boccaccio the house of fame in three books chaucer's dream in two thousand two hundred and thirty five lines the book of the duchess sometimes called the dream of chaucer one thousand three hundred and thirty four lines the assembly of fowls six hundred and ninety four lines the flower and the leaf five hundred and ninety five lines the court of love one thousand four hundred and forty two lines together with many ballads and other minor pieces and in prose besides portions of the canterbury tales a translation of boethius's de consolatione philosophiae the testament of love an imitation of the same treatise and a treatise on the astrolabe addressed to his son lewis in thirteen ninety one of which however we have only two out of five parts of which it was intended to consist all these works have been printed most of them more than once and a good many other pieces have also been attributed to chaucer which are either known to be the compositions of other poets or of which at least there is no evidence or probability that he is the author only the canterbury tales however have as yet enjoyed the advantage of anything like careful editing Turwitt's elaborate edition was first published in four volumes octavo in seventeen seventy five his glossary to all the genuine works of chaucer having followed in seventeen seventy eight and another edition presenting a new text and also accompanied with notes and a glossary was brought out by mr t wright for the percy society in eighteen forty seven in his introductory essay on the language and versification of chaucer turwitt observes that at the time when this great writer made his first essays the use of rhyme was established in english poetry not exclusively as we have seen by the example of the vision of piers plowman but very generally so that in this respect he had little to do but to imitate his predecessors 
but the metrical part of our poetry the learned editor conceives was capable of more improvement by the polishing of the measures already in use as well as by the introduction of new modes of versification with respect he continues to the regular measures then in use they may be reduced i think to four first the long iambic meter consisting of not more than fifteen nor less than fourteen syllables and broken by a caesura at the eighth syllable secondly the alexandrine meter consisting of not more than thirteen syllables nor less than twelve with a caesura at the sixth thirdly the octosyllable meter which was in reality the ancient demeter iambic fourthly the stanza of six verses of which the first second fourth and fifth were in the complete octosyllable meter and the third and last catalectic that is wanting a syllable or even two the first of these meters Turwick considers to be exemplified in the ormulum and probably also in the chronicle of robert of gloucester if the genuine text could be recovered the second apparently by robert de brune in imitation of his french original although his verse in hearn's edition is frequently defective the third and fourth were very common being then generally used in lighter compositions as they still are in the first of these meters he proceeds it does not appear that chaucer ever composed at all for i presume no one can imagine that he was the author of gamelin or in the second and in the fourth we have nothing of his but the rhyme of sir topus which being intended to ridicule the vulgar romancer seems to have been purposely written in their favourite metre in the third or octosyllable metre he has left several compositions particularly an imperfect translation of the roman de la rose which was probably one of his earliest performances the house of fame the death of the duchess blanche and a poem called his dream upon all which it would be sufficient here to observe in general that if he had given no other proofs of his poetical faculty these alone must have secured to him the preeminence above all his predecessors and contemporaries in point of versification but by far the most considerable part of chaucer's works is written in that kind of metre which we now call the heroic either in distiches or stanzas and as i have not been able to discover any instance of this metre being used by any english poet before him i am much inclined to suppose that he was the first introducer of it into our language it had been long practised by the writers both in the northern and southern french and within the half century before chaucer wrote it had been successfully cultivated in preference to every other metre by the great poets of italy dante petrarch and boccaccio turwitt argues therefore that chaucer may have borrowed his new english verse either from the french or from the italian that the particular species of verse in which chaucer has written his canterbury tales and some of his other poems had not been used by any other english poet before him has not we believe been disputed and does not appear to be disputable at least from such remains of our early poetical literature as we now possess here then is one important fact it is certain also that the french if not likewise the italian poets who employed the decasyllabic or more properly hendecasyllabic metre were well known to chaucer the presumption therefore that his new metre is as turbot asserts the same italian or french metre of ten or eleven syllables our present heroic verse becomes very strong moreover if chaucer's verse be not constructed upon the principle of syllabical as well as accentual regularity when was this principle which is now the law and universal practice of our poetry introduced it will not be denied to have been completely established ever since the language acquired in all material respects its present form and pronunciation that is to say at least since the middle of the sixteenth century if it was not by chaucer at the end of the fourteenth by whom among his followers in the course of the next hundred and fifty years was it first exemplified at present it is sufficient to say that no one of his successors throughout this space has hinted that any improvement any change had been made in the construction of english verse since chaucer wrote on the contrary he is generally recognized by them as the great reformer of our language and our poetry and as their master and instructor in their common art by his friend and disciple Ocleve, he is called the first finder of our fair language so lydgate in the next generation celebrates him as his master as chief poet of britain as he that was of making sovereign whom all this land of right ought prefer sith of our language he was the loadster and as the noble rector poet of Bretagne, that worthy was the lord to have of potria and the palm attain that made first to distil and rain the gold-dewed drops of speech and eloquence into our tongue through 
his excellence and found the flowers first of rhetoric a rude speech only to illumine etc a later writer gawain douglas sounds his praise as venerable chaucer principal poet but peer heavenly trumpet or lege and regulier in eloquence balm condict and dial milky fountain clear strand and rose real in a strain it must be confessed more remarkable for enthusiastic vehemence than for poetical inspiration the learned and at the same time elegant leland in the next age describes him as the writer to whom the his country's tongue owes all its beauties anglia chaucerum veneratur nostra poetam cui veneris debit patria lingua suis and again in another tribute as having first reduced the language into regular form linguam qui patriam redegit elam in formam and such seems to have been the unbroken tradition down to spenser who looking back through two centuries hails his great predecessor as still the well of english undefiled if now we proceed to examine chaucer's verse do we find it actually characterized by this regularity which indisputably has at least from within a century and a half of his time been the law of our poetry not if we assume that the english of chaucer's time was read in all respects precisely like that of our own day but are we warranted in assuming this we know that some changes have taken place in the national pronunciation within a much shorter space the accentuation of many words is different even in shakespeare and his contemporaries from what it now is even since the language has been what we may call settled and the process of growth in it nearly stopped there has still been observable a disposition in the accent or syllabic emphasis to project itself with more precipitation than formerly to seize upon a more early enunciated part in the syllables and other polysyllabic words than that to which it was wont to be attached for example we now always pronounce the word aspect with the accent on the first syllable in the time of shakespeare it was always accented on the last we now call a certain short composition an essay but only a century ago it was called an essay and write next winter says pope more essays on man probably at an earlier period when this change was going on more actively it was part of that general process by which the teutonic or native element in our language eventually after a long struggle acquired the ascendancy over the french element and if so for a time the accentuation of many words would be unfixed or would oscillate between the two systems the french habit of reserving itself for the final syllable and the native tendency to cling to a prior portion of the word this appears to have been the case in chaucer's day many words are manifestly in his poetry accented differently from what they are now as is proved upon either theory of his placidity when they occur at the end of a verse and in many also he seems to vary the accent pronouncing for instance language in one line language in another as suits his convenience but again under the tendency to elision and abbreviation which is common to all languages in a state of growth there can be no doubt that in the progress of the english tongue from its first subjection to literary cultivation in the middle of the thirteenth century to its final settlement in the middle of the seventeenth it dropped and lost altogether many short or unaccented syllables some of these indeed our poets still assert their right to revive in pressing circumstances thus though we now almost universally elide or suppress the e before the terminating d of the preterites and past participles of our verbs it is still sometimes called into life again to make a distinct syllable in verse two centuries ago when perhaps it was generally heard in the common speech of the people as it still is in some of our provincial dialects and when its suppression in reading prose would probably have been accounted an irregularity it was as often sounded in verse as not and the license was probably considered to be taken when it was elided the elision when it took place was generally marked by the omission of the vowel in the spelling if we go back another century we find the pronunciation of the termination as a distinct syllable to be clearly the rule and the prevailing practice and the suppression of the vowel to be the rare exception but even at so late a date as the end of the sixteenth and the beginning of the seventeenth century other short vowels as well as this were still occasionally pronounced as they were almost always written 
both the genitive or possessive singular and the nominative plural of nouns were down to this time made by the addition not of s only as now but of es to the nominative singular and the es makes a distinct syllable sometimes in shakespeare and often in spencer in chaucer therefore it is only what we should expect that it should generally be so pronounced it is evident that originally or when it first appeared in the language it always was and that the practice of running it and the preceding syllable together as we now do has only been gradually introduced and established up to this point to wit's theory of chaucer's versification may be said to be admitted on all hands it is allowed that in reading chaucer's verses we should generally sound as distinct syllables the ed at the end of verbs and the es when it is the plural or possessive termination of a noun and also that we must give many words a different accentuation from what they now possess but this is not enough to make the verse in all cases syllabically regular the deficiencies of chaucer's metres to wit contends are to be chiefly supplied by the pronunciation of what he calls the e feminine by which he means the e which still terminates so many of our words but is now either totally silent and ineffective in that pronunciation or only lengthens or otherwise alters the sound of the preceding syllable in either case is entirely inoperative upon the syllabication thus such words as large strange time etc he conceives to be often dissyllables and such words as romaine sentence often trisyllables in chaucer some words also he holds to be lengthened a syllable by the intervention of such an e now omitted both in speaking and writing in the middle as in judgment commandment vouchsafe etc wallace the distinguished mathematician in his grammar of the english language written in latin and published about the middle of the seventeenth century had suggested that the origin of this silent e probably was that it had originally been pronounced though somewhat obscurely as a distinct syllable like the french e feminine which still counts for such in the prosody of that language wallace adds that the surest proof of this is to be found in our old poets with whom the said e sometimes makes a syllable sometimes not as the verse requires with respect to words imported directly from france observes Turwit, it is certainly quite natural to suppose that for some time they retained their native pronunciation we have not indeed he continues so clear a proof of the original pronunciation of the saxon part of our language but we know from general observation that all changes of pronunciation are generally made by small degrees and therefore when we find that a great number of those words which in chaucer's time ended in e originally ended in a we may reasonably presume that our ancestors first passed from the broader sound of a to the thinner sound of e feminine and not at once from a to e mute besides if the final e in such words was not pronounced why was it added from the time that it has confessedly ceased to be pronounced it has been gradually omitted in them except where it may be supposed of use to lengthen or soften the preceding syllable as in hope name etc but according to the ancient orthography it terminates many words of saxon original where it cannot have been added for any such purpose as heart child old wild etc in these therefore we must suppose that it was pronounced as e feminine and made part of a second syllable and so by a parity of reason in all others in which as in these it appears to have been substituted for the saxon a from all this Turwit concludes that the pronunciation of the e feminine is founded on the very nature of both the french and saxon parts of our language and therefore that what is generally considered as an e mute either at the end or in the middle of words was anciently pronounced but obscurely like the e feminine of the french in a note referring to an opinion expressed by wallace observing that the french very often suppress the shorty in their common speech was led to think that the pronunciation of it would perhaps shortly be in all cases disused among them as among ourselves he adds the prediction has certainly failed but notwithstanding i will venture to say that when it was made it was not unworthy of wallace's sagacity unluckily for its success a number of eminent writers happened at that very time to be growing up in france whose works having since been received as standards of style must probably fix for many centuries the ancient usage of the e feminine in poetry and of course give a considerable check to the natural progress of the language if the age of edward the third had been as favourable to letters as that of louis the fourteenth if chaucer and his contemporary poets had acquired the same authority here that cognier moliere racine and boileau have obtained in france if their works had been published by themselves and perpetuated in a genuine state by printing i think it probable that the e feminine would still have preserved its place in our poetical language at least and certainly without any prejudice to the smoothness of our versification 
in supporting his views by these reasons Tyrwhit avoids having recourse to any arguments that might be drawn from the practice of chaucer himself that being in fact the matter in dispute but his main proposition to the extent at least of the alleged capacity of the now silent final e to make the, a distinct syllable in chaucer's day appears to be demonstrated by some instances in the poet's works thus for example in the following couplet from the prologue of the canterbury tales unless the word rome which ends in the, the first line be pronounced as a dissyllable there would be no rhyme that straight was comin from the court of romey full loud he sang come hither love to me so again in the canon yeoman's tale we have the following lines and when this alka mr saw as timey riseth up sir priest quod he and standeth by me in the first of which time must evidently in like manner be read as a word of two syllables the same rhyme occurs in a quatrain in the second book of the troilus and cressida all easily now for the love of marty quod pandarus for every thing hath timey so long abide till that the night departy for all so sicker as thou liest here by me finding rome and time to be clearly dissyllables in these passages it would seem that we ought as turbot remarks note on prologue to canterbury tales six seventy four to have no scruple so to pronounce them and other similar words wherever the metre requires it such is the outline of turbot's theory which it must be admitted is at least extremely plausible and which was long universally assented to of late however it has been attacked from several quarters and on various grounds the question is one which is of fundamental and central importance in the history of our language and literature and which therefore may not unprofitably detain us for a few pages more the first person we believe who intimated a distinct dissent from turbot's conclusions was the late dr nott in an elaborate dissertation on the state of english poetry before the sixteenth century prefixed to his edition of the works of the earl of surrey quarto london eighteen fifteen dr nott's object is to prove that the present system of versification the principle of which is syllabical as well as accentual regularity was the invention of surrey in the middle of the sixteenth century and that down to that date our verses of every kind were all what he is pleased to call rhythmical and not metrical that is as he explains the expression they did not consist as our verses do at present of a certain number of feet each foot of two syllables but they were constructed so as to be recited with a certain rhythmical cadence for which reason they seem to have been called verses of cadence dissertation page one hundred and fifty one this nomenclature at least is unfortunate the phrase verse of cadence is legates but whatever may be its import it certainly was not the only kind of verse known in chaucer's time for in his house of fame two one fifteen chaucer himself is described in an address to him by the eagle as having long been given to apply his wit to make books songs and ditties in rhyme or ellis in cadence it is remarkable that this passage so clearly implying as it would seem that besides verse of cadence chaucer was acquainted with a different sort of verse which he distinguishes by the name of rhyme should have escaped the attention of dr nott or should not be anywhere noticed by him further it appears from a passage in the troilus and cressida verse one thousand seven hundred and ninety six which the learned editor does quote dissertation one hundred and sixty three that chaucer himself considered his verse in that work to be metrical it is where after having thus gracefully dismissed his finished work go little book go little tragedy there god my maker yet ere that i dee so send me might to make some comedy but little book make thou thee none and thee but subject been unto all poesy and kiss the steps whereas thou seest pacey a virgil ovid homer lucan stacy he proceeds in the next stanza to express his earnest hope that transcribers and reciters may be withheld from violating his metre and for there is so great diversity in english and in writing of our tongue so pray i to god that none miswrite of thee ne midi mis mitra for default of tongue these passages may not be absolutely irreconcilable with the position that chaucer's verse was not constructed upon the principle of syllabical regularity but they show that dr nott has not been happy in the selection of his epithets when he affirms that the only kinds of verse known in chaucer's time were all of verses of cadence 
and all not metrical to speak as he does of the feet of our present verses as all consisting each of two syllables is another obvious error of expression dr knott maintains that chaucer's supposed employment of the final and now silent e as a distinct syllable could not have been derived from the similar use of the e feminine in french poetry but he satisfies himself with a mere expression of his conviction on this point it remains he says yet to be proved that the use of the e feminine such as is here contended for was then established in french poetry it seems clear to me that it was not nor do i doubt but that every one will arrive at the same conclusion who will give himself the trouble to examine dispassionately the early french poets and particularly the manuscript copies of their works it is probable that french verse was anciently written with less regularity than it afterwards acquired and in the earlier poets of that language therefore the prosodical use of what is called the e feminine may both seem and be somewhat capricious but it is a startling assumption that such use is altogether a modern invention upon this supposition it behooved dr not to point out when and by whom so extraordinary an innovation was introduced it is strange he should not have perceived that his notion attributes to some comparatively recent french poet the very same thing which he properly objects to is unlikely to have happened in the case of chaucer that in his own words if chaucer really did employ the e feminine in his versification in the manner supposed it must have been a contrivance purely of his own invention a supposition this he adds which i apprehend few will be disposed to maintain dissertation page one hundred and forty three but the supposition in question is one which nobody has ever advanced with regard to chaucer it appears to me incredible says dr not a few sentences before that chaucer who was remarkable for his common sense and practical view of things meaning to form a standard style in language should begin by introducing a novel mode of pronunciation which being contrary to common usage could not be generally adopted this is an absurdity of the learned editor's own making Turwitt does not imagine that chaucer introduced any novel mode of pronunciation he conceives that the pronunciation of the language found according to his view in chaucer's poetry was the common pronunciation of the time if the poetry of chaucer is to be so read so undoubtedly is that also of langland and minot and de brun and robert of gloucester and all our other early english poetry what chaucer introduced and borrowed from the poetry of france or italy if he introduced or thence borrowed anything was not the occasional pronunciation of the final e as a distinct syllable but the general principle of metrical regularity to which he adapted this and all the other points of the ancient and established national mode of speech what particular advantage could he have gained by merely multiplying in this or in any other way the number of syllables in the language it is an odd notion for dr not to take up that chaucer's only object in his supposed reformation of our verse was to contrive some ready way of, of always spinning out his line into ten or eleven syllables a method of reducing it within those dimensions would have been found equally convenient if he had ever thought of resorting to any such unheard of and absurd devices but it is not necessary for the refutation of the claim set up by dr knott in favour of the earl of surrey that we should suppose chaucer to have made any change whatever in the principles of english versification if it be only admitted that his verses are constructed upon the principle of syllabical regularity it does not matter for this question whether those of his predecessors are so or not his versification may surpass those only by this common principle being applied by him with more care skill and success than it was by them he may have made no innovation in the structure of our verse whatever and barred nothing from the poets of france or italy except only their superior correctness and elegance End of section twenty five section twenty six of a compendious history of english literature and of the english language volume one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org a compendious history of english literature and of the english language volume one by george lily craik chapter four part two the only one of dr knott's arguments which has much or indeed any apparent force is that which he draws from the manner in which all our early poetry that of chaucer included is stated to be written in the ancient manuscripts in all those manuscripts he says the caesura in the middle and the pause at the end of the line are pointed out with a precision that leaves no room for conjecture 
the points or marks made use of have no reference whatever to punctuation they never occur but at the place of caesura in the middle of the line or at the pause at the end of it and are often made with red paint the better to catch the eye when the mark of caesura is omitted an interval is generally left in the middle of the line between the two hemistitches the second hemistitch frequently begins with a capital though the introduction of a capital there instead of assisting often confuses the sense dissertation page one hundred and fifty two an impartial consideration of the subject he afterwards observes and a reference to good manuscripts must i think lead us to conclude that chaucer had not a metrical system of numbers in contemplation but that on the contrary he designed his verses to be read like those of all his contemporaries with a caesura and with rhythmical cadence Eden, page one hundred and fifty nine again speaking particularly of the manuscripts of chaucer's poems he says in these manuscripts either the caesura or the pause at the end of the line and sometimes both the pause and the caesura are almost always noted and that in so careful a manner as makes it questionable whether there be any manuscript of good date and authority in which one or both of them is not noted either by a point or a virgule though the virgule or point may in some instances have been obliterated why this particularity which must have been designed to answer some practical purpose should not have been noticed by the several editors of chaucer's works i am at a loss to say the omission is the more remarkable as it could not have escaped observation that all the manuscripts agree in fixing the caesura in every line with hardly any variation at the same place this is another evident mark of design amounting to little less than proof that chaucer not only meant his verses to be rhythmical but did all he could to settle what their rhythm should be Edem, page one hundred and sixty three finally he remarks on the subject of the caesura its use and the object proposed by it is confirmed by the appearance of the early printed editions of chaucer's works in the editions subsequent to fifteen thirty two the caesura is almost entirely disused if it was retained it seems to have been retained by accident the reason is obvious our english versification had then become metrical the caesura was therefore no longer wanted for general purposes it was consequently omitted though strictly speaking in some works it ought to have been retained but in the editions previous to fifteen thirty two the case was different the rhythmical cadence was then still in use and therefore the division of the hemistitch was still to be continued Edem, page one hundred and sixty nine surrey's poems were first printed in fifteen fifty seven but there were editions of chaucer in fifteen forty two fifteen forty six and fifteen fifty five which must be understood according to this statement to be all without the caesura would it not appear then that metrical verse upon dr knott's own showing had been introduced from fifteen to twenty-five years before surrey's poems were given to the world it is true they were written some years before for surrey was put to death in january fifteen forty seven but they can hardly have been supposed to have been already so widely diffused in manuscript as to have revolutionized the national versification when the chaucer of fifteen forty two the first edition without the caesura was published surrey according to the common account was not more than twenty-three or twenty-four years old even dr knott does not pretend that he was more than twenty-six what dr knott calls the pause at the end of the line seems to have nothing to do with the question he raises in regard to the nature of chaucer's versification of course it is admitted upon either and must be admitted upon any system that a line is such an integral section as may be properly separated by a point or other divisional mark if it be thought necessary as poetry is now written nothing of the kind is required the limits of the line or verse cannot be more distinctly indicated than they are by each being kept standing by itself and it is not easy to see what practical purpose could be contemplated by retaining the points at the end of the line after this method was introduced probably it was merely a retention from habit of a usage to which transcribers 
and readers had become accustomed and which was no doubt very serviceable while verse was written continuously like prose as it generally or always was in the earliest era of our language we may therefore put aside altogether so much of the above statement as refers to this final point or pause let us see then how the fact stands as to the other and only important mark that of the seizure as dr knott calls it in the middle of each verse he sets out by telling us that both the seizure in the middle and the pause at the end of the line are always pointed out with perfect precision but this broad assertion is very far from being adhered to when he comes to specify particulars the next form in which we have the statement is that when the mark of caesura is omitted an interval is generally left in the middle of the line then in still more qualified phrase we are informed that in the manuscripts of chaucer's poetry either the caesura or the pause at the end of the line and sometimes both are almost always noted he persists however in maintaining the careful manner in which this notation of the pause or pauses has been attended to in all good manuscripts although he admits that the virgule or point may in some instances have been obliterated and he affirms as we have seen though not very consistently with his previous admission of its being only in some manuscripts that the caesura is noted at all that all the manuscripts of chaucer agree in fixing the caesura in every line with hardly any variation at the same place let us now turn to his examples one will suffice to show how far his statements are borne out even in their most limited form the first seven lines of the canterbury tales are professed to be given from three different manuscripts of one of these the lansdowne manuscript nine o seven the account given is that in this passage the caesura or middle pause is not marked at all either by point or virgule but that elsewhere we have the lines cut not uniformly into two portions by a single virgule but sometimes into two sometimes into three sometimes into four portions by a succession of such strokes this is a phenomenon of which dr knott's theory seems to take no account all he has to say in regard to it is that the frequent recurrence of the virgule may be suspected to be intended to mark some rules in recitation with which we now are unacquainted the two other manuscripts harleian manuscript seventeen fifty eight and seventy three thirty three as here quoted differ as to the place of the middle pause in the very first line and in three of the remaining six lines where the one has only a point the other has both a point and a virgule in a fourth verse only a virgule and in a fifth a point followed by a capital letter but it is hard to say what dependence can be safely placed even upon this apparent amount of agreement it so happens that the same passage has been printed from the same two manuscripts by mr guest in his history of english rhythms two volumes octavo london eighteen thirty eight volume one page two hundred and fifteen and the variations between his transcripts and those of dr knott are not a little startling dr knott evidently did not intend to preserve the old spelling although for the object he had here in view that would have been almost necessary but some of the liberties he appears to have taken go far beyond the reformation of the antique verse in that particular in his extract from the manuscript seventeen fifty eight which extends to eight verses in the first line he might perhaps defend his change of wit into with and of swote for sweet into sutta in the third line vain instead of vena or vain is probably a typographical erratum in the fourth the substitution of where to for virtue though not very intelligible and indeed the very reverse of what might have been expected is still not a very wide deviation but the printing of had for hath in the second line is an instance of unpardonable inattention and to transform the eighth line from into the ram his half course rana as it stands in mr guest's transcript into hath in the ram his half course iran is proceeding to so great a length as to destroy all reliance upon such a mode of pretending to exhibit the testimony of ancient manuscripts or upon any conclusions so supported 
but the discrepancies between the two transcripts of the other manuscript bear more upon the question of the middle pause or caesura for according to mr guest's exhibition of this text there is in three of the seven lines the first second and sixth actually no mark of any such pause at all mr guest states that in this manuscript the pause when inserted is often nothing more than a mere scratch of the pen and so far from regarding either manuscript as a good one or as carefully written in regard to the divisional point he describes the occasional omission or misplacing of the dot as perfectly in keeping with the general inaccuracy of both his extract extends to eighteen lines and in regard to eight of the ten not already examined we are enabled to compare the two harleian manuscripts with another then belonging to the marquis of stafford of which a transcript to that extent is given by dr knott passing over other differences we find that in the harleian manuscript seventy three thirty three the middle pause is wanting altogether in the second fourth and eighth that it is also wanting in the third of the stafford manuscript and that in the fifth it is placed differently in all the three manuscripts it is also wanting in the ninth line in the harleian manuscript seventeen fifty eight it seems plain that of such confusion and uncertainty as this little or nothing can be made and that any attempt to exhibit in printing chaucer's poetry the caesura or middle pause in each verse as noted in the manuscripts would be impracticable even if it were ever so important but is this caesural mark in fact of any importance in determining the nature of chaucer's versification mr guest holds as well as dr knott that each line in chaucer consists properly of two parts which the caesural mark was designed to indicate still as it seems to me he observes after describing the irregularity with which this mark is introduced in the manuscripts we can only come to one conclusion in examining these manuscripts namely that each verse was looked upon as made up of two sections precisely in the same way as the alliterative couplet of the anglo-saxons yet mr guest finds no difficulty in reconciling with the principles of syllabical rhythm this fact of the division of each verse by the sejural mark which dr knott regards as demonstrative of the rhythm being not syllabical but only accentual nor is there in truth anything in the caesura to decide the matter either one way or the other the middle pause as found in the manuscripts of chaucer appears to be as consistent with the syllabical as with the merely accentual scanning of the verse if the right text be followed for example in printing the first eighteen lines of the canterbury tales with accentual marks to show in what manner the verse was as he apprehends recited dr knott gives the first line thus when that april with his showers sota marking the three syllables when with and shower as long the last syllable of april and the word sota with a grave accent and the syllables that is an s of surest as short the first syllable of april being left without any mark it is not very clear what all the parts of this apparatus of notation are intended to mean but certainly however the words so set down may be meant to be read or sung they are not reducible to the regular metre of our modern heroic verse it is by no means either certain or probable however that when is chaucer's word the reading adopted by terwitt is wana which he regards as a disyllable and he has as good a right to select that form which occurs in some of the manuscripts as dr knott has to select the monosyllabic form win or wan from other manuscripts for the purpose of his theory the next five lines are every one of them even as printed by dr knott of perfect metrical regularity the caesura is also where it should be upon either system the only thing that interferes with their being read like any modern english heroic verse is dr knott's own notation of their supposed temporal and essential character all that is wanting to make the seventh line a correct modern verse is to be read younger in two syllables with terwitt instead of young with not 
there being manuscript authority for both forms the eighth line dr not prince hath in the ram hath his course run we doubt whether there be any authority for this form of the verse but at any rate terwitt's form hath in the ram his halfa cursirana where halfa is a dissyllable is supported by the harleian manuscript seventy three thirty three in the ninth line not obtains his text by changing the dissyllabic smala of both the harleian manuscripts into the modern monosyllable small the next three lines are equally regular upon either system the thirteenth line will scan metrically even as given by not provided we reckon strange a dissyllable but we do not know where he has got his text it does not agree with either of the harleian manuscripts and does little with the stafford manuscript as exhibited by himself in another page the last five lines again are regular upon both systems upon the whole it does not appear that the caesural mark of the manuscripts can be regarded as indicating or proving at the most anything more than that by the rule of the verse the place where it fell should always be at the termination and never in the middle of a word a rule which is also generally though not always observed in our modern prosody as far as can be ascertained the two parts into which when it is employed it divides each of chaucer's lines are as much the hemistitches of what dr not calls a metrical as of what he calls a merely rhythmical verse we do not understand what notion of the harmony of english verse can have led dr not to quote the following line from the canterbury tales in her is high beauty withouten pride as one which unless read rhythmically as he calls it has no principle of harmony at all even if we read beauty with the accent on the last syllable it is in fact a perfectly correct heroic verse according to the strictest laws of our modern prosody yet he asserts that if chaucer had followed that prosody he would unquestionably have written the verse inner high beauty is withouten pride thus making it a perfect iambic decasyllabic line by the transposition of a single word let the reader who has any feeling of chaucer's direct natural manly diction or even of the most common proprieties of speech decide yet upon this single instance dr not lays it down that a large proportion of chaucer's verses cannot be read metrically without doing the utmost violence to our language all which verses are harmonious as verses of cadence if read with the caesura rhythmically and further that all those verses might easily by a slight transposition have been reduced to the pure iambic decasyllabic measure if chaucer had either known that mode of versification or intended to have adopted it such an assertion by the by would be a somewhat bold one even if a hundred instances were quoted instead of one and those really instances in point while insisting that chaucer's verses are constructed upon what he describes as the rhythmical principle which he has begun by defining as independent of the number of feet or syllables dr not strangely enough admits that the chief improvement which chaucer made in our versification was the introduction of the line of ten syllables dissertation page one hundred and fifty eight and he afterwards repeatedly calls his verses decasyllabic or as he more usually chooses to express himself decasyllables but he cannot possibly mean that chaucer's versification is upon his theory really syllabically any more than that it is accentually correct according to our modern notions in fact of the eighteen lines which he has printed from the commencement of the canterbury tales to show in what manner rhythmical decasyllabic verses were recited no fewer than seven are according to his own notation not decasyllabic at all they are verses of nine syllables sometimes with an unaccented syllable at the end which counts for nothing in prosody not of ten finally before dismissing dr not and his theory we may remark that no attempt is made by him or it to meet the apparently conclusive proof of the now silent final e having been enunciable as a distinct syllable in chaucer's age derived from the occurrence of such rhymes as roma and to me tima and by me indeed he expressly states dissertation page 
one hundred and eighty three note that with the exception of a passage in a cleave of which he shows that the received reading is most probably incorrect and which by the by would scarcely have been in point at any rate he had nowhere met with a single rhyme to justify the notion that the final e which we properly call the e mute was ever pronounced more recently however terwitt's main principle for the scanning of chaucer's verse the occasional pronunciation of this now mute final e has been attacked or at least denounced on other grounds and by a higher authority the late mr richard price in his edition of wharton's history of english poetry four volumes octavo london eighteen twenty four assigns an origin to this termination which he considers to be altogether irreconcilable with terwitt's view of it the change of orthography from the anglo-saxon forms which has taken place in a numerous class of our english words mr price maintains has arisen solely from the abolition of the accentual marks which distinguish the long and short syllables as a substitute for the former he says the norman scribes or at least the disciples of the norman school of writing had recourse to the analogy which governed the french language and to avoid the confusion which would have sprung from observing the same form in writing a certain number of letters differently enounced and bearing a different meaning they elongated the word or attached as it were an accent instead of superscribing it from hence has emanated an extensive list of terms having final e's and duplicate consonants which were no more the representatives of additional syllables than the acuter grave accent in the greek language is a mark of metrical quantity and he adds in a note the converse of this can only be maintained under an assumption that the anglo-saxon words of one syllable multiplied their numbers after the conquest and in some succeeding century subsided into their primitive simplicity again he observes in another place the anglo-saxon ah was pronounced like the danish ah the swedish ah or our modern o oh, in more for etc a strong intonation given to the words in which it occurred would strike a norman ear as indicating the same orthography that marked the long syllables of his native tongue and he would accordingly write them with an e final it is from this cause that we find har sar hat bat wa on ban stan etc written hor hora sor hota hot boat boat woe one bone stone some of which have been retained the same principle of elongation was extended to all the anglo-saxon vowels that were accentuated such as wreck reek reek lif life gada goad good skur sure shower and hence the majority of those e's mute upon which mr turwood has expended so much unfounded speculation and the complete development of these doctrines is promised in a supplementary volume which was announced under the title of illustrations of wharton's history of english poetry containing among other things an examination of mr turwitt's essay on the language and versification of chaucer but which has never appeared upon this view of the matter let us hear a living writer who must be regarded as the highest authority on the earlier forms of the language the most frequent vowel endings of anglo-saxon substantives says mr guest history of english rhythms one twenty six were a e u all the three were in the fourteenth century represented by the e final and afterwards in explaining the origin of our present mode of indicating the long quantity of a vowel preceding a single consonant by the annexation of an e he observes edem page one o eight in the anglo-saxon there was a great number of words which had as it were two forms one ending in a consonant the other in a vowel in the time of chaucer all the different vowel endings were represented by the e final and so great is the number of words which this writer uses sometimes as monosyllables and sometimes as disyllables with the addition of the e that he has been accused of adding to the number of his syllables whenever it suited the convenience of his rhythm in his works we find heart and harta bed and beda earth and eartha etc in the anglo-saxon we find corresponding duplicates the additional syllable giving to the noun 
in almost every case a new declension and in most a new gender in some few cases the final e had become mute even before the time of chaucer and was wholly lost in the period which elapsed between his death and the accession of the tudors still however it has its ground in our manuscripts and your our rose arose etc though pronounced as monosyllables was still written according to the old spelling hence it came gradually to be considered as a rule that when a syllable ended in a single consonant and mute e the vowel was long such concludes mr guest is clearly the origin of this very peculiar mode of indicating the long vowel and it seems to me so obvious that i always felt surprised at the many and various opinions that have been hazarded upon the subject we could not expect much information from men who like terwitt were avowedly ignorant of the early state of our language but even hicks had his doubts whether the final e of the anglo-saxon words were mute or vocal and rask notwithstanding his triumph over that far superior scholar has fallen into this his greatest blunder price whose good sense does not often fail him supposes this mode of spelling to be the work of the norman and the same as the orthography that marked the long syllable of his native tongue as if the e final were mute in norman french throughout his work mr guest assumes the syllabic quality of the final e in chaucer's verse exactly as is done by terwitt after the death of chaucer he asserts volume one page eighty the final e so commonly used by that poet and his contemporaries fell into disuse hence many dissyllables became words of one syllable mona became moon and sunna sun and the compounds into which they entered were curtailed of a syllable if it be meant that the change spoken of took place immediately or very soon after the death of chaucer the assertion is one which it would probably be somewhat difficult to make good we should doubt if the new pronunciation was generally introduced before the commencement of the sixteenth century a fact elsewhere noticed by mr guest we may just remark although not adduced by him for that purpose meets mr price's objection about the unlikelihood or impossibility of many anglo-saxon monosyllables having after the conquest been elongated into disyllables and having then in some succeeding century reverted to their original monosyllabic condition if it were necessary to make such an assumption as this in order to vindicate terwitt's theory of chaucer's versification the thing supposed is no more than what has actually happened as mr guest has observed volume one page forty the diasyllables containing y and w seem to have been once so numerous in our language that many words both english and foreign were adapted to their pronunciation and thus gained a syllable skur anglo-saxon became shower and fleur french became flower change of pronunciation has again reduced them to their original dimensions End of section twenty six section twenty seven of a compendious history of english literature and of the english language volume one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org a compendious history of english literature and of the english language volume one by george lilly craik chapter four part three on the whole then we may say that substantially terwitt's theory remains unshaken and we shall in our extracts assume that the mode proposed by him of reading the verse of chaucer and his contemporaries is the true one the reader to whom it may be new will find after a very little practice that the ear soon gets accustomed to the peculiarities of pronunciation required and the slight error of archaism which they impart rather adds to the effect of the poetry so that we come to prefer the retention of these obsolete forms to any substitution however delicately made that would aim at modernizing it or making it more intelligible we shall not however in our transcripts attempt to indicate the pronunciation by any accentual or other marks being of opinion with terwitt that 
a reader who cannot perform such operations for himself had better not trouble his head about the versification of chaucer the notion probably which most people have of chaucer to borrow a few sentences of what we have written elsewhere is merely that he was a remarkably good poet for his day but that both from his language having become obsolete and from the advancement which we have since made in poetical taste and skill he may now be considered as fairly dead and buried in a literary as well as in a literal sense this we suspect is the common belief even of educated persons and of scholars who have not actually made acquaintance with chaucer but know him only by name or by sight by that antique sounding dissyllable that seems to belong to another nation and tongue as well as to another age and by that strange costume of diction grammar and spelling in which his thoughts are clothed fluttering about them as it appears to do like the rags upon a scarecrow now instead of this the poetry of chaucer is really in all essential respects about the greenest and freshest in our language we have some higher poetry than chaucer's poetry that has more of the character of a revelation or a voice from another world we have none in which there is either a more abounding or a more bounding spirit of life a truer or fuller natural inspiration e may be said to verify in another sense the remark of bacon that what we commonly call antiquity was really the youth of the world his poetry seems to breathe of a time when humanity was younger and more joyous-hearted than it now is undoubtedly he had an advantage as to this matter in having been the first great poet of his country occupying this position he stands in some degree between each of his successors and nature the sire of a nation's minstrelsy is of necessity though it may be unconsciously regarded by all who come after him as almost a portion of nature as one whose utterances are not so much the echo of hers as in very deed her own living voice carrying in them a spirit as original and divine as the music of her running brooks or of her breezes among the leaves and there is not wanting something of reason in this idolatry it is he alone who has conversed with nature directly and without an interpreter who has looked upon the glory of her countenance unveiled and received upon his heart the perfect image of what she is succeeding poets by reason of his intervention and that imitation of him into which in a greater or less degree they are of necessity drawn see her only as it were wrapped in hazy and metamorphosing adornments which human hands have woven for her and are prevented from perfectly discerning the outline and the movements of her form by that encumbering investiture they are the fallen race who have been banished from the immediate presence of the divinity and have been left only to conjecture from afar off the brightness of that majesty which sits thrown to them behind impenetrable clouds he is the first man who has seen god walking in the garden and communed with him face to face but chaucer is the homer of his country not only as having been the earliest of her poets deserving to be so called but also as being still one of her greatest the names of spencer of shakespeare and of milton are the only other names that can be placed on the same line with his his poetry exhibits in as remarkable a degree perhaps as any other in any language an intermixture and combination of what are usually deemed the most opposite excellences great poet as he is we might almost say of him that his genius has as much about it of the spirit of prose as of poetry and that if he had not sung so admirably as he has done of flowery meadows and summer skies and gorgeous ceremonials and high or tender passions and the other themes over which the imagination loves best to pour her vivifying light he would have won to himself the renown of a montaigne or a swift by the originality and penetrating sagacity of his observations on ordinary life his insight into 
motives and character the richness and peculiarity of his humour the sharp edge of his satire and the propriety flexibility and exquisite expressiveness of his refined yet natural diction even like the very visible creation around us his poetry too has its earth its sea and its sky and all the sweet vicissitudes of each here you have the clear-eyed observer of man as he is catching the manners living as they rise and fixing them in pictures where not their minutest lineament is or ever can be lost here he is the inspired dreamer by whom earth and all its realities are forgotten as his spirit soars and sings in the finer air and amid the diviner beauty of some far-off world of its own now the riotous verse rings loud with the turbulence of human merriment and laughter casting from it as it dashes on its way flash after flash of all the forms of wit and comedy now it is the tranquillizing companionship of the sights and sounds of inanimate nature of which the poet's heart is full the springing herbage and the dewdrops on the leaf and the rivulets glad beneath the morning ray and dancing to their own simple music from mere narrative and playful humour up to the heights of imaginative and impassioned song his genius has exercised itself in all styles of poetry and won imperishable laurels in all it has been commonly believed that one of the chief sources from which chaucer drew both the form and the spirit of his poetry was the recent and contemporary poetry of italy that eldest portion of what is properly called the literature of modern europe the produce of the genius of petrarch and boccaccio and their predecessor and master dante but although this may have been the case it is by no means certain that it was so and some circumstances seem to make it rather improbable that chaucer was a reader or a student of italian of those of his poems which have been supposed to be translations from the italian it must be considered very doubtful if any one was really derived by him from that language the story of his palamon and narcita which as the knight's tale begins the canterbury tales but which either in its present or another form appears to have been originally composed as a separate work is substantially the same with that of boccaccio's heroic poem in twelve books entitled the tesida a fact which we believe was first pointed out by wharton but an examination of the two poems leads rather to the conclusion that they are both founded upon a common original than that the one was taken from the other boccaccio's poem extends to about twelve thousand octosyllabic chaucer's to not many more than two thousand decasyllabic verses and not only is the story in the one much less detailed than in the other but the two versions differ in some of the main circumstances chaucer moreover nowhere mentions boccaccio as his original on the contrary as wharton has himself noticed he professes to draw his materials not from the works of any contemporary but from older stories and older bookus that all this story telleth more plain Turwit, too while holding as well as wharton that chaucer's original was boccaccio admits that the latter was in all probability not the inventor of the story boccaccio himself in a letter relating to his poem describes the story as very ancient and as existing in what he calls latino vulgare by which he may mean rather the provencal than the italian in fact as both wharton and terwitt have shown there is reason to believe that it had previously been one of the themes of romantic poetry in various languages the passages pointed out by terwitt in his notes to chaucer's poem as translated or imitated from that of boccaccio are few and insignificant and the resemblances they present would be sufficiently accounted for on the supposition of both writers having drawn from a common source nearly the same observations apply to the supposed obligations of chaucer in his troilus and cressida to another poetical work of boccaccio's his philostrato the discovery of these was first announced by turwitt 
in his essay prefixed to the canterbury tales but chaucer himself tells us two fourteen that he translates his poem out of latin and in other passages one three ninety four and five sixteen fifty three he expressly declares his auctor or author to be named lollius in a note to the parson's tale in the canterbury tales turwit assumes that lollius is another name for boccaccio but how this should be he confesses himself unable to explain in his glossary a later publication he merely describes lollius as a writer from whom chaucer professes to have translated his poem of troilus and cressida adding i have not been able to find any further account of him it is remarkable that he should omit to notice that lollius is mentioned by chaucer in another poem his house of fame three three seventy eight as one of the writers of the trojan story along with homer darius phrygius livy whom he calls titus guido of colonna and english galfred that is geoffrey of monmouth the only writer of the name of lollius of whom anything is now known appears to be lollius urbicus who is stated to have lived in the third century and to have composed a history of his own time which however no longer exists but our ignorance of who chaucer's lollius was does not entitle us to assume that it is boccaccio whom he designates by that name besides the two poems have only that general resemblance which would result from their subject being the same and their having been founded upon a common original Turwit, note to parson's tale while he insists that the fact of the one being borrowed from the other is evident not only from the fable and characters which are the same in both poems but also from a number of passages in the english which are literally translated from the italian admits that at the same time there are several long passages and even episodes in the troilus of which there are no traces in the philostrato and wharton makes the same statement almost in the same words turwit acknowledges elsewhere too that the form of chaucer's stanza and the troilus does not appear ever to have been used by boccaccio nor does he profess to have been able to find such a stanza in any early italian poetry the only other composition of chaucer's for which he can be imagined to have had an italian original is his clerk's tale in the canterbury tales the matchless story of griselda this is one of the stories of the decameron but it was not from boccaccio's italian that chaucer took it but from petrarch's latin as he must be understood to intimate in the prologue where he says or makes the narrator say i wall you tell a tale which that i learned at padawa of a worthy clerk as previd by his wordis and his work he is now dead and nailed in his chest i pray to god so yeva his soul arrest francis petrarch the laureate poet haita this clerk whose rhetorica sweet illumined all italia of poetria petrarch's latin translation of boccaccio's tale is as terwitt states printed in all the editions of his works under the title of de obedientia et fide uxoria mythologia a myth on wifely obedience and faithfulness but indeed chaucer may not have even had petrarch's translation before him for petrarch in his letter to boccaccio in which he states that he had translated it from the decameron only recently come into his hands informs his friend also that the story had been known to him many years before he may therefore have communicated it orally to chaucer through the medium of what was probably their common medium of communication the latin tongue if they ever met at padua or elsewhere as it is asserted they did all that we are concerned with at present is the fact that it does not appear to have been taken by chaucer from the decameron he makes no reference to boccaccio as his authority and while it is the only one of the canterbury tales which could otherwise have been suspected with any probability to have been derived from that work it is at the same time one an acquaintance with which we know he had at least the means of acquiring through another language than the italian to these considerations may be added a remark made by sir harris nicholas that chaucer was not acquainted with italian 
says that writer may be inferred from his not having introduced any italian quotation into his works redundant as they are with latin and french words and phrases to which he subjoins in a note though chaucer's writings have not been examined for the purpose the remark in the text is not made altogether from recollection for at the end of spate's edition of chaucer's works translations are given of the latin and french words in the poems but not a single italian word is mentioned it may be questioned then if much more than the fame of italian song had reached the ear of chaucer but at all events the foreign poetry with which he was most familiar was certainly that of france this indeed was probably still accounted everywhere the classic poetical literature of the modern world the younger poetry of italy which was itself a derivation from that common fountain-head had not yet with all its real superiority either supplanted the old lays and romances of the trouvères and troubadours or even taken its place by their side the earliest english as well as the earliest italian poetry was for the most part a translation or imitation of that of france of the poetry written in the french language indeed in the eleventh twelfth and thirteenth centuries the larger portion as we have seen was produced in england for english readers and to a considerable extent by natives of this country french poetry was not therefore during this era regarded among us as a foreign literature at all and even at a later date it must have been looked back upon by every educated englishman as rather a part of that of his own land for a century or perhaps more before chaucer arose the greater number of our common versifiers had been busy in translating the french romances and other poetry into english which was now fast becoming the ordinary or only speech even of the educated classes but this work had for the most part been done with little pains or skill and with no higher ambition than to convey the mere sense of the french original to the english reader by the time when chaucer began to write in the latter half of the fourteenth century the french language appears to have almost gone out of use as a common medium of communication the english on the other hand as we may see by the poetry of langland and minot as compared with that of robert of gloucester had in the course of the preceding hundred years thrown off much of its primitive rudeness and acquired a considerable degree of regularity and flexibility and general fitness for literary composition in these circumstances writing in french in england was over for any good purpose chaucer himself observes in the prologue to his prose treatise entitled the testament of love certes there been some that spake their poesy matter in french of which speech the frenchmen have as good a fantasy as we have in hearing of frenchmen's english and again let then clerks indict in latin for they have the property of science and the knowing in that faculty and let frenchmen in their french also indict their quaint terms for it is kindly natural to their mouths and let us show our fantasies in such words as we learned did of our dama's tongue the two languages in short like the two nations were now become completely separated and in some sort hostile as the kings of england were no longer either dukes of normandy or earls of poitou and recently a fierce war had sprung up still more effectually to divide the one country from the other and to break up all intercourse between them so the french tongue was fast growing to be almost as strange and distinctly foreign among us as the english had always been in france chaucer's original purpose and aim may be supposed to have been that of the generality of his immediate predecessors to put his countrymen in possession of some of the best productions of the french poets so far as that could be done by translation and with his genius and accomplishments and the greater pains he was willing to take with it we may conjecture that he hoped to execute his task in a manner very superior to that in which such work had hitherto been performed with these views he undertook what was probably his earliest composition of any length his translation of the roman de la rose begun by guillaume de lory who died about twelve sixty and continued and finished by jean de Mont, whose date is about half a century later this poem says wharton is esteemed by the french the most valuable piece of their old poetry it is far beyond the rude efforts of all their preceding romancers and they have nothing equal to it before the reign of francis i who died in the year fifteen forty seven 
but there is a considerable difference in the merit of the two authors william of lory who wrote not one quarter of the poem is remarkable for his elegance and luxuriance of description and is a beautiful painter of allegorical personages john of mur is a writer of another cast he possesses but little of his predecessor's inventive and poetical vein and in that respect he was not properly qualified to finish a poem begun by william of lory but he has strong satire and great liveliness he was one of the wits of the court of charles le bel the difficulties and dangers of a lover in pursuing and obtaining the object of his desires are the literal argument of this poem this design is couched under the argument of a rose which our lover after frequent obstacles gathers in a delicious garden he traverses vast ditches scales lofty walls and forces the gates of adamantine and almost in impregnable castles these enchanted fortresses are all inhabited by various divinities some of which assist and some oppose the lover's progress the entire poem consists of no fewer than twenty two thousand seven hundred and thirty four verses of which only four thousand one hundred and forty nine are the composition of william of lory all this portion has been translated by chaucer and also about half of the eighteen thousand five hundred and eighty eight lines written by de Moon. his version comprehends thirteen thousand one hundred and five lines of the french poem these however he has managed to comprehend in seven thousand seven hundred and one wharton says seven thousand six hundred and ninety nine english verses this is effected by a great compression and curtailment of de moon's part for while the four thousand one hundred and forty nine french verses of de lory are fully and faithfully rendered in four thousand four hundred and thirty two english verses the eight thousand nine hundred and fifty six that followed by de moon are reduced in the translation to three thousand two hundred and sixty nine wharton who exhibits sample specimens both of the translation and of the original considers that chaucer has throughout at least equalled de lory and decidedly surpassed and improved de Mun. we can afford space for only one short extract the poet represents himself as having seen all that he relates in a dream that account of which he thus begins that it was may me thought though it is five year or more ago that it was may thus dreamed me in time of love and jollity that all thing ginneth waxing gay for there is neither bust nor hay in may that it nil shrouded then and it was benua leaves rem these woodis acre recoverin green that dry in winter been to seen and the earth waxeth proud withal for so to dews that on it fall and the power of state forget in which that winter had it set and then becometh the ground so proud that it will have a newer shroud and make so quaint his robe and fair that it had hues and hundred pair of grass and flowers in them purs and many hues full diverse that is the robe i mean ewis through which the ground to praisen is the birdes that hun left their song while they had suffered cold full strong in weather's grill and dart to sight been in may for the sun are bright so glad that they show in singing that in their heart is such liking that they mote singin and bin light then doth the nightingale her might to mock and noise and sing in blithe then is blissful many a scythe the chalandra and the poppin gay then young go folk intended a for to bin gay and amorous the time is then so savorous hard is his heart that loveth not in may when all this mirth is wrought when he may on these branches hear the smaller bird is singing clear their blissful sueta song petus and in this season delitus when love affirmeth all a thing methought one night in my sleeping right in my bed full readily that it was by the morrow early and up i rose and gan me clothe and on i wish mine hondest both a silver needle forth i drew out of a guiler quaint he knew and gan this needle thread anon for out of town me list to gone the sound of brightest for to hear that on the busk is singing clear in the sweet season that leaf this with a thread basting my sleeves alone i went in my playing the smallest foulest song hearkening 
that plained them for many a pair to sing on boughs blossom fair jolliffe and gay full of gladness toward a river gan me dress which that i heard ran fast to buy for fairer playin none saw i than playin me by that river for from the hill that stowed a there run near come down the stream full stiff and bold clear was the water and as cold as any well is soft to sane and some deal less it was than sane but it was straighter well away and never saw i e'er that day the water that so well a liked me and wonder glad was i to see that lusty place and that revere with that water that ran so clear my face i wash the saw i wheel the bottom he paved every deal with gravel full of stoneness sheen the meadows softer so and green beat right upon the water's side full clear was then the morrow tide and full a temper out of dread though gan i walkin through the mead downward ever in my playing nigh to the river-side coasting no verse so flowing and harmonious as this no diction at once so clear correct and expressive had it is probable adorned and brought out the capabilities of his native tongue when chaucer began to write several of his subsequent poems are also in whole or in part translations the troilus and cressida the legend of good women much of which is borrowed from ovid's epistles and others but we must pass over these and will take our next extract from his house of fame no foreign original of which has been discovered although wharton was inclined to think that it may have been translated or paraphrased from the provencal chaucer however seems to appear in it in his own person at least the poet or dreamer is in the course of it more than once addressed by the name of geoffrey and in the following passage he seems to describe his own occupation and habits of life it is addressed to him by the golden but living eagle who has carried him up into the air in his talons and by whom the marvellous sights he relates are shown and explained to him first i that in my feet have thee of whom thou hast great fear and wonder am dwelling with the god of thunder which men e call in jupiter that doth me flying full off fur to do all his commandment and for this cause he hath me sent to thee hearken now by thy trouth certain he hath of thee great vouth for that thou hast so truly so long surveyed and tentive flee his blinder nephew cupido and the fair queen venus also without in guerdon ever yet and nathless has set thy wit although ga in thy head full lit is to mock a books songs and ditties in rhyme or else in cadence as thou best canst in reverence of love and of his servants eke that have his service sought and seek and painest thee to praise his art although thou hadst never part wherefore so wisely god me bless jovisi halt it great tumbless and virtue eke that thou wilt make a night full off thine head to ache in thy study so thou he writest and evermore of love in thy test in honour of him and praisings and in his focus furtherings and in their matter all devisest and not him nay his folk despisest although thou mayest go in the dance of them that him list not advance wherefore as i now said he wis jupiter considereth well this and all's boasts of other things that is that thou hast no tidings of lovest folk if they be glade nay of nothing else that god made and not only fro fur country that no tidings come unto thee not of thy very neighbours that dwell in almost at thy doris thou hearest neither that may this for when thy labour all done is and hast made all thy reckonings instead of rest and of new things thou goest home to thine house anone and all so dumb as any stone thou sittest at another book till fully dazed is thy look and livest thus as an hermit although thine abstinence is lit and therefore jovis through his grace will that i bear thee to a place which that he hight the house of fame etc from the mention of his reckonings in this passage turbot conjectures that chaucer probably wrote the house of fame while he held the office of comptroller of the customs of wolves to which he was appointed in thirteen seventy four it may be regarded therefore as one of the productions of the second or middle stage of his political life as the roman of the rose is supposed to have been of the first
end of section twenty seven section twenty eight of a compendious history of english literature and of the english language volume one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org a compendious history of english literature and of the english language volume one by george lilly craik chapter four part four the house of fame is in three books comprising in all two thousand one hundred and ninety lines and is an exceedingly interesting poem on other accounts as well as for the reference which chaucer seems to make in it to himself and the circumstances of his own life another evidence which it carries of the somewhat advanced years of the writer is the various learning and knowledge with which it is interspersed here for instance is the doctrine of gravitation as explained by the all-accomplished eagle geoffrey thou knowest full well this that every kindly thing that is he hath a kindly stead there he may best in it conserved be unto which place every thing thorough his kindly inclining he moveth for to come unto when that it is a way there through as thus lo thou mayest all day see take any thing that heavy be as stone or lead or thing of weight and bear it ne'er so high on height let go thine hand it falleth down right so say i by fire or sound or smoke or other thingus light alway they seek upward on height light things up and heavy down charge well ever each of them be at large and for this cause thou mayst well see that every river to the sea inclined is to go by kind and by these skillis as i find have fishes dwelling in flood and sea and trees eke on the earth a bee thus everything by his reason hath his own proper mansion to which he seeketh to repair there as it should not a pair lo this sentence is no uncouth of every philosopher's mooth as aristotle and dan platon and other clerkus many one and to confirm in my resound thou wottest well that speech is sound or ellis no man might it hear now hearken what i wol thee leer and then the learned bird proceeds in the like strain to deliver a lecture on the production and propagation of sound sound is not but air e broken and every speech uh, that is spoken where loud or privy foul or fair in his substance nay is but air for as flame is but lighted smoke right so is sound but air e broke but this may be in many wise of the which i will thee devise as sound cometh of pipe or harp for when a pipe is blown sharp the air is twist with violence and rent lo this is my sentence eek when that men harp string is smite whether that it be much or light lo with the stroke the air it breaketh and right so breaketh it when men speaketh thus wast thou well what thing is speech now henceforth forth i will thee teach how average speech a voice or sound through his multiplication though it were piped of a mouse mote needest come to famous house i prove it thus taketh heed now by experience for if that thou threw in a water now a stone well wast thou it will make a pond a little roundel as a circle peradventure as broad as a covercle and right anon thou shalt see well that circle cause another wheel and that the third and so forth brother every circle causing other much broader than himself in was and thus from roundel to compass each about an other going he causeth of others stirring and multiplying ever mo 
till that it be so far ego that it at both a brinkus be although thou mayest it not see above yet goeth it alway under although thou think it a great wonder and whoso saith of truth i vary bid a him preven the contrary and write thus every word he wis that loud or privy he spoken is he moveth first an air about and of his moving out of doubt another air anon is moved as i have of the water proved that every circle causeth other right so of air my leave the brother ever rich air of another stirreth more and more and speech upbeareth or voice or noise or word or sound i through multiplication till it be at the house of fame etc he then applies this fact of sound tending up into the air till it find its stead or home the house of fame to the confirmation of what he had before delivered on the general law of gravitation or attraction in another place we have an illustration drawn from a novelty which we might have thought had hardly yet become familiar enough for the purposes of poetry the passage too is a sample of the wild almost grotesque imagination and force of expression for which the poem is remarkable what did this aeolus but he took out his black trompa brass that fouler than the devil was and gan this trompa for to blow as all the world should overthrow throughout every region he went this foul trompa's sound as swift as pellet out of gun when fire is in the powder run and such a smoke can out when out of the foul trompa's end black blue and greenish swartish red as do it where that men melt lead lo all on high from the tool and thereto one thing saw i well that i the further that it ran the greater wexen it began as doth the river from a well and it stank as the pit of hell the old mechanical artillery however is alluded to in another passage as if also still in use and the noise which that i heard for all the world right so it feared as doth the routing of the stone that fro the engine is letting gone all through the poem runs the spirit of the strange barbarous classical scholarship of the middle ages the aeneid is not altogether unknown to the author but it may be questioned if his actual acquaintance with the work extended much beyond the two opening lines which are pretty literally rendered in six octosyllabic verses near the beginning of the first book an abridgment indeed of the entire story of aeneas as told by virgil follows but that might have been got at second hand the same mixture of the classic and the gothic occurs throughout that is found in all the poetry french and italian as well as english of this era for instance there heard i playing on an harp that he soundeth both well and sharp him orpheus full craftily and on this other side fast by he sat the harper orion and gesides chirion and other harpers many one and the briton glasgirion etc orion here is probably a mistake not we fear a typographical one for arion why chirion by whom chiron seems to be intended is called gesides we do not know unless the epithet be a misprint for a cides or e cides applied to the centaur by a somewhat violent license as the instructor of achilles in a subsequent passage the confusion is more perplexing there saw i then dan cytherus and of athens dan proserus and mercia that lost her skin both in the face body and chin for that she would envier lo to pipe and bet than apollo there saw i famous old and young pipers of all the dutch tongue to learn and love dances springs reus and the strange things here we apprehend dan cytherus is none other than mount cytheron dan proserus is possibly the unfortunate procris who was daughter of the athenian king erechtheus 
mercia that lost her skin is undoubtedly the famous piper marsyas turned into a woman by a metamorphosis of which there is no record in ovid as a specimen of the strong painting that characterizes this poem its crowded and variegated canvas and the dramatic life that moves and hurries on the action we will give a portion of the poet's account of his last adventure his visit to what we may call with wharton the house or labyrinth of rumour which went round and round continually as swift as thought making such a noise as might have been heard from the north of france to rome it was made of twigs and was all over holes and chinks or as the poem says and eke this house hath of and trees as many as leaves been on trees in summer when that they been green and on the roof yet may men seen a thousand holes and well mow to letten the sound out e go and by day in every tide been all the doors open wide and by night each one is unshet nay porter is there none to let no manner tidings into pace nay never rest is in that place that it is filled full of tidings either loud or of whisperings and ever all the house's angles is full of rounings and of jangles of wearis of peace of marriages of rests of labour of viages etc the house which was shaped like a cage and sixty miles long stood in a valley and after he has gazed upon it with astonishment for a short time the poet eagerly begs his guide the eagle to convey him to it and show him what it contains the answer of the eagle seems to refer to some actual circumstance or passage of chaucer's history but certain one thing i thee tell that but i bring in thee therein nay shall thou never con the gin to come into it out of doubt so fast it were the low about but sith that jovus of his grace as i have said will thee solace finally with these ilka things these uncouth sights and tidings to pass away thine heaviness such ruth hath he of thy distress that thou suffredest debonairly and wost thyself and utterly wholly desperate of all bliss sith that fortune hath made amiss the sot of all thine heart is rest languish and ache and point to breast but he through his mighty malight will do thee ease albeit light the imperial bird accordingly took up the poet again in its tone or claws toes and conveying him into the whirling house by a window set him down on the floor then he proceeds such great congregation of folk as i saw roam about some it within and some without nas never seen nay shall be eft and every wight that i saw there round everich in others ear our new a tiding privily or else he told it openly write thus and said nay wast not thou that is betiden lo right now no certes quod he tell me what and then he told him this and that and swore thereto that it was soft thus hath he said and thus he doth and this shall be and this heard i say that shall be found that dare i lay that all the folk that is on live nay have the cunning to describe though thingus that are herden there what aloud and what in the ear but all the wonder most was this when one had heard a thing he wis he came straight to another white and gan him tellin anon right the same tale that to him was told or it a furlong way was old and began somewhat for to each unto this tiding in his speech more than ever it spoken was and not so soon departed nas though from him that he may he met with the third man and ere he let any stound he he told him else wherein the tidings sooth or false yet wold he tell it natheless and never more with more increase and it was erst thus north and south went every tiding from mouth to mouth and that increasing ever mo 
as fires want to quicken and go from a sparkle spongin amiss till all the city brent up is and when that that was full up sprung and waxen more in every tongue than e'er it was and went anon up to a window out to gone or but it might out there e pass it gan out creep at some crevasse and flew forth fast for the nonus and some time i saw there at once a, a leasing and a sad susaw that gonna of a venture draw out at a window for to pace and when they met in, in that place they were a checked both or two and neither of them might out go for each other they gun so crowd till each of them gan cry and loud let me gone first nay but let me and here i will ensure in thee with vowest that thou wilt do so that i shall never fro thee go but be all way thine own sworn brother we will meddle us each in other that no man be he ne'er so wroth shall have one of us two but both at once as beside his leave come we a morrow or on eve be we e wearied or still e round thus saw i false and sooth compound together fly for o tiding thus out at holes gone to ring every tiding straight to fame and she gan even each his name after her disposition and yeva them eke duration some to waxen and wanen soon as doth the fair and white moon and let him gone there might i seen winged wonders full fast flying twenty thousand all in a rout as elus them blew about and lord this house in all a times was full of shipmen and pilgrims with scripus but full of lee sings intermedded with tidings and eke alone by them selve a many thousand times twelve saw i eke of these pardoners curiers and eke of messengers with boxes crammed full of lies as ever vessel was with lees and as i alther fastest went about and did all mine intent me for to play in and for to leer and eke a tiding for to hear that i had heard of some country that shall not now be told for me for it no need is readily folk can e sing it better than i for all motout or later rave all the sheaves in the lathe i heard in a great noise withal within a corner of the hall their men of love tidings told and i gan thitherward behold for i saw running every white as fast as that they had in might and everich cried what thing is that and some said i not ne'er wot and when they were all on an heap though they behind gonen up leap and clammen up on other fast and up the noise on high and cast and treadin fast on others heels and stamp as men done after eels but at the last i saw a man which that i naught describe nay can but he, he seemed for me to be a man of great authority as the apparition of this unnamed personage the poet awakens from his dream and the poem ends through such deeper thinking and bolder writing as this chaucer appears to advance from the descriptive luxuriance of the roman of the rose to his most matured style in the canterbury tales this is not only his greatest work but it towers above all else that he has written like some palace or cathedral ascending with its broad and lofty dimensions from among the common buildings of a city his genius is another thing here altogether from what it is in his other writings elsewhere he seems at work only for the day that is passing over him here for all time all his poetical faculties put forth a strength in the canterbury tales they have nowhere else shown not only is his knowledge of life and character greater his style firmer clearer more flexible and more expressive his humour more subtle and various but his fancy is more nimble-winged his imagination far richer and more gorgeous his sensibility infinitely more delicate and more profound and this great work of chaucer's is nearly as remarkably distinguished by its peculiar character from the great works of other poets as it is from the rest of his own compositions 
among ourselves at least if we accept shakespeare no other poet has yet arisen to rival the authority of the canterbury tales and the entire assemblage of his various powers spencer's is a more aerial milton's a loftier song but neither possesses the wonderful combination of contrasted and almost opposite characteristics which we have in chaucer the sportive fancy painting and gilding everything with the keen observant matter-of-fact spirit that looks through whatever it glances at the soaring and creative imagination with the homely sagacity and healthy relish for all the realities of things the unrivalled tenderness and pathos with the quaintest humour and the most exuberant merriment the wisdom at once and the wit the all that is best in short both in poetry and in prose at the same time the canterbury tales is an unfinished or at least as we have it an imperfect work but it contains above seventeen thousand verses besides more than a fourth of that quantity of matter in prose the tales including the two in prose are twenty-four in number and they are interspersed with introductions to each generally short called prologues besides the prologue to the whole work in which the pilgrims or narrators of the tales are severally described and which consists of between eight hundred and nine hundred lines the prologue to the wife of bath's tale is fully as long all the twenty-four tales are complete except only the cook's tale of which we have only a few lines the squire's tale which remains half told and the burlesque tale of sir topas which is designedly broken off in the middle of the nineteen complete tales in verse the longest are the knight's tale of two thousand two hundred and fifty verses the clerk's tale of one thousand one hundred and fifty six and the merchant's tale of one thousand one hundred and seventy two the entire work with the exception of the prose tales and the rhyme of sir topas two hundred and five lines is in decasyllabic or hendecasyllabic verse arranged either in couplets or in stanzas the few extracts we can give cannot of course convey any notion of this vast and various poem to those who are not acquainted with it but those who are may have their recollection of it refreshed and the curiosity of other readers may be excited though not satisfied by the two or three passages we shall now subjoin the general prologue is a gallery of pictures almost unmatched for their air of life and truthfulness here is one of them there was also a nun a prioress that ever smiling was full simple and coy her greatest oath nasput by st lore and she was clapped madam eglantine full well she sang the service divine entombed in her nose full sweetly and french she spake full fair and fetishly after the school of stratford at her bow for french of paris was to her unknown at mita was she well e taught withal she let no morsel from her lip is fall nor wet her fingers in her saucer deep well could she carry a morsel and well keep that a no drop a nut fell upon her breast in courtesy was set full much her lest her over lip a wept she so clean that in her cup a was no furthing seen of grisa when she drunk and had her draught full seemly after her meat she raft and sickerly she was of great disport and full pleasant and amiable of port and painted her to counter fighten cheer of court and been estate lick of manier and to been holden din of reverence but for to speak in of her conscience she was so charitable and so piteous she would a weep if that she saw a mouse caught in a trap if it were dead or bled of smaller hounds had she that she fed with roasted flesh and milk and wastel bread but sore wept she if one of them were dead or if men smote it with a yarda smart and all was conscience and tender heart full seemly her wimple e pinched was her nose treatise her eye grey as glass her mouth full small and thereto soft and red but sickerly she had a fair forehead it was almost a span abroad i trow for heartily she was not undergrow full fetissa uh, was her cloak and as i was ware of smaller coral about her arm she bare a pair of beatus goddard all with green and thereon hung a brooch of gold full sheen on which was first he written a crowned a and after amor winked omnia as a companion to this perfect full link we will add that of the mendicant friar a friar there was a wanton and a merry a limitur a full solemn man in all the orders for is none that can so much of dalliance and fair 
language he had he made for many a marriage of younger women at his own cost until his order he was a noble post for well beloved and familiar was he with franklin's over all in his country and eke with worthy women of the town for he had power of confession as said himself more than a curate for of his order he was a licentiate full sweetly heard he confession and pleasant was his absolution he was an easy man to give penance thereas he wist to hand a good pittance for unto a poor order for to give is sign that a man is well he shrive for if he gave he durst uh, make avant he wist uh, that a man was repentant for many a man so hard is of his heart he may not weep although him sore smart therefore instead of weeping and prayers men mote give silver to the poor friars his tippet was i farst full of knives and pins for to give him fair wives and certainly he had a merry note well could he sing and play and on a rote of yettings he bare utterly the pris his neck was white as is the flower de lis there too he strong was as a champion and knew well the taverns in every town and every hostler and gay tapestier better than a lazer or a beggar for unto switch a worthy man as he accordeth not as by his faculty to heaven with such lazers acquaintance it is not honest it may not advance as for to dealing with no switch pareil but all with rich and sellers of the tale and over all there as profit should arise courteous he was and lowly of servise there nas no man nowhere so virtuous he was the best beggar in all his house gave a certain firma for the grant none of his brethren came in his haunt for though a widow had but a shoe so pleasant was his in percipio yet would he have a farthing or he went his purchase was well better than his rent and rage he could as it had been a whelp in love days there could be much or help for there was he not like a cloister rare with threadbare cope as is a poor scholar but he was like a master or a pope of double worsted was his semi-cope that round was as a bell out of the press somewhat he lisped for his wantonness to make his english sweet upon his tongue and in his harping when that he had sung his eye and twinkled in his head aright as donned the stars in a frosty night this worthy limiter was a clapped hubbard end of section twenty eight section twenty nine of a compendious history of english literature and of the english language volume one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org a compendious history of english literature and of the english language volume one by george lilly craik chapter four part five it may be observed in all these extracts how fond chaucer is of as it were welding one couplet and one paragraph to another by allowing the sense to flow on from the last line of the one through the first of the other thus producing an alternating movement of the sense and the sound instead of making the one accompany the other as is the general practice of our modern poetry this has been noticed and a less obvious part of the effect pointed out by a poet of our own day who has shown how well he felt chaucer by something more and much better than criticism chaucer observes lee hunt took the custom from the french poets who have retained it to this day it surely has a fine air both of conclusion and resumption as though it would leave off when it thought proper knowing how well it could recommence it is so favourite a usage with chaucer that it may be sometimes made available to settle the reading or at least the pointing and sense of a doubtful passage and it is also common with his contemporary gower the following is the first introduction to the reader of emily the heroine of the knight's tale of palamon and arcita thus passeth year by year and day by day 
till it fell ones in a morrow of may that emily that fairer was to seen than is the lily upon his stalk a green and fresher than the may with flowers new for with the rose colour strof her hue i not which was the finer of them two ere it was day as she was wont to do she was arisen and all ready dight for may wool have no sloggardy a night the season pricketh every gentle heart and maketh him out of his sleep to start and saith arise and do thine observance this maketh emily han remembrance to don honour to may and for to rise he clothed was she fresh for to devise her yellow hair was broidered in a tress behind her back a yard a long i guess and in the garden as the sun uprist she walketh up and down whereas her list she gathereth flowers parti white and red to make a saddle girland for her head and as an angel heavenlick she sung of the many other noble passages in this tale we can only present a portion of the description of the temple of mars why should i not as well eke tell you all the portraiture that was upon the wall within the temple of mighty mars the red all painted was the wall in length and bread like to the estrus of the grisly place that height the great temple of mars in trace in thilke cold and frosty region there is mars hath his sovereign mansion first on the wall was painted a forest in which there wanneth neither man nor beast with knotty nary barren trees old of stubbus sharp and hideous to behold in which there ran a rumble and a swow as though a storm should breast in every bough and downward from an hill under a bent there stood the temple of mars arme potent wrought all of burned steel of which the un tree was long and straight and ghastly for to see and there out came a rage and switch of ice that it made all the gates for to rise the northern light in at the door shone for window on the wall nay was there known through which men might in any light discern the door was all of athamanty turn he clenched over the thwart and end along with iron tough and for to make it strong every pillar the temple to sustain was tun great of iron bright and sheen there saw i first the dark imagining of felony and all the compassing the cruel ire red as any gled the pick a purse and ache the pallet dread the smiler with the knife under the cloak the shepin brenning with the black smoke the treason of the murdering in the bed the open war with woundest all the bled contec with bloody knife and sharp manace all full of chirking was that sorry place the sleer of himself yet saw i there his heart of blood hath bathed all his hair the nail he driven in the shod on height the cold of death with mouth gaping upright amidst of the temple sat mischance with discomfort and sorry countenance yet saw i woodenest laughing in his rage armed complaint althus and fierce outrage the karen in the bush with throat e corvin a thousand slain and not of qualm e storven the tyrant with the prey by force he raft the town destroyed there was nothing left the statue of mars upon a carta stood armed and looked grim as he were wood and over his head there shining two figures of stars that been clapped in scriptures that one puella that other rubius this god of armus was arrayed thus a wolf there stood before him at his feet with iron red and of a man he eat chaucer's merriment at once hardy and sly has of course the freedom and unscrupulousness of his time and much of the best of it cannot be produced in our day without offence to our greatest sensitiveness at least in the matter of expression besides humour in poetry or any other kind of writing can least of all qualities be effectively exemplified in extract its subtle life dependent upon a thousand minutiae of place and connection perishes under the process of excision it is to attempt to exhibit not the building by the brick but the living man by a pound of his fair flesh 
we will venture however to give one or two short passages nothing is more admirable in the canterbury tales than the manner in which the character of the host is sustained throughout he is the moving spirit of the poem from first to last here is his first introduction to us presiding over the company at supper in his own gentle hostelry that height the tabard fast by the bell in southwark on the evening before they set out on their pilgrimage great chira made our host a beverage one and to this supper said he us anon and served us with vitel of the best strong was the wine and well to drink us lest a seemly man our host was withal for to hand been a marshal in an hall a large man he was with iron steep a fairer burgess is there none in cheap bold of his speech and wise and well he taught and of manhood he lacked write him naught eke thereto was he right a merry man and after supper playin he began and spake of mirth among us other things when that we hadn't made our reckonings and said thus now lordings truly ye been to me welcome right heartily for by my troth if that i shall not lie i saw not this ye switch a company at once in this herber wa as is now fain would i do you mirth and i wist how and of a mirth i am right now bethought to don you ease and it shall cost you not ye gone to canterbury god you speed the blissful martyr quite you your me and well i wot as ye gone by the way ye shapen you to talk and then to play for truly comfort nay mirth is known to riden by the way dumb as the stone and therefore would i maken you disport as i said erst and don you some comfort and if you like it all by one assent now for to standen at my judgment and for to wirchen as i shall you say to-morrow when ye riden on the way now by my father's sola that is dead be ye merry smiteth off my head hold up your hondas withouten more speech they all gladly assent upon which mine host proposes further that each of them they were twenty-nine in all besides himself should tell two stories in going and two more in returning and that when they got back to the tabard the one who had told the tales of best sentence and most solace should have a supper at the charge of the rest and as the eloquent sagacious and large-hearted projector of the scheme for to make you the more merry i will myself and gladly with you ride ride at mine owen cost and be your guide and who that will my judgment with say shall pay for all we spend in by the way great as the extent of the poem is therefore what has been executed or been preserved is only a small part of the design for this liberal plan would have afforded us no fewer than a hundred and twenty tales nothing can be better than the triumphant way in which mine host of the tabard is made to go through the duties of his self-assumed post his promptitude his decision upon all emergencies and at the same time his good feeling never at fault any more than his good sense his inexhaustible and unflagging fun and spirit and the all-accommodating humour and perfect sympathy with which without for a moment stooping from his own frank and manly character he bears himself to every individual of the varied cavalcade he proposes that they should draw cuts to decide who was to begin and with how genuine a courtesy at once encouraging and reverential he first addresses himself to the modest clerk and the gentle lady prioress and the knight who also was of his port as meek as is a maid sir knight quote he my maester and my lord now draweth cut for that is mine accord cometh near quote he my lady prioress and ye sir clerk let be your shamefastness nay studieth not lay hand to every man but for personages of another order again he is another man giving and taking jibe and jeer with the hardest and boldest in their own style and humour only more nimbly and happily than any of them and without ever compromising his dignity and all the while his kindness of heart simple and quick and yet considered is as conspicuous as the cordial appreciation and delight with which he enters into the spirit of what is going forward and enjoys the success of his scheme for example when that the knight had thus his tale told in all the company nas there a young na old that he nay said it was a noble story and worthy to be drawn to memory and namely the gentlest of a rich one our host a laugh and swore so mota i gone this gulf aright unbuckled is the mail 
let's see now who shall tell another tale for truly this game is well begun now telleth ye sir monk if that ye can somewhat to quitten with the knightest tale the miller that for drunken was all pale so that unneath upon his horse he sat he nold a vellon neither hood na hat nay abiden no man for his courtesy but in pilate's voice he gan to cry and swore by armus and by blood and bones i can a noble tale for the knowns with which i will now quite the knightest tale our host saw that he was drunken of ale and said abide robin my leather brother some better man shall tell us first another abide and let us work and thriftily by god a soul quote he that will not i for i will speak or else go my way our host answer read tell on a devil way thou art a fool thy wit is overcome now hearketh neth quod the miller all and some but first i make a protestation that i am drunk i know it by my sound and therefore if that i misspeak or say white it the ale of southwark i you pray the miller is at last allowed to tell his tale which is more accordant with his character and the condition he was in than with either good morals or good manners as the poet observes what should i more say but this miller he knowed his wordis for no man forbear but told his churlish tale in his manner methinketh that i shall rehearse it here and therefore every gentle wight i pray for goddess love as deem not that i say of evil intent but that i mota rehearsa their tales all all be they better or worse or ellis falsen some of my matir and therefore whoso list it not to hear tune over the leaf and choose another tale for he shall find enow both great and smale of story old thing that toucheth gentleness and eke morality and holiness the miller's tale is capped by another in the same style from his fellow churl the reeve or bailiff who before he begins however avails himself of the privilege of his advanced years to prelude away for some time in a preaching strain till his eloquence is suddenly cut short by the voice of authority when that our host had heard this sermoning he began to speak as lordly as a king and said a what amounteth all this wit what shall we speak all day of holy writ the devil made a reeve for to preach or of a souter a shipman or a leech say forth thy tale and tarry not the time lo depa ford and it is half way prime lo greenwich there many a shrew is in it were all time thy tale to begin the last specimen we should give of our host shall be from the clerk's prologue sir clerk of oxenford our hostess said ye ride as still and coy as doth a maid we're a new a spoused sitting at the board this day nay heard i of your tongue a word i trow ye study abouten some suffime but salomon saith that every thing hath time for goddess sake as beth of better cheer it is no time for to study and hear tell us a merry tale by your fay for what man that is entered in a play he needest must unto the play assent but preaches not as frerest done in flint to make us for our old sinners weep nay that thy tale make us not to sleep tell us some merry thing of adventures your terms your colours and your figures keep them in store till so be ye indite high style as when that men to kingus write speak is so plain at this time i you pray that we may understand in what ye say this worthy clerk benignantly answered hosta quote i am under your yurda ye have of us as now the governance and therefore would i do you o be sons as fur as reason asketh heartily i wo you tell a tale which that i learn it at padau of a worthy clerk as prevet by his wordis and his work he is now dead and nail it in his chest i pray to god so yevia his sola rest francis petrarch the laureate poet hiata this clerk whose rhetorica sweet illumined all itala of poetry as linian did of philosophy or law or other art particular but death that will not suffer us dwell in here but as it were a twinkling of an eye them both hath slain and allah we shall die in our last specimen of the canterbury tales and also of chaucer being a passage exhibiting 
that power of pathos in the delicacy as well as in the depth of which he is unrivalled shall be taken from this tale told by the clerk the exquisite tale of griselda her husband has carried his trial of her submission and endurance to the last point by informing her that she must return to her father and that his new wife is coming by the way and she again answered in patience my lord quoth she i wot and wist alway how that betwixt in your magnificence and my povert no white ne can ne may make in comparison it is no nay i na held me never dine na in no manier to be your wife nay yet your chamberier and in this house there ye me lady maid the higher god take i for my witness and also wisly he my sola glade i never held me lady nay maestress but humble servant to your worthiness and ever shall while that my life may dure above in every worldly creature that ye so long of your benignity han holden me in honour and nobly whereas i was not worthy for to be that thank i god and you to whom i pray for ye yelled it you there is no more to say unto my father gladly woe i when and with him dwell unto my life's end god shield a switch a lordess wife to take another man to husband or to make and of your new wife god of his grace so grant you weal and prosperity for i will gladly yield in her my place in which that i was blissful wont to be for a sith it liketh you my lord quoth she that woolum wherein all my hardest rest that i shall gone i will go where you list but thereas ye me proffer switch thou where as i first brought it it is well in my mind it were my wretched clothes nothing fair the which to me were hard now for to find begin italics o oh, good a god how gentle and how kind ye seem it by your speech and at your visage the day that make ed was our marriage end of italics but sooth is said all gaita i find it true for in effect it prevet is on me love is not old as when that it is new but certes lord for none adversity to deign in this case it shall not be that ever in word or work i shall repent that i you gave mine a heart in whole intent my lord ye wot that in my father's place ye did me strip out of my poor weed and richly ye clad me of your grace to you brought i naught else out of dread but faith in nakedness and maidenhead and here again your clothing i restore and eke your, your wedding ring for evermore the remnant of your jewels ready be within your chamber i dare it safely sane naked out of my father's health quoth she i came in naked i mote uh, turn again all your pleasance wold i follow fain but yet i hope it be not your intent that i smockless out of your palace went let me not like a worm go by the way remember you mine own lord so dear i was your wife though i unworthy were the smock quoth he that thou hast on thy fake let it be still and bear it forth with thee but well uneath this thilke word he spake but went his way for ruth and for pity before the folk her selvin strippeth she and in her smock the foot and head all bare toward her father's house forth is she fair the folk her following weeping in her way and fortune i they cursing as they gone but she fro weeping kept her iron dray na in this time word nay spake she none her father that this tiding heard anon curseth the day and time that nature shope him to been alivest creature there is scarcely perhaps to be found anywhere in poetry a finer burst of natural feeling than in the lines we have printed in italics end of section twenty nine section thirty of a compendious history of english literature and of the english language volume one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org 
a compendious history of english literature and of the english language volume one by george lilly craik chapter four part six john gower contemporary with chaucer and probably born a few years earlier though of the two he survived to the latest date for his death did not take place till the year fourteen o eight was john gower it is affirmed by leland in his commentarii de scriptioribus britannicus that he was of the ancient family said to have been seated at stittenham or sittenham in yorkshire before the conquest of which the duke of sutherland is now the head and mr todd in his valuable illustrations of the lives and writings of gower and chaucer octavo london eighteen ten has published a deed from the charter chest of the duke then marquis of stafford dated at stittenham in thirteen forty six to which the first of the subscribing witnesses is johannes gower and an endorsement upon which but in a hand which is admitted to be at least a century later states this person to have been sir john gower the poet this would make gower to have been born before thirteen twenty six at the latest and to have been some years beyond eighty when he died which is consistent enough with the manner in which his name is generally mentioned by old writers along with but before that of chaucer and with the express statement in some of the earlier accounts that he was the senior of the two but it has since been conclusively shown by sir harris nicholas that no reliance can be placed upon these assertions and inferences and that gower was really not a north of england but a south of england man and resided in the county of kent it is proved however by his will published by mr todd and previously by gough in his sepulchral monuments two volumes folio seventeen eighty six that he was a person of condition and possessed of considerable property he and chaucer were friends as well as contemporaries and brother poets and there appears to be no sufficient reason for the notion that has been taken up by most of the modern biographers of the latter that they were alienated from one another in their old age it may be safely assumed at least that their friendship remained unbroken down to thirteen ninety three the year in which gower as he tells us himself finished his confessio amantis where near the end he puts the following compliment to chaucer into the mouth of venus and greet well chaucer when ye meet as my disciple and my poet for in the flourish of his youth in sundry wise does he well couth of ditties and of songus glade the which he for my sake made the land fulfilled is over all whereof to him in special above all other i am most hold for thee now in his day is old thou shall a him tell this message that he upon his latter age to set an end of all his work as he which is mine own a clerk do make his testament of love as thou hast done thy shrift above so that my court it may record this was certainly liberal repayment for chaucer's dedication to his friend probably many years before of his troilus and cressida or rather of half that work in the following sober lines o moral gower this book i direct to thee and to the philosophical strud to vouchsafe their need is to correct of your benignities and zealous good the epithet here bestowed upon gower is not perhaps exactly the one which a poet would most covet but it has stuck and moral gower is the name by which he has generally passed ever since o moral gower and lydgate laureate exclaims the scottish poet dunbar in his golden targe moral gower whose sententious dew adown reflareth with fair golden beams says hawes in his pastime of pleasure and near them sat old moral gore with pleasant pen in hand writes the author of a dialogue both pleasant and pitiful london fifteen seventy three but his publisher berthlet the printer is the most severe of all in the dedication prefixed to his edition of the confessio amantis fifteen thirty two he naively remarks it was not much greater pain to that excellent clerk the moral john gower 
to compile the same noble work than it was to me to print it no man he adds alluding to the former edition by caxton in fourteen eighty three will believe it without conferring both the prints the old and mine together gower is the author of three great poetical works sometimes spoken of as one though they do not seem to have had any connection of plan or subject the speculum matitantis which is or was in french the vox clamantis which is in latin and the confessio amantis which is in english but the first although an account of it founded on a mistake has been given by wharton has certainly not been seen in modern times and has in all probability perished we have other specimens however of gower's talents as a french and also as a latin poet in certain short pieces and both these languages preserved in a volume in the duke of sutherland's library at trentham staffordshire of which an account has been given by wharton history of english poetry to three thirty four to three forty one and another more full particular and exact by mr todd illustrations pages ninety three to one o eight speaking of gower's latin poetry wharton says that he copied ovid's elegiacs with some degree of purity and with fewer false quantities and corrupt phrases than any of our countrymen had yet exhibited since the twelfth century of the french pieces in that trentham volume which consist of fifty ballades or sonnets he observes they have much real and intrinsic merit they are tender pathetic and poetical and place our old poet gower in a more advantageous point of view than that in which he has hitherto been usually seen i know not if any even among the french poets themselves of this period have left a set of more finished sonnets for they were probably written when gower was a young man about the year thirteen fifty nor had yet any english poet treated the passion of love with equal delicacy of sentiment and elegance of composition four of these french sonnets are given by wharton and more correctly with the addition of a fifth by todd and the entire contents of the volume were edited for the roxburgh club in eighteen eighteen by the present duke of sutherland then earl gower under the title of ballads and other poems by john gower printed from the original manuscript latin and french black letter quarto london gower was probably one of the last englishmen who attempted the composition of poetry in french and at the end of one of the pieces in this volume he asked forgiveness of his reader for any inaccuracies he may have committed in the foreign idiom on the ground of his english birth and his therefore not being master of the french eloquence a c a o nai de francois la faconde pardonnez moi que io de seo for soi io suis anglois the wax clamantis was edited for the roxburgh club in eighteen fifty by the rev h g cox it consists of seven books in latin elegiacs the greater bulk of the work says dr pauli the date of which its editor is inclined to fix between thirteen eighty two and thirteen eighty four is rather a moral than an historical essay but the first book describes the insurrection of wat tyler in an allegorical disguise the poet having a dream on the eleventh of june thirteen eighty one in which men assumed the shape of animals the second book contains a long sermon on fatalism in which the poet shows himself no friend to wycliffe's tenets but a zealous advocate for the reformation of the clergy the third book points out how all orders of society must suffer for their own vices and demerits in illustration of which he cites the example of the secular clergy the fourth book is dedicated to the cloistered clergy and the friars the fifth to the military the sixth contains a violent attack on the lawyers and the seventh subjoins the moral of the whole represented in nebuchadnezzar's dream as interpreted by daniel the allusion in the title seems to be to st john the baptist and to the general clamour then abroad in the country the confessio amantis has been several times printed by caxton in fourteen eighty three by berthlet in fifteen thirty two and again in fifteen fifty four and by alexander chalmers in the second volume of his english poets eighteen ten 
but all these previous editions have been superseded by the very commodious and beautiful one of dr reinhold pauli in three volumes octavo london eighteen fifty seven we will avail ourselves of dr pauli's account of the course in which the work proceeds the poem opens by introducing the author himself in the character of an unhappy lover in despair venus appears to him and after having heard his prayer appoints her priest called genius like the mystagogue in the picture of cebes to hear the lover's confession this is the frame of the whole work which is a singular mixture of classical notions principally borrowed from ovid's ars amandi and of the purely mediaeval idea that as a good catholic the unfortunate lover must state his distress to a father confessor this is done with great regularity and even pedantry all the passions of the human heart which generally stand in the way of love being systematically arranged in the various books and subdivisions of the work after genius has fully explained the evil affection passion or vice under consideration the lover confesses on that particular point and frequently urges his boundless love for an unknown beauty who treats him cruelly in a tone of affectation which would appear highly ridiculous in a man of more than sixty years of age were it not a common characteristic of the poetry of the period after this profession the confessor opposes him and exemplifies the fatal effects of each passion by variety of opposite stories gathered from many sources examples being then and as now a favourite mode of inculcating instruction and reformation at length after a frequent and tedious recurrence of the same process the confession is terminated by some final injunctions of the priest the lover's petition in a strophic poem addressed to venus the bitter judgment of the goddess that he should remember his old age and leave off such fooleries his cure from the wound caused by the dart of love and his absolution received as if by a pious roman catholic such a scheme as this pursued through more than thirty thousand verses promises perhaps more edification than entertainment but the amount of either that is to be got out of the confessio mantis is not considerable ellis after charitably declaring that so long as moral gower keeps to his morality he is wise impressive and sometimes almost sublime he is compelled to add but his narrative is often quite petrifying and when we read in his work the tales with which we have been familiarized in the poems of ovid we feel a mixture of surprise and despair at the perverse industry employed in removing every detail on which the imagination had been accustomed to fasten the author of the metamorphosis was a poet and at least sufficiently fond of ornament gower considers him as a mere analyst scrupulously preserves his facts relates them with great perspicuity and is fully satisfied when he has extracted from them as much morality as they can be reasonably expected to furnish in many cases this must be little enough we shall confine our specimens of gower's poetry to two short passages from the confessio amantis the first is the tale of the coffers or caskets in the fifth book which has been given by todd after a collation of the printed editions with the best manuscripts this is the story whether found by him in gower or elsewhere from which shakespeare is supposed to have taken the hint of the incident of the caskets in his merchant of venice in a chronique thus i read about a king as much knee there was a knight of and seigneurs great rout and eke of officers some of long time him hadn't served and thoughten that they have deserved advancement and gone without and some also been of the rout that comin but a while agone and they advanced were anon there older men upon this thing so as they durst again the king among themself complain and off but there is nothing said so soft that it nay cometh out at last the king it wist and all so fast as he which was of high prudence he shoped therefore an evidence of them that plain and in the cause to know in whose default it was and all within his own intent that none may wist the what it meant anon he let two coffers make of one semblance and of one make so lick that no life thilke throw that one may throw that other no they were into his chamber brought but no man wot why they be wrought and natheless the king hath bed that they be set in privy stead as he that was of wisdom sly when he thereto his time sigh all privily that none it wist his own a hondas that one chest of fine gold and of fine peri the which out of his treasury was take anon he filled full that other coffer of straw and mull 
with stonest mend he filled also thus be they full both two so that erlich upon a day he had within where he lay there should be to form his bed a board upset and fairer spread and then he let the coffers fet upon the board and did them set he knew the name as well of though the which again him grutched so both of his chamber and of his hall anon and sent a for them all and set a to them in this wise there shall no man his hap despise i wot well ye have longer served and god wot what ye have deserved but if it is along on me of that ye unadvanced be or else if it be long on yow the soother shall be proved now to stop her with your evil word lo here two coffers on the board jeez which you list of both the two and witten well that one of though is with treasure so full begone that if ye happa thereupon ye shall be rich at men for ever now cheese and take which you is lover but be ye well where that ye take for of that one i undertake there is no manner good therein whereof ye might in profit win now goeth together of one assent and taketh your advisement for but i you this day of advance it stant upon your own a chance all only in default of grace so shall be showed in this place upon you all a well a fin that no default of shall be men they kneel in all and with one voice the king they thonken of his choice and after that they up arise and gone aside and them avise and at last they accord whereon their tale to record to what issue they befall a knight shall speak afore them all he kneeleth down unto the king and saith that they upon this thing or for to win or for to lease but he and all advised for to cheese though took this knight a yurd on hond and goeth there as the coffers stand and with a scent of average one he layeth his yurd upon one and saith the king how filka same they cheese and regurden by name and prayeth him that they might it have the king which would his honour save when he had heard the common voice hath granted them their own a choice and took them there upon the key and for he wold it were see what good they have as they suppose he bade anon the coffer unclose which was filled with straw and stones thus be they served all at once the king then in the same steed anon that other coffer indeed whereas they sigh in great riches well more than they could then guess lo saith the king now may ye see that there is no default in me for thee myself i will acquite and beareth ye your own a white of that fortune hath you refused thus was this wise king excused and they left off their evil speech and mercy of their king beseech our other extract we give in the old spelling as it was contributed to the pictorial history of england by sir henry ellis from a very early manuscript of the poem in the harleian collection number three four nine zero in a chronique i find of thus how the caius fabricius which willom was consul of rome by whom ma la laws yeda and come won the sampnities to him brought a summer of golda and him by sought to dun him favour in the law toward a, the golda he gan him draw whereof in alla menace look aparta in to his honda he took a, which to his mouth in alla haste he put hit for to smell and taste and to his eye and to his ear both he ne found no comfort there and vana he began it to despise and told unto him in this wise i not what is with gold to thrive one none of all of my wit is five find saviour nay delight therein so is it boat a nicer sin of golda so been to covetous both he is rich and glorious which hath in his subject the men which in possession been rich of gold and by the skill 
for he may all day wan he will or be him lief or be him loath justice done upon them both lo thus he said and with that word he threw to fore him on the board the gold out of his hand anon and sighed them that he wold anon so that he kept his liberty to do justice and equity without lucre of such richesse there be now few of such i guess for it was thilke time as hues that every judge was refused which was not friend to common right both they that wold and stond upright for truth only to do justice preferred were in thilke office to dema and judge common law which now men sane is all withdraw to set a law and keep it not there is no common profit sought but above all natheless the law which is made for peace is good to keep before the best for that set all our men in rest the manuscripts of the confessio amantis are very numerous there are no fewer than ten in the bodleian library and several others are in the british museum at cambridge at trinity college dublin and in private collections dr pauley's text in which he has regulated the spelling in conformity to the demands of the verse which he apparently assumes to have been as regular as that of chaucer is held to be by Turwit, is founded on the printed edition of fifteen thirty two collated chiefly with the stafford manuscript and with those in the harleian collection numbered seven one eight four three eight six nine and three four nine zero the poem extends to eight books and is expressly stated by the author to have been finished in the sixteenth year of richard the second that is in the years thirteen ninety three it had been begun some years before at the command of that king at a time when as it seems to be intimated gower was labouring under ill health though i sickness have upon hand and long have had though it is not quite clear that these words are not intended to describe his condition at the conclusion of his task he particularly gives it as his reason for choosing the vernacular language for that few were men indite in our english end of section thirty section thirty one of a compendious history of english literature and of the english language volume one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org a compendious history of english literature and of the english language volume one by george lilly craik chapter four part seven barber this latter part of the fourteenth century is also the age of the birth of scottish poetry and chaucer had in that dialect a far more worthy contemporary and rival than his friend and fellow englishman gower in john barber of barber's personal history but little is known he was a churchman and had attained to the dignity of archdeacon of aberdeen by the year thirteen fifty seven so that his birth cannot well be supposed to have been later than thirteen twenty he is styled archdeacon of aberdeen in a passport granted to him in that year by edward the third at the request of david de bruce that is king david the second of scotland to come into england with three scholars in his company for the purpose as it is expressed of studying in the university of oxford and the protection is extended to him and his companions while performing their scholastic exercises and generally while remaining there and also while returning to their own country it may seem strange that an archdeacon should go to college but oxford appears to have been not the only seat of learning to which barber resorted late in life with the same object three other passports or safe conducts are extant which were granted to him by edward at later dates the first in thirteen sixty four permitting him to come with four horsemen from scotland by land or sea into england to study at oxford or elsewhere as he might think proper the second in thirteen sixty five by which he is authorized to come into england and travel throughout that kingdom with six horsemen as his companions as far as to st denis in france and the third in thirteen sixty eight securing him protection in coming with two valets and two horses into england and travelling through the same to the king's other dominions on his way to france versus francium 
for the purpose of studying there and in returning thence yet he had also been long before this employed and in a high capacity in civil affairs in thirteen fifty seven he was appointed by the bishop of aberdeen one of his two commissioners deputed to attend a meeting at edinburgh about the ransom of the king nothing more is heard of him till thirteen seventy three in which year he appears as one of the auditors of exchequer being styled archdeacon of aberdeen and clerk of probation clerico probationis of the royal household in his later days he appears to have been in the receipt of two royal pensions both probably bestowed upon him by robert the second who succeeded david the second in thirteen seventy the first one of ten pounds scots from the customs of aberdeen the other one of twenty shillings from the borough mails or city rents of the same town an entry in the records of aberdeen for fourteen seventy one states on the authority of the original roll now lost that the latter was expressly granted to him for the compilation of the book of the acts of king robert the first in a passage occurring in the latter part of this work he himself tells us that he was then compiling it in the year thirteen seventy five all that is further known of him is that his death took place towards the close of thirteen ninety five besides his poem commonly called the bruce another metrical work of his entitled the broit or the brute being a deduction of the history of the scottish kings from brutus is frequently referred to by the chronicler winton in the next age but no copy of it is now believed to exist of the bruce only one manuscript was till lately supposed to be extant a transcript made in fourteen eighty nine preserved in the advocates library and it was from this that the last and best edition of the poem was printed by dr jameson in quarto at edinburgh in eighteen twenty but another manuscript dated fourteen eighty eight has since been discovered in the library of st john's college cambridge it appears to have been printed before the close of the sixteenth century a patrick gordon gentleman as he designates himself the author of a metrical work entitled the famous history of the renowned and valiant prince robert surnamed the bruce king of scotland which first appeared at dort in sixteen fifteen alludes to barber's previous performance on the same subject as the old printed book and mr david lang in a note to his edition of dunbar edinburgh eighteen thirty four page forty states that he is possessed of an edition of barber's poem in small quarto and black letter which although it has lost the title page appears to have been printed at edinburgh about the year fifteen seventy the oldest edition known to dr jameson was an edinburgh one of sixteen sixteen it was reprinted at the same place in sixteen twenty and sixteen seventy at glasgow in sixteen seventy two and again at edinburgh in seventeen fourteen the title page however being usually dated seventeen fifty eight the first critical edition was that by pinkerton published in three volumes octavo at london in seventeen ninety the last and best is that by the rev dr john jameson forming the first volume of the bruce and wallace two volumes quarto edinburgh eighteen twenty we may notice by the way that gordon who speaks with great contempt of barber's outworn barber's speech and ill-composed and immethodical work tells a story in the preface to his famous history about a still older poem on the exploits of bruce written by a monk of the abbey of melrose called peter fenton in the year thirteen sixty nine a manuscript copy of which old and torn almost illegible in many places wanting leaves yet having the beginning had been put into his hands by his loving friend donald farquharson it was he says an old rhyme like to chaucer but wanting in many parts and especially from the field of bannockburn forth it wanted all the rest almost so that it could not be gotten to the press yet such as i could read thereof had many remarkable tales worthy to be noted and also probable agreeing with the truth of the history as i have followed it as well as the other one cannot help regretting dr jameson sensibly remarks that gordon instead of bestowing his labour on a new poem had not favoured the public with even the fragments of that written by fenton it would have been something if he had even informed us what he had done with the manuscript if he did not put it into the fire upon finding that he could not read it he writes the date thirteen sixty nine in words at full length but he is evidently not a person upon whose testimony much reliance can be placed as to such a matter it is a suspicious circumstance as is hinted by macpherson the editor of winton's chronicle that that, that writer though he often quotes barber has never once mentioned fenton the scotch in which barber's poem is written was undoubtedly the language then commonly in use 
among his countrymen for whom he wrote and with whom his poem has been a popular favourite ever since its first appearance by his countrymen of course we mean the inhabitants of southern and eastern or lowland scotland not the celts or highlanders who have always been and still are as entirely distinct a race as the native irish are and always have been from the english in ireland and to confound whom either in language or in any other respect with the scottish lowlanders is the same sort of a mistake that it would be to speak of the english as being either in language or lineage identical with the welsh indeed there is a remarkable similarity as to this matter in the circumstances of the three countries in each a primitive celtic population which appears to have formerly occupied the whole soil has been partially expelled by another race but still exists inhabiting its separate locality in all the three cases the maritime and mountainous wilds of the west and retaining its own ancient and perfectly distinct language the expulsion has been the most sweeping in england where it took place first and where the welsh form now only about a sixteenth of the general population it has been carried to a less extent in scotland where it was not effected till a later age and where the numbers of the highlanders are still to those of the lowlanders in the proportion of one to five or six in ireland where it happened last of all the new settlers have scarcely yet ceased to be regarded as foreigners and intruders and the ancient celtic inhabitants still covering although not possessing by far the greater part of the soil the larger proportion of them however having relinquished their ancestral speech continue to be perhaps six or eight times as numerous as the saxons or english for in all the three cases it is the same saxon or at least teutonic race before which the celts have retired or given way the welsh the scottish highlanders and the native irish indeed all to this day alike designate the stranger who has set himself down beside them by the common epithet of the saxon we know that other teutonic or northern races were mixed with the angles and saxons in all the three cases not only were the english who settled in scotland in great numbers and conquered ireland in the eleventh and twelfth centuries in part french normans but the original normans or danes had in the eighth and ninth centuries effected extensive settlements in each of the three countries besides the original english were themselves a mixed people and those of them who were distinctively saxons were even the old hereditary enemies of the danes still as the saxons angles and jutes were as one people against the scandinavian danes or their descendants the french normans so even saxons and danes or normans were united everywhere against the celts as for the language spoken by the lowland scots in the time of barbara it must have sprung out of the same sources and been affected by nearly the same influences with the english of the same age nobody now holds that any part of it can have been derived from the picts who indeed originally occupied part of the lowlands of scotland but who were certainly not a teutonic but a celtic people lothian or all the eastern part of scotland to the south of the forth was english from the seventh century as much as was northumberland or yorkshire from the state the only difference that could have distinguished the language there used from that spoken in the south of england was probably a larger infusion of the danish forms but this characteristic must have been shared in nearly the same degree by all the english then spoken to the north of the thames again whatever effect may have been produced by the norman conquest and the events consequent upon that revolution would probably be pretty equally diffused over the two countries in the twelfth and thirteenth centuries both the normans themselves and their literature appear to have acquired almost the same establishment and ascendancy in scotland as in england we have seen that french was the language of the court in the one country as well as in the other and that scottish as well as english writers figure among the imitators of the norman trouvere and romance poets afterwards the connection of scotland with france became much more intimate and uninterrupted than that of england and this appears to have affected the scottish dialect in a way which will be presently noticed but in barbara's day the language of teutonic scotland was distinguished from that of the south of england which had now acquired the ascendancy over that of the northern counties as the literary dialect by little more than the retention perhaps of a good many vocables which had become obsolete among the english and a generally broader enunciation of the vowel sounds hence barber never supposes that he is writing in any other language than english any more than chaucer that is the name by which not only he but his successors dunbar and even lindsay always designate their native tongue down to the latter part of the sixteenth century by the term scotch was generally understood what is now called the gaelic or the erse or erish that is irish the speech of the celts or highlanders divested of the grotesque and cumbrous spelling of the old manuscripts the language of barber 
is quite as intelligible at the present day to an english reader as that of chaucer the obsolete words and forms are not more numerous in the one writer than in the other though some that are used by barber may not be found in chaucer as many of chaucer's are not in barber the chief general distinction as we have said is the greater breadth given to the vowel sounds in the dialect of the scottish poet the old termination of the present participle in and is also more frequently used than in chaucer to whom however it is not unknown any more than its modern substitute ing is to barber the most remarkable peculiarity of the more recent form of the scottish dialect that is not found in barber is the abstraction of the final l from syllables ending in that consonant preceded by a vowel or diphthong thus he never has ah fa fa or fu pow how for all fall full po ho etc the subsequent introduction of this habit into the speech of the scotch is perhaps to be attributed to their imitation of the liquefaction of the l in similar circumstances by the french from whom they have also borrowed a considerable number of their modern vocables never used in england and to whose accentuation both of individual words and of sentences there is as much general resemblance throwing the emphasis contrary as already noticed to the tendency of the english language upon one of the latter syllables and also running into the rising in many cases where the english use the falling intonation the bruce is a very long poem comprising between twelve and thirteen thousand lines in octosyllabic metre which the two last editors have distributed pinkerton into twenty jameson into fourteen books it relates the history of scotland and especially the fortunes of the great bruce from the death of alexander the third in twelve eighty six or rather from the competition for the crown and the announcement of the claims of edward the first as lord paramount on that of his daughter margaret the maiden of norway in twelve ninety the events of the first fifteen or sixteen years however before bruce comes upon the stage being very succinctly given to the death of bruce robert the first in thirteen twenty nine and that of his constant associate and brother of chivalry lord james douglas the bearer of the king's heart to the holy land in the year following the twelve thousand five hundred verses or thereby may be said therefore to comprehend the events of about twenty-five years and barber though he calls his work a romant as being a narrative poem professes to relate nothing but what he believed to be the truth so that he is to be regarded not only as the earliest poet but also as the earliest historian of his country forden indeed was his contemporary but the latin chronicle of that writer was probably not published till many years after his death and to a great extent barber's work is and has always been regarded as being an authentic historical monument it has no doubt some incidents or embellishments which may be set down as fabulous but these are in general very easily distinguished from the main texture of the narrative which agrees substantially with the most trustworthy accounts drawn from other sources and has been received and quoted as good evidence by all subsequent writers and investigators of scottish history from andrew of winton to lord hales inclusive this is barber's own introduction of himself to his readers and the passage besides explaining the design of his work affords a fair example of the worthy archdeacon's manly bearing and forcible and cordial style stories to read are delightable suppose that they be not but fable then should stories that suthest were and they war said on good manner have double pleasance in hearing the first pleasance is the carping and the tother the south fastness that shows the thing right as it was and such thing as that are like an till manners hearing are pleasand therefore i wall fain set my will if my wit might suffice there still to put in writ a suffastory that it lest i firth in memory swa that nay time of length it let nergur it holly be for yet for old stories that men reads represent to them the deeds of stalwart folk that live it are right as they then in presence war and certes they should well have prized that in their time were white and wise and led their life in great travail and oft in hard stour of betail won right great price of chivalry and war voided of cowardy as west king robert of scotland that hardy west of heart and hand and good sure james of douglas that in his time so worthy was that of his price and his bounty in fur lands renowned it was he of them i think this book to may now god give grace that i may sway 
treat it and bring it till ending that i say naught but suffest thing some of the grammatical forms here it may be observed are even more modern than those we find in the english poetry of the same age in particular barber uses our present they them and there or in the old spelling thy them and thar where chaucer and his countrymen still adhere to the saxon hey or he or hem and her or her this may serve with other considerations to refute the notion taken up by some modern writers that barber is an imitator of chaucer the bruce in fact is an earlier poem than the canterbury tales and as it was written by barber in his old age the probability is that the scottish poet was absolutely the predecessor of the english but at any rate there is no more reason to believe that he imitated chaucer than that chaucer imitated him the one is never mentioned or alluded to by the other and there is no ground for supposing that they were even acquainted with each other's works from his habits of locomotion and frequent journeys to england a suspicion might arise that barber intended to write in the language of that country but such a supposition is negatived by the dialectic peculiarities which notwithstanding a general resemblance in other respects still distinguish his style from that of his english contemporaries that his language we may add has not been modernized by the transcriber upon whom we are dependent for the present text is to a great extent proved by several considerable passages of the poem which are quoted by winton being found with scarcely any variation in the work of that chronicler of which we have one manuscript believed to be of as early a date as the year fourteen thirty at the latest or within little more than a quarter of a century from the time when barber lived besides his language as we have it does not differ from that of winton who was his contemporary although he was born perhaps thirty years later and although he appears not to have composed his chronicle till after the commencement of the fifteenth century barber is far from being a poet equal to chaucer but there is no other english poet down to a century and a half after their day who can be placed by the side of the one any more than of the other he has neither chaucer's delicate feeling of the beautiful nor his grand inventive imagination nor his wit or humour but in mere narrative and description he is with his clear strong direct diction in a high degree both animated and picturesque and his poem is pervaded by a glow of generous sentiment well befitting its subject and lending grace as well as additional force to the ardent bounding spirit of life with which it is instinct from beginning to end the following passage which occurs near the commencement has been often quoted at least in part but it is too remarkable to be omitted in any exemplification of the characteristics of barber's poetry he is describing the oppressions endured by the scots during the occupation of their country by the english king edward i after his deposition of his puppet balliol and gift that ony man them by had ony thing that west were thy as horse or hund or other thing that war pleasant to their liking with right or rang it wold have they and gift ony wall them with say they should swa do that they sultan other land or life or live in pine for they dempt them after their will to can they kept for to write a skill ah what they dempt them felonly for good nightest that war were thee for little as shoon or then nane they hang it be the neck bane all's that folk that ever was free and in freedom want for to be through their great mischance and folly war treated them so wickedly that their fays their judges wear what wretchedness may man have mare ah freedom is a noble thing freedom may's man to have liking freedom all solace to man gives he lives at ease that freely lives a noble heart may have nane ease nay else naught that may him please give freedom fail ye for free liking is yarn it o'er all other thing nay he that i has livet free may not gnaw well the property the anger nay the wretched doom that is couplet to foul thorough doom but gift he had as say it it then all perquer he should it wit and should think freedom mare to prize than all the gold in world that is it is he goes on to observe by its contrary or opposite that the true nature of everything is best discovered the value and blessing of freedom for example are only to be fully felt in slavery and then the worthy archdeacon who although the humorous is not his strongest ground does not want slyness or a sense of the comic winds up with a very singular illustration which whoever is more suited to his own age than to ours 
and may be suppressed here without injury to the argument but barber's design no doubt was to effect by means of this light and sportive conclusion an easy and harmonious descent from the height of declamation and passion to which he had been carried in the preceding lines throughout his long work he shows for his time a very remarkable feeling of the art of poetry both by the variety which he studies in the disposition and treatment of his subject and by the rare temperance and self-restraint which prevents him from ever overdoing what he is about either by prosing or raving even his patriotism warm and steady as it is is wholly without any vulgar narrowness or ferocity he paints the injuries of his country with distinctness and force and celebrates the heroism of her champions and deliverers with all admiration and sympathy but he never runs into either the gasconading exaggerations or the furious depreciatory invectives which would it might be thought have better pleased the generality of those for whom he wrote his understanding was too enlightened and his heart too large for that his poem stands in this respect in striking contrast to that of harry the blind minstrel on the exploits of wallace to be afterwards noticed but each poet suited his hero barber the magnanimous considerate and far-seeing king blind harry the indomitable popular champion with his one passion and principle hatred of the domination of england occupying his whole soul and being we will now give one of barber's portraits that of sir james of douglas the second figure in his canvas all men love it him for his bounty for he was of full fair et fur wise courtes and debonair large and lovin alls was he and our all thing love it lawty lawty to love is gentlemanly through lawty lives men righteously with a virtue and lawty a man may yet sufficient be and but lawty may nane have price whether he be white or he be wise and for where it faileth na virtue may be of price nay of value to make a man so good that he may simply call it good man be he was in all his deedest leal for him they dined not to deal with treachery nay with fall set his heart on high honour was set and him contain it on sick manier that all him love it that were him near but he was not so fair that we should speak greatly of his beauty in visage was he some deal grey and had black hair as it heard say but of limus he was well made with banus great and shoulders braid his body was well made and leany as they that saw him said to me when he was blithe he was lovely and meek and sweet in company away in battle might him see all other countenance had he and in speech lisped he some deal but that sat him right wonder weel till good hector of troy might he in many things like can be hector had black hair as he had and stark limbs and right well made and lisped also as did he and wes fulfilled of beauty and was curtis and wise and white but of man had and mickle might till hector dare i name compare of all that ever in world is where the weather in his time say wrought he that he should greatly love it be the only other passage for which we can make room is a short extract from the narrative of the great day of bernockburn which occupies altogether about two thousand lines of the poem or the whole of the eighth and ninth books of dr jameson's edition there might men see men fellow fight and men that worthy war and white do many worthy vassalage they fought as they wore in a rage for when the scottish archery saw their fayes say sturdily stand in to battle them again with all their might and all their main they laid on as men out of wit and where they with full strake might hit there might nay armour stint their strack they to frush it that they might o'er tack and with axes sick dushes gay that they helms and headis clave and their fays right heartily met them and dang on them doughtily with warpins that were stithe of steel there was the battle strecked wheel so great din there was of dints as warpins upon armour stints and of spears so great rusting and sick thrang and sick thristling sick gurning granning and so great a noise as they gan other bait and ensignies on every side givand and taken wound this wide that it was hideous for to hear all their four battles with that were feckland in a front hallily ah mighty god how doughtily sure edward the bruce and his men among their fairs counted them then 
feckland in so good cavine sa hadi worthy and sa fine that their varward rush it was and meagre theirs left the place until their great rout to were run they went that tain had upon hand so great annoy that they were afraid for scottus that them hard arrayed then then or in a shill from all what happed to that fight to fall i trow again he should not rise their men might see a many wise hard immense of it doubtily and money that white war and hardy soon lined under feet all dead where all the field of blood was red arms and whites that they bear with blood war so defile it there that they might not destroy it be almighty god wa then might see that stuart walter and his rout and the good douglas that was so stout fecked tend into that stalwart stour he should say that till all on hour they wore worthy that in that fight so fast press it their fairest might that them rush it war they yeed their men might see many a steed fleeing on stray that lord had name my lord wa then good tent had dane till the good earl of morade and his that so great routest gave and fought so fast in that batail foland sick pains and travail that they and theirs made sick debat that where they come they made them gat then might men hear in sinis cry and scottish men cry heartily on them on them on them they fail with that so hard they gan assail and slew all that they might our tay and the scottis archers all sway shot among them so deliverly and grieve and them so greatly that what from them that with them fought that swa great routs to them wrought and pressed them full eagerly and what for errors that felly mani great woundest gan them ma and slew fast of their horse elsewa that they wand yest a little way they tread so greatly then to day that their covine was war and were for they had fetch and with them were set hardiment and strength and will and heart and courage alls their till and all their main and all their might to put them fully to the flight this it must be allowed if not quite a homeric strain is strenuous and valiant writing for a scottish archdeacon advanced in years of the fourteenth century end of section thirty one section thirty two of a compendious history of english literature and of the english language volume one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org a compendious history of english literature and of the english language volume one by george lilly craik chapter four part eight compound english prose mandeville trevisa wycliffe chaucer to the fourteenth century belong the earliest specimens of prose composition in our present mixed english that have been preserved among sir henry ellis's contributions to the pictorial history of england are two very curious extracts from the arundel manuscript number fifty seven in the british museum entitled i invite of in white exemplifying the dialect of kent in 1340 at the beginning of the manuscript is this inscription this book is dan michaelis of northgate e writer an inglis of his owena hand and is of the book house of st austin's of canterbury under the letters c c the first of the passages which occurs on folio forty eight is as follows the younger grey hound that is yet all novice that yearneth after each a beast that yearneth before him and nay maketh bow to him weary and his time liesa thereof set aesopus the fable of the little hounde and of the lesser 
the hond at each a time that he hearth his lord cometh home he yearnth to yens him and larth about his svere and the lord him maketh very cheer and him froteth and maker him greater festa the asa him be thought uh, thus shoulder ich do and so walder me lord me lu he batera he shoulder me make a joya that ich seri each a daya vana this a hounder that him serveth of not hit nas nas longa after a word that the asa nay sees his lord come home he beginth to leap and yearnth to yens him and him proth the vet about his svear and beginth singa grantlicka the surgeons that hit he seized nama stevis and bayeta than asa right to the foal and there of that he wend a haba worth shippa and goad he had a shema and harm the other passage which occurs on folio eighty two and which gives the date of the manuscript comprises the kentish version of the lord's prayer ave maria and creed after an introductory paragraph which it will be observed although written as prose is really in rhyme now icca willa that ye e writer how hit is e went that this book is e writer mid english of kent this book is e made for le wude men for vader and for mutter and for other ken hum for to burza urum alla manura zen that in a hara in waita nay blua nay foul wen who asa god is his nama e read that this book made god him e that bread of angels of heaven and there to his red and under vong his soul heaven that he is died amen emenda that this book is bolveld in a the eve of the holy apostles simon and judas of anna brother of the cloister of st austin of canterbury in the era of our lordus beringa thirteen forty potter noster fodder over that art in a heavenus e halsed by thy nama commenda thy richa e wortha thy will us in heaven in a eartha bread our each a day is yef us to day and for let us our yeldingus us and we nor letteth our yelderus and ne us led knocked into vandinga ac vri us vram queda so be it ave maria hail mary of thonka vo h blank d by mid the e blessed thou in a women and e blessed that ovet of thine womb so be it credo ich leave thine god father almighty maker of heaven and of earth and in a jesus christ his son on lepi our lord that he kenned is of the holy ghost he bore of marie maida he pined under pontius pilate he nailed a uh, rhoda died uh, and be buried yet uh, 
down to hella vana thrida de arros vrom the diada stees to heavenus sit at the right half of god the father almighty vanus to kamena he is to dema the quicker and the diada ik e leva aina the holy ghost holy churcha generalica manessa of halzen lesnessa of senes of lessa a risingda and life ever less denda so be it the sound here represented by z in certain words such as all misty it should be noticed is really a guttural the same which at a later date came to be usually indicated by g h in fact the character is a g or something between a g and a y and not at all our modern z sir henry adds that the harleian manuscript number ten twenty two contains several tracts in northern english of nearly the same age among which is a poem on the decalogue translated from the latin in thirteen fifty seven at the request of archbishop horsley by john de tay stoke a monk of st mary's york the reader it is further stated who is inquisitive as to the dialects will find among the harleian manuscripts one number two twenty one which contains a dictionary in english and latin the former language in the dialect of the east country compiled ninety years later by a friar preacher a recluse at lynn in norfolk our oldest mixed english prose author is sir john mandeville whose voyages and travels a singular repertory of the marvellous legends of the middle ages have been often printed the best editions are that published in octavo at london in seventeen twenty five and the reprint of it in the same form in eighteen thirty nine with an introduction additional notes and a glossary by j o halliwell esq f s a f s a f r a s the author's own account of himself and of his book is given in an introductory address or prologue and for all's much as it is long time past that there was no general passage nay voyage over the sea and many men desiring for to hear speak of the holy land and had thereof great solace and comfort i john maundeville knight albeit i be not worthy that was born in england in the town of st albans past the sea in the year of our lord jesu christ thirteen twenty two in the day of st michael and hitherto have been long time over the sea and have seen and gone thorough many divers lands and many provinces and kingdoms and isles and have passed through tartary percy armony the little and the great through libya chaldee and the great part of ethiop thorough amazon ind the lass and the moor a great party and thorough out many other isles that been about an end where dwell in many divers folks and of divers manners and laws and of divers shaps of men of which lawns and isles i shall speak more plainly hereafter and i shall devise you some party of things that there been one time shall been after it may best come to my mind especially for him that will and are in purpose for to visit the holy city of jerusalem and the holy places that are thereabout and i shall tell the way that they should hold and thither for i have often time passed and ridden the way with good company of many lords god be thanked and ye shall understand that i have put this book out of latin into french and translated it again out of french into english that every man of my nation may understand it but lords and knights and other noble and worthy men that con latin but little and han been beyond the sea knowen and understanden gif i er in devising for forgetting or else that they moa redress it and amend it for things passed out of long time from a man's mind or from his sight turnin soon into forgetting because that mind of man nay may not been comprehended nay withholden for the frailty of mankind mandeville is said to have returned to england in thirteen fifty six or after an absence of thirty-four years and as he is recorded to have died at liege in thirteen seventy one his book must have been written early in the latter half of the fourteenth century of the many copies of it which exist in manuscripts some are as are as old as the close of that century so that the language may be presumed to have been preserved nearly as he wrote it divested of the old spelling it will be seen from the above specimen to be still very readily intelligible indeed it is remarkable for its clearness and correctness 
our other extracts however shall be given with the spelling of the time as exhibited in the cotonian manuscript titus one hundred sixteen which is believed to have been written about the year fourteen hundred the following is the seventh chapter entitled of the pilgrimages in jerusalem and of the holy places thereabout as contributed after that manuscript to the pictorial history of england by sir henry ellis after for to speak of jerusalem the holy city see shul under standen that it staunt full fair between the hillis and there be no rivers ne wellis but water cometh by condite from ebron and see shula understanda that jerusalem of old time unto the time of Machizedek was clepid jebus and after it was clep salem unto the time of king david that put these two names to gitter and clepid it jebusalem and after that king salomon clepid it jerusalem and after that men clepid it jerusalem and so it is clepid sit and about uh, jerusalem is the kingdom of suri uh, and there beside is the land of palestina and beside it is ascalon and beside that is the land of maritani but jerusalem is in the land of judi and it is clep judah for that judas maccabeus was king of that country and it marcheth eastward to the kingdom of araby on the south side to the land of egypt and on the west side to the greater sea on the north side toward the kingdom of Syria, and to the sea of cypri in jerusalem was wont to be a patriarch and archbishops and bishops about and in the country about to jerusalem be these uh, cities hebron at seven mile jericho at six mile bersabi at eight mile ascalon at seventeen mile jaff at sixteen mile ramatha at three mile and bethlehem at two mile and a two mile from bethlehem toward the south is the church of st caratot that was abbot there for whom the maiden mecca duel amongst the monks one he scolda die and sit be in mourning in the wise that the maiden her lamentation for him the first time and it is full great pity to behold her this country and land of jerusalem hath been in many diverse nasanus hondas and often therefore hath the country suffered mecca tribulation for the sinner of the people that dwelleth there for that country hath been in the hands of all nessians that is to sane of jews of chananese assyrianese perses medoines macedoines of greekus romanese of chrysanemon of sarazenus barbarinus turkus tararenus and of many other diverse nations for god will not that it be longer in the hands of traitors nay of sinners be there christen uh, or other and now have the heathen uh, men holden that land in her hands forty year and more but they shall not hold it longer as if god wold and ze shall understand that one men comin to jerusalem her first pilgrimage is to the church of the holy sepulchre where our lord was buried that is without a, the city on the north side but it is now enclosed in with the tun wall and there is a full fair church all round and open above and covered with lead and on the west side is a fair tour and an high for bella strongly made and in the midst of the church is a tabernacle as it were a little house made with a low little door 
and that tabernacle is made in manner of a half a compass right curiously and richly made of gold and azure and other rich colourers full nobilitia maida and in the right side of that tabernacle is the sepulchre of our lord and the tabernacle is eight foot long and five foot wide and eleven foot in hector and it is not long sith the sepulchre was all open that men might kiss it and touch it but for pilgrimus that cummin thither painted him to break the stone in pieces or in powder therefore the sudan hath do make a wall about uh, the sepulchre that no man may touch it but in the left side of the wall of the tabernacle is well the height of a man is a great stone to the quantity of a man's head that was of the holy sepulchre and that stone kissin the pilgrims that cummin thither in that tabernacle been no windowes but it is all made light with lampus that hangin before the sepulchre and there is a lamp that hongeth before the sepulchre that brenneth light and on the good a friday it goth out be himself at that hour that our lord rose from death to live also within the church at the right side beside the queerer of the the queer of the church is the mount of calvaria where our lord was done on the cross and it is a rock of white colour and a little medalled with red and the cross was set in a mortaise in the same rock and on the rock dropped the woundus of our lord one he was pinned to the cross and that is clepid golgotha and men gone up to that golgotha be degrees and in the place of that mortaise was adamus head found after noah's flood in token that the sinus of adam shoulder been bought in that same place and upon that rock made a abraham sacrifice to our lord and there is an otter and before that audier lizen god afraid de bolain and ba dewin and other christen kings of jerusalem and there nigh where our lord was crucified is this written in greek ethios basilion ismon pisionas ergasa sotheus emesitus gai that is to sane in latin hic deus nostra rex anti secula operatus est salutum in medio terra that is to say this god our king before the world is hath wrought hella in midst of the earth uh, and also on that rock where the cross was set is written within the rock these words sios mist is basis tur pistias de tes must be that is to say in latin quod vides est fundamentum tokius fide mundi who yes that is to say that thou seest is ground of all the world and of this faith and z shul understanda that one our lord was down upon the cross he was thirty-three year and three months of elda and the prophecy of david saith that quadra genta annus proximus fui generacioni huic that is to say forty year was i neighbora to this kinretta and thus shoulder it seema that the prophecies ne war not trua but there been both the trua for in old time men maiden a year of ten months of the which a march was the first and december was the last but gaius that was emperor of rome puddin theus two months there to january and fevrer 
and ordained the year of twelve months that is to say three hundred and forty-five days without leap year after the proper course of the sunna and therefore after kautinga of ten months of the year he deida in the fortieth year as the prophet of saith and after the year of twenty-two months he was of age thirty-three year and three months also within the mount of cavalry on the right side is an otter where the piler lieth that our lord jesu was bounden to one he was scourged and there beside a four foot been four pillars of stone that always drop in water and some a sane that there weepen for our lord is death and nigh that audier is a place under earth a forty two degrees of deepness a, where the only croise was founded by the wit of saint line under a rock where their jewess had hidden it and that was the very cross assayed for their founden three crosses on of our lord and two of the two thieves thiefus and saint elaine proved him on a dead body that arose from death to live one that it was laid on it that our lord died on and thereby in the wall is the place where the four nails of our lord were hid for he had two in his hands and two in his feet and of one of these the emperor of constantinople made a bridle to his horse to bear him in battle -y, and through virtue thereof he overcame his enemies ad won all the land of asia the lesser that is to say turkey ermania the lassa and the moor and from syria to jerusalem from arabia to Persi, from mesopotami to the kingdom of halapa from egypt to the high and the low and all the other kingdoms into the depot of ethiope and into inda the lesser that vana was christerna and there was in that time a many go to holy men and holy heremites of whom the book of phadris lifus speaketh and thee been now in painemus and sarazinus hans and in midst of that church is a compass in the which uh, joseph of arimathea laid uh, the body of our lord one he had taken him down of the cross and where he washed the wounds of our lord and that compass say men is the midst of the world and in the church of the sepulchre on the north side is the place where our lord was put in prison for he was in prison in many places and there is a party of the chaina that he was bounden with and there he appeared first to maria magdalena one he was risen and such a wenda that he had been a gardener in the church of st sepulchre was wont to be chanons of the order of st augustine and hadn't a prior but the patriarch was her sovereign and without uh, the doris of the church on the right side as men gone uh, upward eighteen greases said our lord to his mother mulier ecce filius tuus that is to say women lo thy son and after that he said uh, to john his disciple ecce mater tua that is to sena lo behold thy mother and these words he said uh, on the cross and on these grasses went our lord one he bar the cross on his shoulder and under this grease is a chapel and in that chapel singen prestus indianus that is to say pris of inda not after our law but after her and all way thy makin her 
sacrament of the autier saying pater noster and other prayers therewith with the which prayers the say the words that the sacrament is made of for the nay noah not the additions that many popes and made but the singa with gada devotion and there ne'er is the place where that our lord rested him wan he was weary of bearing of the cross and z school understanda that before the church of the sepulchre is the city more feeble than in any other party for the greater plain that is between a, the church and the city and toward the east side without a, the wallace of the city is the vale of josepheth that toucheth to the wallace as though it were a large ditch and above that vale of josepheth out of the city is the church of st stephen where he was stoned to death and there beside is the gilding gate that may not be opened be the which gate to our lord entered on palm sunday upon an ass and the gate opened against him one he wold go unto the temple and sit apparent the steppes of the ass's feet in three places of the degrees that been of full harda stone and before the church of st sepulchre toward the south a uh, uh, two hundred pas is the great hospital of st john of the which uh, the hospitalaris had here foundation and within uh, the palace of the sika men of that hospital be six a score and four pillars of stone and in the wallace of the house without uh, the number above us said there be forty four pillars that barren up the house and from that hospital to go toward the east is a full fair church that is clept notre dame le grand and then is there another church right nigh that is clept notre dame de latin and there were maria cleophas and maria magdalena and terran here here one our lord was painted in the cross the following is the account of muhammad in the fourteenth chapter and see shall understand that makameta was born in arabia that was first a poor knave that kept camelus that went in with merchantas for merchandise and so befell that he went with the merchandas into egypt and there were vana christened in thopartias and at the desartus of arabia he went uh, into a chapel where a uh, aramite uh, dwelt and one he entered into the chapel that was but a little and a low thing and had but a little door and a low then the entry began to wax uh, so great and so large and so high as though it had be of a great minster or the gate of a palace and this was the first miracle the saracen saying that macomete did in his mouth after began he for to wax a wiser and richer and he was a great astronomer and after he was governor and prince of the land of carodina and he governed it full wisely in such manner that when the prince was dead he took the lady to wife for that haita gadridge and macomete fell often in the great uh, sickness that men call uh, the falling uh, evil wherefore the lady was full sorry that ever she took him to husband uh, but macomete made her uh, to believe that all timus when he fell so gabriel the angel came for to speak uh, with him and for the greater light and brightness uh, of the angel he might uh, not sustain uh, him fro falling uh. and therefore the saracenus saying that gabriel 
came often to speak with him this makamete reigneth in arabi the seer of our lord jesu christ six a hundred and ten and was of the generation of ishmael that was abraham's son that he gat upon agar his chamberer and therefore there be sarazenus that be clept ishmaelitinus and summa agarzenus of agar and the other properly be clept sarazenus of sara and summa be clept moabitus and summa amantus for the two sons of loth moab and amon that he begat on his daughters that were afterward greater earthly princes and also macomete loved well a good heremita that dwelleth in the desertus a mile from mount sinai in the way that men gone fro arabia toward caldi and toward inda a day journey fro the sea where the merchants of venice come in often for merchandise and so often went to macomete to this heremita that all his men were rotha for he would gladly hear this heremita preach and make his men wake all night and therefore his men thought him to put the heremite to death and so befell upon a night that macomete was drunken of god wine and he fell on slepa and his men took macomete's sword out of his sheatha while he slept and there with their slog this heremite and put his sword all bloody in his sheath again and at morrow when he found the heremite dead he was fully sorry and wroth and would have done his men to death but the all with on accord said that he himself had slain him when he was drunken and showed him his sword all bloody and he trowed that there hadn't said sa and then he cursed the wine and all those that drink in it and therefore sarazenus that be devout drinken never no wine but some drinken it privily for uh sif there drunken it openly their shoulden been reproved but they drinken good a beverage and sweeter and nori fishing uh, that is made of gallamel and that is that men makin sugar of that is of right good savour and it is good for the breast also it befalleth some time that christena men become sarazenus other for poverty or for simpleness or else for her own wickedness and therefore the arca flamens or the flamen us our archbishop or bishop one he rescueth them saith thus la elec alla sala macamet roris alla that is to say there is no god but one and macamete his messenger we have already had occasion to quote a short passage from john de trevisa's translation of higdon's polychronicon in speaking of the new mode of teaching latin in schools through the medium of english instead of french which trevisa tells us had been introduced shortly before the time at which he was then writing which was the year thirteen eighty five his translation of higdon which was undertaken at the request of thomas lord berkeley to whom he was chaplain is stated at the end to have been finished in thirteen eighty seven it was printed by caxton in fourteen eighty two with a continuation bringing down the narrative from thirteen fifty seven at which higdon had stopped to fourteen sixty but besides that trevisa's text is extensively altered in this edition both by insertions and omissions his language is modernized throughout i william caxton a simple person says the worthy printer in his preface have endeavoured me to writ first over all the said book of polychronicon and somewhat have changed the rude and old english that is to wit certain words which in these days be neither used nor understood yet not more than the ordinary span of a single human life had elapsed since the translation had been executed by trevisa no doubt in the current english of his day such was the rapid growth of the language in the earlier half of the fifteenth century besides the polychronicon trevisa rendered several other works from the latin 
into his mother tongue and some of his other translations are still preserved in manuscript of a version of the whole of both the old and new testaments however which he is said to have executed nothing is now known End of section thirty two section thirty three of a compendious history of english literature and of the english language volume one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org a compendious history of english literature and of the english language volume one by george lilly craik chapter four part nine the oldest english translation we have of the bible is that of wycliffe john de wycliffe w i c l i f or wycliffe w y c l i f f e died at about the age of sixty in thirteen eighty four and his translation of the scriptures from the vulgate appears to have been finished two or three years before the new testament has been several times printed first in folio in seventeen thirty one under the care of the rev john lewis next in quarto in eighteen ten under that of the rev h h baber lastly in quarto in eighteen forty one and again in eighteen forty six in baxter's english hexapla and now the old testament has also been given to the world from the clarendon press at the expense of the university of oxford admirably edited by the rev j forshaw and sir frederick madden in four magnificent quartos oxford eighteen fifty the following extracts from wycliffe's bible were communicated to the pictorial history of england by sir henry ellis from one of the best manuscripts of the entire translation the royal manuscript eleven o eight in the british museum the first from the old testament consists of part of the fifteenth chapter of exodus containing the song of moses bana moises song and the sonnes of israel this song to the lord and thy sidon singer we to the lord for he is magnified gloriously he cast down the horse and the steerer into the sea my strength and my praising is the lord and he is made to me into healtha this is my god he shall glorify him the god of my father and he shall enhance him the lord is as a man fightin his name is almighty he cast Ida down into the sea the cheris of pharaoh and his host his chosen princes were in drenched in the reed sea the deeper waters slidin them they getten down into the depth as a stoon lord thy right hand is magnified in strength lord thy right hand smoot the enemy and in the michelnessa of thy glory thou hast put down all thine adversaries thou sentest thine ire that devoured him as stobble and watrous wherein goderid in the spirit of thy woodnessa flowing water stood deeper waters wherein goderid in the middest of the sea the enemy said he shall pursue and he shall take ye shall depart spulus my soul shall be filled i shall draw out my sword mine han shall slay him thy spirit blew and the sea allied him thy warren drenched as lead in greater waters lord who is like thee in stronger men who is like thee thou art great doer in holiness furdful and peaceable and doing miracles thou heldest forth thine hand and the earth devoured hem thou were letterer in thy mercy to thy people which thou again boustest 
and thou hast borne him in thy strength to thine holy dwelling place people steiden and were in rutha sore was helden the dwelleress of flistium vena the princess of adam wherein disturbed trembling held her the stronger men of moab all the dwelleress of canaan were in starka inward dreda follow on hem and outward dreda in the great nessa of thin arm be thy maid unmovable as a stone till thy people pass a lord till this thy people pass a whom thou well didst thou shalt bring hem in and thou shalt plant a in the hill of thine heritage in the most steadfast dwelling place which thou hast wrought lord lord thy century which thine hondas made steadfast the lord shall reign na into the world and firtha forsooth pharaoh a rider in tried with his chariots and knights into the sea and the lord brought the waters of the sea on him suddenly the sonus of israel geddon be the drier place in the midst of the sea therefore marie prophetessa the sister of aaron took a, a timpan in her hand and all the women Gidden out after her with timpan's companies to which such song before and sida sing we to the lord for he is magnified gloriously he casted uh, down into the sea the horse and the steer of him the specimen selected from the new testament is the last chapter of st luke but in a day of the woke full early thy came in to the grave and brought in sweetest smelling spices that they had in arrayed and they found in the stone turned away from the grave and they gidden in and found in not the body of the lord jesus and it was done the while they were in astonied in thought of this thing lo twa men standen beside us him in shining cloth and wanna the dreaden and bowed in her semblant into eartha the said unto him what seeken ye him that liveth with dead men he is not here but he is risen have ye mind how he spake to you wanna he was yet in galilee and said for it behoveth manus sonna to be betaken into the hondas of sinful men and to be crucified and the thridda day to rise again and the bethoughten on his awardus and the gidden again fro the grave and telden all of these thingus to the elevena and to all other and there was maria maudelaine and jonah and mary of james and other women that were in with him that said unto apostolus these things and these words were sain before him as madness uh, and they believed then not to him but petra rose up and ran to the grave and he bowed down and sighed the linen clothes lying alone and he went uh, by himself wondering on that that was done and lo twain of him went in in that day into a castle that was fro jerusalem the space of sixty furlongus by name he maws and they spaken together of all of these thingus that hadn't befall and it was done the while the talked in and soughten by himself jesus himself neheda and went to with him but her igen were in holden that the knew in him not and he said it to him what been these words that ye speaken together wondering and ye been sorrowful and un whose name was cleophas answered and said thou 
thyself art a pilgrim in jerusalem and hast thou not known what thing has been done in it these days to whom he said it what thingest and the saying to him of jesus of nazareth that was a man prophet mighty in work and word before god and all the people and how the highest uh, priestess of our princess betoken him into damnation of death and crucified in him but we hoped in that he should have again brought to israel and now on allah these thingus the third a day is to day that these thingus were undone but also some women of ours laden us of furred which a before day were in at the grave and one his body was not found in they came in and said in that they sigh also a sight of angels which sighed that he liveth and some of a aurin went in to the grave and there found him so as the women said in, but they found in not him and he said it to him a foolish and a slow of heart to believe in allah thingus that the prophetess had spoken where it behoved not christ to suffer these thingus and so to enter into his glory and he began at moises and at allah the prophetess and declared to him in allah scripturis that were in of him and they came in nigh the castle where der the went in and he made countenance that he would a go further and they constrained him and sudden dwell with us for it draweth to-night and the day is now bowed down and he entried with them and it was dawn the while he sat at the meat uh, with him he took breed and blessed and break and took to him and the iron of them were an opened and the new in him and he vanished fro her iron and the sidon together where our heart was not burning in us while he spake to us in the way and opened to us scripturis and the risen up in the same hour and went in again into jerusalem and found in the eleven gathering together and him that were in with him saying that the lord is risen verily and appeared to simount and he told him what thingus wherein done in the way and how the knew in him in the breaking of bread and the while the spake in these things jesus stood in the middle of them and sighed to him peace to you i am nile ye dreader but the wherein afraid and aghast and gesedden him to be a spirit and he said unto him what been ye troubled and thoughtus came in up into your hardis see ye my hondas and my feet for i myself am feel ye and see ye for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as ye seem that i have and when he had a said this thing he showed a hondas and feet to him and yet while the believed in not and wondering in for joy he said a and ye hear anything that shall be eaten and the provided to him a part of the fish roasted and a honeycomb and one he had a eaten before him he took a that that left a and gaff to him and said it to him these been the wordest that i spake to you wanna i was yet with you for it is nada that all a things been fulfilled that been written in the law of moises and in the prophetess and in psalms of me thana he opened to him with that there shoulden under standen scripturis and he said it to him for thus it is written and thus it behoved to christ to suffer and rise again fro death in the thrida day and penance and remission of sinners to be preached in his name into all focus beginning in at jerusalem and ye been witnesses of these things and i shall send the behest of my 
fodder into you but sit ye in the city till that ye been clothed with virtue fro on high and he led a hem forth into bethany and Juan his a hondas were and lift up he blessed him and it was done the while he blessed him he departed fro him and was borne into heaven and the worship pitten and went in again into jerusalem with great joy and were in ever more in the temple herring and blessing g god it would appear from these two specimens that the english of this early version of the bible is considerably less antique in the new testament than in the old wycliffe is also the author of many original writings in his native language in defence of his reforming views in theology and church government some of which have been printed but most of which that are preserved still remain in manuscript his style is everywhere coarse and slovenly though sometimes animated by a popular force or boldness of expression chaucer is the author of three separate works in prose a translation of boethius de consolatione philosophy printed by caxton in folio without date under the title of the book of consolation of philosophy which that boethius made for his comfort and consolation a treatise on the astrolabe addressed to his son lewis in thirteen ninety one and printed at least in part in the earlier editions of his works and the testament of love an apparent imitation of the treatise of boethius written towards the end of his life and also printed in the old editions of his collected works but perhaps the most highly finished and in other respects also the most interesting of the great poet's prose compositions are the tale of melibius and the parson's tale in the canterbury tales the former which he tells himself as one of the company of pilgrims and which is a very close translation from a french treatise entitled le livre de melibie et de dame prudence existing both in prose and verse has been supposed as mentioned in a preceding page to be written in a sort of blank measure or rhythm perhaps mr guest thinks the same that is called cadence in the house of fame the following extract is from the earlier portion of the tale where the rhythmical style is conceived to be most marked this melaby answered unto his wife prudence i propose not quote he to work in by thy counsel for many causes and reasons for certes every wight would hold me than a fool this is to sane if i for thy counselling would change things that been ordained and affirmed by so many wise men secondly i say that all women been wick and none good of them all for of a thousand men saith solomon i found of good men but certes of all women good woman found i never and also certes if i govern me by thy counsel it should seem that i had ye thee over me the maestry and god forbid that it were so for jesus search saith that if the wife have the mastery she is contrarious to her husband and solomon saith never in thy life to thy wife nay to thy child nay to thy friend nay yeva no power over thyself for better it were that thy children acts of thee thingus that him needeth than thou see thyself in the hands of thy children and also if i wol wirch by thy counselling certes it must be some time secre till it were time that it be known and that this nay may not be if i should be counselled by thee for it is written the janglery of women nay can nothing hide save that which they wot not after the philosopher saith in wicked counsel women vanquished men and for these reasons i nay owe not to be counselled by thee one dame prudence full debonairly and with great patience had heard all that her husband liked for to say then asked she of him license for to speak and said in this wise my lord quoth she as to your first reason it may lightly been answered for i say that it is no folly to change counsel when the thing is changed or else when the thing seemeth otherwise than it seemed before and moreover i say though that ye have sworn and behight to perform your emprise and nevertheless ye wave to perform filk same emprise by just cause men should not say therefore ye were a liar nay forsworn for the book saith that the wise man maketh no leasing 
when he turneth his courage for the better and all be it that your emprise be established and ordained by great multitude of folk yet are you not accomplish filth ordinance but you liketh for the truth of things and the prophet been rather founden in few folk than been wise and full of reason than by great multitude of folk there every man crieth and clattereth what him liketh soothly switch multitude is not honest as to the second reason whereas ye say that all women been wick save your grace certes ye despise all women in this wise and he that all despiseth as saith the book all displeaseth and senex saith that whoso will have sapience shall no man dispraise but he shall gladly teach the science that he can without presumption or pride and switch things as he naught can he shall not be ashamed to leer him and to inquire of less folk than himself and so that there hath been full many a good woman may lightly be preved for certes sir our lord jesus christ would never han descended to be born of a woman if all women had be wicked and after that for the great bounty that is in women our lord jesus christ when he was risen from death to life appeared rather to a woman than to his apostles and though that solomon said he found never no good woman it followeth not therefore that all women be wicked for though that he nay found no good woman certes many another man hath found many a woman full good and true or else peradventure the intent of solomon was this that in sovereign bounty he found no woman this is to say that there is no wight that hath sovereign bounty save god above as he himself recordeth in his evangelies for there is no creature so good that him they wanteth somewhat of the perfection of god that is his maker your third reason is this ye say that if that ye govern you by my counsel it should seem that ye had yeave me the mastery and the lordship of your person sir save your grace it is not so for if so were that no man should be counselled but only of him that hand lordship and mastery of his person men knowed not be counselled so often for soothly filk man that asketh counsel of a purpose yet hath he free choice whether he will work after that counsel or none and as to your fourth reason there as ye sayn that the janglery of women can hide things that they wot not as whoso saith that a woman cannot hide that she wot sir these words been understood of women that been jangleresses and wicked of which women men sayn that three things driven a man out of his house that is to say smoke dropping of rain and wicked wives and of switch women solomon saith that a man were better dwell in desert than with a woman that is riotous and sir by your leave that am not i for ye have full often assayed my great silence and my great patience and eke how well that i can hide and heal things and that men oughten secretly to hiden and soothly as to your fifth reason whereas you say that in wicked counsel women think wish of men god wot that filk reason stand here in no stead for understandeth now ye axen counsel for to do wickedness and if ye will work in wickedness and your wife restraineth filk wicked purpose and overcometh you by reason and by good counsel certes your wife ought rather to be praised than to be blamed thus should ye understand the philosopher that saith in wicked counsel women vanquishen her husbands and there as ye blamen all women and her reasons i shall show you by many ensamples that many women have been full good and yet been and her counsel wholesome and profitable eke some men han said that the counsel of women is either too dear or else too little of price but all be it so that full many a woman be bad and her counsel vile and naught worth yet han men found in full many a good woman and discreet and wise in counselling lo jacob thorough the good counsel of his mother rebecca juan the benison of his father and the lordship over all his brethren judith by her good counsel delivered the city of bethily in which she dwelt out of the hand of holofern that had it besieged and would it all destroy abigail delivered nabal her house bond fro david the king that would han slain him and appeased 
the ire of the king by her wit and by her good counselling hester by her counsel enhanced greatly the people of god in the reign of asuras the king and the same bounty and good counselling of many a good woman mon men read and tell and furthermore one that our lord had created adam our form father he said in this wise it is not good to be a man alone make we to him an help semblable to himself here mon ye see that if that women were in not good and her counsel good and profitable our lord god of heaven would neither had wrought him nay called him help of man but rather confusion of man and then said her clerk once in two verses what is better than gold jasper what is better than jasper wisdom and what is better than wisdom woman and what is better than a good woman nothing and sir by many other reasons mon ye seen that many women been good and her counsel good and profitable one malaby had heard the words of his wife prudence he said thus i see well that the word of solomon is sooth for he saith that words that been spoken discreetly by ordinance been honeycombs for they even sweetness to the soul and wholesomeness to the body and wife because of thy sweet words and eke for i have breathed and assayed thy great sapience and thy great truth thy wool govern me by thy counsel in all things this is probably one of the passages that have been conceived to have had most of a rhythmical character yet its balanced style does not go beyond what is not uncommon in rhetorical prose part of the measured march of the language may arise from the french tale and perhaps its original form having been in verse what is called the personis or parson's tale which winds up the canterbury tales as we possess the work is a long moral discourse which for the greater part is not very entertaining but which yet contains some passages curiously illustrative of the age in which it was written here is part of what occurs in the section headed de superbia of pride the first of the seven mortal sins to wit justly recommends that the whole should be read carefully by any antiquary who may mean to write de re vestiaria of the english nation in the fourteenth century now been there two manner of prides that on him is within the heart of a man and that other is without of which soothly these four said things and mo than i have said appertaining to pride that is within the heart of man and there be other spices that been withouten but natheless that on of these spices of pride is sign of that other right as the gay levacell at the tavern is sign of the wine that is in the cellar and this is in many things as in speech and countenance and outrageous array of clothing for certes if there had been no sin in clothing christ would not so soon have noted and spoken of the clothing of filk rich man in the gospel and as st gregory saith that precious clothing is culpable for the dearth of it and for his softness and for his strangeness and disguising and for the superfluity or for the inordinate scantiness of it may not a man see as in our days the sinful costly array of clothing and namely in too much superfluity or else in too disordinate scantness as to the first sin in superfluity of clothing which that maketh it so dear to the harm of the people not only the cost of the embroidering the disguising indenting or barring owning paling winding or bending and semblable waste of cloth and vanity but there is also the costly furring in her gown so much pouncening of chisel to make and hold so much dagging of shears with the superfluity and length of the foreset gowns trailing in the dong and in the mire on horse and eke on foot as well of man as of woman that all filth training is verily as in effect wasted consumed threadbare and rotten with dong rather than it is given to the poor to great damage of the foresaid poor folk but in sundry wise this is to say the more that cloth is wasted the more must it cost to the poor people for the scarceness and furthermore if so be that they wold and give switch poinsoned and dagged clothing to the poor people it is not convenient to wear for her estate nay sufficient to bow to her necessity to keep him fro the distemperance of the firmament also the sin of ornament or of apparel is in things that appertain to riding as in too many delicate horse that been holden for delight 
to have been so fair fat and costly and also in many a vicious knave that is sustained because of him in curious harness as in saddles croppers petrels and bridles covered with precious cloth and rich barred and plated of gold and of silver for which god saith by zachary the prophet i will confound the riders of switch horse these folk take in little regard of the riding of god son of heaven and of his harness wan he rode upon the ass and had none other harness but the poor clothes of his disciples nay we read not that ever he rode on any other beast i speak this for the sin of superfluity and not for honesty one reason it requireth and moreover certes pride is greatly notified in holding of great mining wan they been of little profit or of right no profit and namely wan that mining is felonious and damages to the people by hardiness of high lordship or by way of office for certes switch lords sell then her lordship to the devil of hell wan they sustain the wickedness of her mine or else wan these folk of low degree as they that hold in hostelries sustain in theft of her hostelers and that is in many manner of deceits filk manner of folk bin that flies that followin the honey or else the hounds that followin the corain switch for said folk strangling spiritually her lordships for which thus said david the prophet wicked death mot come unto filk lordships and god yeave that they mot descend into hell all down for in her houses is iniquity and shrewdness and not god of heaven and certus but if they done amendment right as god gave his benison to laban by the service of jacob and to pharaoh by the service of joseph right so wall god gave his malison to switch lordships as sustained the wickedness of her servants but they come to amendment pride of the table appeareth eke full oft for certes rich men be clept to feast and poor folk be put away and rebuked and also in excess of divers meats and drinks and namely switch manner bake meats and dish meats brenning of wild fire and painted in castle with paper and semblable waste so that it is abusion to think and eke into great preciousness of vessel and curiosity of minstrelsy by which a man is stirred more to the delights of luxury End of section thirty three